prologue miracle creation. A kind gentle voice pierces through the darkness. The world wavers for an instant and from the crackles of shining light, emerges a one clad in white robes, holding a staff so gorgeous it seemed to be the concentration of all the world's beauty. Riding a white-colored heavenly bird, its fur so beautiful and rich to paint the raven pitch black sky into its soothing whiteness, as if heavens itself was now going to descend on this cursed land. The land submerged in the depths of evil and empty dryness, got cleansed and the most fertile land materialized. The rivers that ran across the land so pristine that it was said to heal all wounds, diseases and purify all the curses that could plague the mind and heart. The air so fresh that animals and birds came swarming from every corner of the world to make it their home. This was during the era after the Golden Age, when gods have abandoned the mortals and made their new homes, the Divine Realm. The world was plunged in chaos and monsters ravaged the world. It was during this time this being appeared in front of everyone and stood as the symbol of hope itself. Are you a god or perhaps an angel sent by them to help us? All the creatures who were blessed by his holy light asked. None. The person answered without any hesitation. Then who are you, to possess such great powers and a kind heart to help the weak? You may refer to me as Sophs. Then if we may, we implore you to help us restore peace and happiness in our lives. In return we are willing to devote our lives to you and serve you forever. At that time all the living beings in this world, irrespective of race, wealth, strength or power bowed their heads to this mighty being. For the first time humans, beastmen, dwarves, elves, fairies, demons and all other countless races that inhabited this world together wished for the world peace. The smile of Sophs was so bright and beautiful that no one could escape the temptation to be close to him and be connected at heart to all those who felt the same. Raise your heads. This noble voice and the radiance this being emitted had made everyone's hearts throbbing and instills a new zealous fire to achieve brotherhood and harmony. Do not ask for anything, anything that you wish to seek from me is far less than what I wish to grant you. Your honest desire to protect what you love causes infinite power to spring from my depths. Your long days of hopelessness and living under the grip of fear ends here. Now, breathe out your heart desires and I, Sophs. The true grantor of all wishes for the sake of spreading love and happiness, will turn them into reality. The dilapidated brown book cover closes itself on the colorful pages of the book that depicted ancient legends on it. The color at pages had turned faint yellow, which showed how the book had aged with the tradition of being passed down from generation to generation. As the lady holding it in her hand, pulls up the bed sheet towards her encasing two another small girls in it. Now. Go to sleep you too. As the woman was about to turn off the lights coming from a small chunk of magitite or sunk in a blue liquid, she was interrupted as both of her hands were now clutched tightly in between their daughters. She smiles at them, as if asking is there anything else they needed. Mother, I want to hear more. Did this Soph's person really exist? Said another child as she looked at her mother with a discerning expression on her face. Yes. It is even said that Sophs granted our ancestors with this bountiful forest where we are living now and keeps all the dreadful and scary monsters away from us. Mother I want to meet this Sophs and ask her to grant my wish too. I am sorry dear, but it seems that Sophs vanished right after he achieved his goal. So, was he able to grant everyone's wish for the sake of spreading love? Mother tries to pull the nose of the small girl, who instead of sleeping in the middle of the night was asking such confusing questions to answer it for her little age. Since mother loves you and my two daughters loves me, then I am sure of it that Sophs was finally able to connect everyone with the thread of love. Now, sweet dreams you two. No, no. I want to hear the another story where Sophs gives a poor man the blessing to turn whatever he desired into gold and then he lives a happy life. No, big sis, I want to hear the story where Sophs brings back the soul of a dead husband back to his loving wife. How about I tell you another legend of how Sophs saved the life of a little poor girl from her fated death and brings happiness in the lives of people who makes an encounter. Before mother could complete her sentence. She was interrupted by a rushed and hardened knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. The pale face of my father. 
the tensed conversation he had with mother and then the loud screams and heavy clouds of black ash rising high in the sky that we saw through the window. Lou just keep on moving forward and don't look back, I will be right behind you so go, your mother and little sister will be safe. Those were his last words and, and then, hurling voices, the unbearable smell of that red gloomy water everywhere, the smell of humans waving their swords and the figure of my falling father, walking in a snowstorm and then I too dot two. Kai Ayoach pushing my body up in a position as if I was about to start running, my dampened eyes were wide open, and with sweat covered hands I tried to wipe my face off of it. Did you have a bad dream again? An old lady came in through the door cut off from the outside world just by a thin spread of curtain made out of a red bull monster's hide. Good morning, Grandma, everything is fine. I tried to form a smile, hiding my expression as I quickly walked off towards the water tub to wash my face. After completing all my house chores, cleaning my room and tending to all the needs of Grandpa and Grandma, I started making preparation for my own work putting my red velvet cape woven by grandma with a red hood attached to it, and holding the medium-sized grass basket I took off from my home. Grandma, I am going to pick up some new herbs from the nearby forest. Lou, if you would then pick up those sweet treats again like the last time, they sure are a feast for this old age's tasteless mouth to chew on. Now, now don't make Lou wander too far. Come back soon okay dear. Yes, grandma, I am off now. As I winked at Grandpa confirming that his request has been graciously accepted and he smiled back at me, closing the wooden door, a small village came into my view, there were not too many houses, less than enough to count on your fingers to a total of 25, the population is about 200 with mostly middle-aged people hitting the highest in a demographic analysis. The day as usual started early in the village for the villagers who woke up at dawn to work and only relied on agriculture and the bounty of the forest. Winter was going to hit sooner than any place here, so we needed to stack up on supplies. At the small entrance made at the village that separated it from the forest, I waved my hands to the guards and they let me pass through. Lou, your medicine worked wonder on my wife's fever. Thank you very much. And as for thank you she wanted to invite you to dinner too, said one of the villagers who was in charge of the gate. I am glad that she is fine Mr. Blin. I hope that all my herbal medicines are able to always keep the health of the village in top-notch condition. Do your best out there and just howl as loud as you can and we will come to your rescue, if you are ever in trouble. Posing me a victory sign, he sent me off by the usual good luck ritual of rubbing a small amount of red paste on forehead. The logic is that it keeps your head cool even on hot and cloudy days like this, when humidity concentration reaches almost zero. I am the only one in the village with a high ranking appraisal skill and I also happen to possess wood magic and a rare skill of alchemic creation which allows me to make high grade medicines. All I want is to keep villagers happy and smiling because I don't want to lose anyone again. All I know is that I have to keep on living and finding happiness not only for myself but for all those because of whom I have been alive and for the people around me. Chapter. 1. Kidnapped by Little Red Riding Hood I can't make up my mind where to go. It looks great in all directions. I said as I kept looking at the map intensely searching for every minute detail that could let me out of this dilemma. Negative. At this point I have started finding maps very misleading. Ignoring Al's rubbish and not so helping mechanical voice I started reassuring myself. Okay, don't panic. Let's see if that's north. Now which way am I facing? Dang. All these trees look the same. Just a moment ago there was a lot of sunshine and now it's all cloudy. Deep grey lining cumulonimbus clouds have surrounded this side of the mountain forest, leaving the other side in dry rain shadow area. But if I avoid an area devoid of vegetation where it is less likely to find people at the same time going deeper in forest was not helping much with the search. I quickened my pace moving deeper. The downhill forest as the clouds began to gather in the sky. Up till now, the sky had been postcard perfect, but it was changing. The beautiful azure blue shade was beginning to darken into gravel grey. Large pillows of cloud were forming, blotting out the old gold colour of the sun. 
trying to take refuge under a gigantic evergreen tree. I took a deep breath from the mental exhaustion caused to me after walking for almost half a day. Sure I could fly but at the same time I wanted to walk on land. It again felt no different from walking inside the labyrinth and yet I wanted it to be this way nonetheless. Usually I try to do things in quick simple ways but this time I was adamant with this and I was ready to face all hardships that comes with traveling in a foreign land. But at present further adventure seems to be an impossibility with the sudden deteriorating weather. The leaves of the tree were palm shaped with a surface area so huge and a viscous coating on their upper layer which at least made it more than reliable with my worst luck for the tree itself to not fall over me or be prey to the lightning which could strike any time out of the blue. Waiting for the heavy downpour, I again stared at the map in self contemplation. Not this way, this way neither, maybe this way. Screw this. Screaming, I tore the paper in half and folding it again and repeating the tearing action I reduced it into bits of pieces. What was I thinking? Using a 200 year old map in a forest where everything is shaded in pure green. Shouldn't that tree be on the left side instead of being behind me? And why is there a cliff where it should have been a pond? It seems that you are lost. I was so happy when I got out of the labyrinth. Thinking at this point my misfortunes would come to an end. But I think my luck just got worse that the bald guy who won a comb in a lottery. Maybe I shouldn't have torn the map after all, since it was my only source of information for the outside world topography. Al if you think you are that smart, then why don't you tell me where are we exactly where you should be? And when he finally returns to normal, he decides to play possum like an alligator and hint games like a stupid GPS and then chides me with his girly childish voice. Fine then I am starting to call you the navigator from today. I said with my cheeks almost puffed out. Hey, hey what are you thinking? Isn't it obvious if your sense of direction is bad, then mine will be too. After all I am made from your consciousness. That might be true, but it didn't need to be so direct about it and rub it on my old wounds. I thought I was able to get rid of this curse. But it seems that it is going to haunt me for the rest of my life. And here I was talking to myself. Well that's what another person would see me doing. I can't even tell now whether it will rain. Like a not so serious match put on hold. I once read in a book that if you lose your way then it is the best thing to ask your way or stay at the same place where someone can get you through. I can't find anyone in this jungle. I have been scrambling across a temporary small route and probably some huge wild animal might have been regularly using it. It should either lead me to a water source or to a place where I can get to find something edible. I can turn into a skeleton just by staying here for eternity. Negative, due to effect of immortality. Given future not possible. So, he is really considering it. For once when I want to feel self-motivated and a move further. Al recently has started talking more and more and switching personalities at the same time. If only it had an on off button. Caution. Afraid. Are you? So you finally realize who is the boss here? I felt like laughing loudly folding my arms as a superior who had full control over the life of his employee. But then again doing it to Al felt like I was the wicked one and then the jungle setting with me being a lost cause did not serve the mood. I must not damage the morale of my only companion for now. Caution. Okay, okay. Calm down I won't do such a thing. Unidentified being. Approaching at high speed. I quickly tightened my body, ready to face a monster. But then I did not identify it as a monster. So could it be? No. It probably is a person. I need to get ready. My first encounter with someone from the outside. Wait. If I act this suspicious, they might take me as a vagabond. I don't have an identification card either. Do they even have those in this world in the first place? How should I introduce myself? Should I give my name or my nationality? Wait, I am not even affiliated to a country in this world. Then again I don't know a single name or place and the map is destroyed for some unforeseen reason. For the first time I realized how important a country serves as a role for a person's identity. Then suddenly I remembered mother's advice to put on the mask she gave me. Without wasting a single second, the mask bounced out of my dimensional storage and pressing it lightly on my face, it glued itself. 
The mask was built so impressive and comfortable that I could consider it as an extension of my own body and it doesn't put a hindrance in my vision or facial expressions. My hairs turned black and got shorter than before. Before I could come up with a phrase of exchanging pleasantries a realization struck me. A normal person in a normal situation won't be running in the jungle. Could it be that the person is a bandit or someone who has already detected my presence and wants to attack me? That would be way bad, than me myself being considered suspicious. Then again I am not an expert of solving misunderstandings. I was at the verge of biting my fingers out of disparity with the thoughts of what to do next. SHRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRR
even when he is in grave danger. Maybe it's time to tell him. So how should I do it? Fear not, because I have taken care of the problem. And then blush with open teeth. Or so I thought. That's way too embarrassing. Then I took a proper look at the person, deciding to form my response on his attire and make a guess of their personality. As if at that point sunlight shed a spotlight on the figure, as the clouds drifted away by some miracle of a sudden trade wind in the stratosphere, there was the usual long red gape, as I still couldn't see underneath the shadow that formed on the person's face. The person had a slender figure and a built of that of a girl, her height a little less than my own. The next instant my eyes were following the dangling brown basket in the other hand of this person. In the big picture the only identical character that came to my mind was Little Red Riding Hood. Have I been pushed into a small fantasy tale meant for children? So how did it really go? The girl meets the wolf. I too hate wolves for my own personal reason. Then she heads towards her place of doom. That can't be. She is already being chased by monsters and hurrying to her destination. Don't tell me there is a wolf plotting all of this. But first my curiosity got better of me and the next thing I knew I was up for an investigation. Did your grandmother make this gape? First I needed to establish the true identity of this person. Yes. Maybe due to mental pressure and all that running the person answered without a second thought in her mind. An affirmative. No. I still can't let my preconceptions dilute my further inquiry and deter me from my decision. The next question will be crucial. Are you going to your grandmother's house? The one question that will separate truth from all other possibilities. Yes. Another hushed answer escaped from the person's lips and the color of my face faded away into the background, much paler than the usual. One could doubt that whether my veins even carry the same blood color. We are almost there. There was a feeling of joy in the answer of my savior, but I was stomped tight on the face with every step we took. No dot no, I need to stop the story from reaching its climax. She needs to be saved and so should be her grandmother too. But as far as I remember the wolf would have already eaten her by now and yet the story comply on saying that the grandmother would come out of the stomach alive and unscathed if the wolf is defeated. I hardly believe it and at the same time I am not a doctor to proceed with such a successful, delicate and miraculous operation. Such tragic story is always being made fun of by the children. If only someone would put themselves in the same shoes as her and the scars she was about to receive. I could feel myself crying from despair. Such heartrending story I have to witness right after I leave the labyrinth. The surface is really to be feared. Ha, huh? I am glad we made it. The person suddenly stopped in their feet and took a deep breath. Without me realizing, I too had stopped running and was breathing heavily. But I still did not have a hold on myself and the situation I was in right now. The person pushed her hood back and two tall fox-like ears stood tall on the head of a young girl who wore a calm expression. How adorable. And yet I still felt uneasy with my rampant thoughts traveling and almost reaching light speed in my mind. You are going to make me cry. She looked at my still shaking hand still grabbing onto her tightly as she curled up a smile and trying to hide it with her other hand while still held onto the basket. Welcome to my village Iron. I felt a bit relieved that there is still time before the tragedy is realized, but wait why the little riding hood is already a beast kin. Am I missing the point here? Iron Village. I am so sorry for grabbing your hand like that out of nowhere. Please forgive me. But it all happened in the spur of the moment. I, the girl in front of Alicia was now bowing her head in regret. Alicia was taken aback, her thoughts being elsewhere and unable to produce any rational statement. She drew a blank each time. For the first time she was about to talk to a stranger other than mother, father, Lily and Flora. Saying she was nervous was beyond what would describe her demeanor. She didn't even know what kind of expression she was making right then. Without a doubt standing frozen, as if she was trying to make a fool out of herself and how dim which she could be. My name is Lucia and I live in this village. The girl smiled while her ears twitched with Alicia's statue play. She determined that Alicia was probably afraid of the monsters chasing them and how she escaped with her life. Alicia. That's my name. Even though how fluent the stranger was, Alicia still came out a bit weird. 
she realized it was the kind of introduction a new student would end up giving on their first day being doomed for their happy school social life and could kiss it goodbye. I think it's safe to follow inside the village for now. There is no telling when the monsters would chase our scent to here. Lucia gave a jolt to them holding hands while she started pulling her towards a small entrance made of thick logs stacked vertically, not too high and neither too short to directly jump over. Alicia did not protest or detest from being carried around, rather still being in her zero mind state recovering from the shock that all her fantasies were for naught and all her concerns were of little help, but at the same time she was glad that none of that held true. In front of the thick wooden twofold gateway she saw a man standing with a long tail and raccoon type ears, probably another beast king giving guard while holding a long spear made out of crude steel. She doubted he could do much against the monsters with that puny thing but at the same time could tell that he was sincere at his job. Mr. Blum can you open the gate for us? It seems that I would have to end my search for today. I am glad Lou that you returned safely but who is this person with you? The guard formed pinching eyes as they tried to scan over the guest brought by Lou. Nonetheless, it was clear from his expression that Alicia's visit was something not welcome and suspicious. There's no need to be alarmed Uncle Blin as you can see that for yourself. It's kind of my fault that she got dragged here. I need to report to Grandfather that there was a monster stampede. What? A monster stampede? Did they try to hurt you? Blin's voice stiffened at the mere mention of the monsters. I am fine. And it seems that currently they are heading to the left of the village. That's a relief. Sanity was restored on Blun's face. X. X. Cool. Alicia wanted to tell them that she had already taken care of the monsters, to which they were referring to as a stampede, but her words were cut short when she was interrupted. Don't worry, this village will soon receive their protection. You can rest easy in the village for now. Blin tried to cheer up the stranger by giving a thumbs up. After he heard Lucia mentioning about stampede, he saw how pale the girl was even though she was wearing a mask which covered only the part above her nose and sides under the ears. With her stiff expression and dried lips he concluded that the girl was probably scared to death with the monsters chasing her, but he was more concerned for Lou who was right now huffing and puffing. It did not took him a moment to realize that they came running here by covering a fair amount of distance in a very short time. He took off the heavy-looking pillar that bound the gate like it was nothing and let the two of them through. Upon entering a multitude of people surrounded Lucia, where they all possessed quirky tails and ears that reminded Alicia of the animals that inhabited her previous world. For once she also gave a thought of how it would be like if back on Earth the animals evolved into a human-like appearance and gained equivalent intelligence. Will then Earth head to a dystopian world of species division or will they be able to make peace and understanding with the situation? For her that situation was akin to communicating with these people and finding her way out of this. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne. Lou, we heard that you were caught in a monster stampede. Are you alright? An old woman stepped forward among the dozens who had surrounded the two of us. While some tried to scrutinize my appearance and stared at my mask and the white dress I was wearing they were hearing to the explanation which Lucia was delivering to them. It seemed to me that she is quite popular and loved by all the villagers. That made me feel quite happy that I was apparently rescued by her though it seems that I have now lost my chance to tell them that I killed all the monsters. At first most of them were batting me an eye. No one would welcome a stranger in their village with nothing to identify themselves. I might as well come up with a story that I am anemic. But what if they had a healer and would force me to go through a treatment for an interrogation? So I dropped the idea. Miss Alicia please come with me. Before the number of question which the other villagers threw at me headed to infinity, Lucia pulled my hand and started walking towards the biggest house in the village. It was not that a luxurious house, but fit for a village setting and environment. So were the other small houses, but real peace of mind does not come with how long high or beautiful the roof is but how reliable we find it for ourselves. I know it more than better, myself. I think I was now accustomed to the way of their speaking and how they lead their peaceful lives by cooperating with each other. It was properly reflected by the fact that they let a stranger like me in, just by the consent of one person, also showing how much they trusted each other. The whole village probably functioned like a one big family. Pushing the wooden door. Both of us came in. Grandfather I am back. 
saying that Lucia started walking towards the inside room. She suddenly turned back and taking a look at me she pointed to a furniture made of soft twigs stuffed into a cushion, probably a copy of an old styled curved armed sofa. Miss Alicia please wait for a moment there. With a bit of hesitation and scanning a room only to find a big window and a beautiful cloth covering one of the walls like an art piece on display, I sat down on the sofa. From inside I heard Lucia talking to someone. After a few minutes an old man came outside of the gate through which Lucia just went in. He was a certified octogenarian with old wrinkly fox ears and a brown tail. He was a fitting image of the wise old man who would sit under the huge village tree and make all important decisions. I was this time prepared to interact properly because I cannot screw at this point of time. Since I am a human, they are probably wary of me being in such a dangerous forest wandering alone in the demon continent. He took a seat just in front of me on another similar sofa placed adjacent to the table. I am the chief of this village and also Lucia's grandparents. It seems that our granddaughter has given you quite a trouble. Even though he looked so old and his teeth so brittle, his voice was still loud and clear to my ears. They carried weight in them. No, I am rather grateful to her for saving me. Apparently that's what I decided to go with, to accept their side of truth. If it's that what you think, then I am glad that Lou was able to help someone in need. Even though Lou has already told me about your situation I would like to hear what you have to say on the matter. Here it is the inquiry, but instead of showing any mistrust and refusing to give an answer, for the kindness they have bestowed on me, I decided to share just that much information which I could in that moment. My name is Alicia. I am trying to find my way to the human continent. That's when I met your granddaughter after getting lost in the forest. If I may will you please kindly show me the way. I was now staring back at the old man who was keenly observing me. I see. I would be more than happy to tell you the way, but it seems that you have quite strayed far away from the human continent. Phew. Is that so? In that moment all I could do was pass a small laughter and laugh at my own pathetic self. Damn by sense of direction and my specialty in always getting lost. Could I please ask you why the mask? I am sorry but this is for my protection, so I can't remove it. Please forgive me. As I was about to bend my head a little, the old man smiled. It's all right. It is quite understandable for a traveler to keep their identity secret sometime. I won't pry further into the matter. Thank you for your understanding. Maybe you should try staying here for a day or two because the cause of the stampede is still unknown and it will take time for the monsters to be scattered and dealt with. I assure you your stay in this village will be personally looked after by me and you are free to leave at any time you wish. Now if you would excuse me. The old man stood from his seat and started heading to the exit as he called out to his granddaughter, Lou, I'm heading out to reinforce the village's security, by that time why don't you try to entertain our guest, okay, but don't work yourself too hard over there, otherwise I won't give you your sweet root dish, then I will be looking forward to those, see that conversation was not that hard, if I try then I can talk normally with people too. It's all thanks to mother that I was able to improve on my communication skills. At this point I wondered why I never bothered doing it in my previous life but maybe at that time I myself never wanted it. But now that I know how it feels to know more about people and reach various places, I can't help but adore the fact that we can connect with people just with a single smile. A magic if only I ever tried learning in my past self. Lucia soon came out of the room with a tray consisting of a stack of beans and roots mixed together in a sweet jam paste. Miss Alicia, why don't you try this? Is this really for me? Yes, I made these sweet dishes myself. I don't know what humans eat around these parts, but this is all I can offer right now. Lucia stood there clumsily holding the tray. I could tell that she just wanted to know how her dish really tasted in front of others. I happily picked one of them and started chewing on it. The texture seemed to be a bit rough because of the raw roots but they were fresh and sweet. An ingredient I had never seen. I had to know where I can find it as soon as possible. It's delicious and sweet. You really liked it? Lucia still spoke timidly. Yes so much that I want to know how it is made. Where did you find these special sweet roots? Tell me, 
For a moment Lucia thought that Alicia came hard on her but seeing her interested in cooking and finding a partner was something she was looking forward to herself. After talking for a while with Lucia I learned that she is good at making medicines and she was collecting herbs for that purpose in the basket. No doubt about it, she is like an ideal nurse for the village who can heal any wounds and relieve a person of pain by her herbal medicines. I think you should try to add more sugar into this dish to make it more sweet at its core and the jam too. But sugar is quite a rare commodity here. After the tragedy, merchants stopped visiting this place and the population subsided too. Just finding merchants to trade in everyday goods is quite difficult. I wondered what tragedy she was mentioning but just saying that looked tough for her so instead of going on the topic I tried to push it away for the moment. Then how about this? I put out a sugar jar on the table from my dimensional storage. Feel free to use. There's more from where it came. Wow, Miss Alicia you are so amazing. I didn't know you can use dimensional storage. And thank you for the sugar too. Is dimensional storage a rare spell? If I think about it everyone in my family has one and their capacity is humongous, with mine having no limits. Well, it might be common among the royals and noble, but for commoners, possessing one is quite rare. In our entire village only I and Granny possess this skill. Is that so? I didn't try to ponder or ask much about it, otherwise I would be raising suspicious regarding my oblivious nature to today's society and general knowledge. I think I know another way to improve this dish. I am so glad that I found someone else with interest in cooking all kinds of dishes. Usually there are no kids of my age. Most of them are aged and very few infants. I started wondering are things really that bad here? If people are migrating towards more developed and safer location then such problems are sure to arise. Well, since I am here maybe we should exchange more information. So, how about using boiled roots? instead of just rinsing them and leaving them in water. I see, that would make these roots soft and the water may even gain some sweetness of the roots, which I can put used to elsewhere. You are a genius Miss Alicia. Well, I am a good cook after all, but maybe we should try to learn what would be the best time limit to boil these roots. Let's get to it. I can't wait to taste the new dish. Grandfather will love it and it's all thanks to you. As Lucia tried to lift the sleeves of her dress because she was going to immerse her hands in water, her enthusiastic activity was cut short. Tongue, 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 tongue. Our interesting conversation was soon put on hold when a large bell went off. Why are they ringing the emergency bell right now? Lucia voiced her concerns. The color of her face drained of her brilliant smile. I didn't really know what to do. If only I could help her. If I knew where the problem was. But if I have to stay in this village for some time and find a way to help I need to act covertly in all of this now. If I draw attention then it might bring unwanted suspicions and opinions. Miss Alicia please wait here. I will take a look into the matter and inform you if there is any danger. Okay, but be careful. That was all I could say as I saw Lucia leave in a hurry. The only thing I could do was ask how to detect for any monsters nearby because that would be the only worst case scenario when our safety and lives will be put in jeopardy. No matter what, I will do anything in my power to keep them safe. Iron Village, near Eastern Wall. A group of villagers were already gathering under the cherry tree growing just on the inner side of the Eastern Wall. This was the place where most of the decisions regarding the village were taken and this time the meeting was secretly put up for discussion on the new human visitor. While several folks were already murmuring among themselves. What are your thoughts about that human, Lucia brought? I can't say anything. I have still not seen the human. I saw here. She looked around the same age as Lucia and wore a mask and dress made of fine fabric. Said one of the old lady among the crowd, that sounds suspicious. Do you think it's a noble that accidentally came here? If that's the case then there sure will be knights protecting her. As one of the villagers mentioned of human knights a hushed silence crept through. Do you think the humans will sabotage us again and try to attack us like the last time? One of the villagers raised his voice almost biting his tongue at the end. Please, it's still too early to think about those nightmares. But we should be more careful. Should we take her hostage and force out an answer from her? Said a young man with a strong built, 
That would be way too reckless. We don't have the manpower or force to oppose someone. We should try to negotiate. It was Blin this time who tried to calm down others. When will the village chief be coming? <laughs> Blin I think you write about one thing. A concentrated voice enveloped the whole compound of the tree. As an old figure tried to climb a small platform raising his chin he addressed a small group of people that commanded authority and respect in this village. While the man in discussion himself stood above in hierarchy of respect and authority, we lack the manpower and force to repel anyone. But we don't want to see those nightmares again. That's why negotiation is the best option. By showing our kindness all we can hope for is their goodwill in return. Have faith in the teachings of Sophs to love those who show compassion and spread it among those who lacks it. But can this human really be trusted? What if we let them go and they leak our information? I think this human is quite reasonable and thoughtful of her own actions. The village chief answered without any hesitation. After having a talk with the human in question herself, by his experience and age tears he could tell that this human meant no harm to them whatsoever. Humans have never been trustworthy and most of them hate us. So what if she tries to flaunt her superiority notions? I think that won't be the case. It seems that she recognizes us as an equal or rather sees us more as an individual person than discriminate on the basis of race. I assure you that I am concluding all of this after having a chat with a human myself. But can we be sure that this human girl is not harmful in any way? Aid the young man flexing his muscular built body. I hardly doubt that. She is just a human girl. Blin you have the highest level appraisal skill here, so tell me what you saw. Indeed the human is quite weak than the normal standards, village chief. She is just a level 30 and does not possess any special skill. Actually I was unable to find any skill in her slot. It doesn't seem to be forged either. Her stat were normal, though I feel her age stat was a bit absurd or I might have mistaken myself in hurry. Except for the mask thing I highly doubt the human can cause any harm to us. But then again wearing mask is pretty common on travels to hide their identities. It is rather possible, she might be a noble, or an escapee. Regarding her unusual clothing and aloofness from the norms of the normal society, but she appears to have a logical way of thinking, which means we can always have a talk in case we find ourselves with the shorter end of the stick. All I ask from you is to place your trust in me, and for the moment let's show our hospitality to this human. I hope that no one disagrees with my decision. Tongue, 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 tongue. Village chief, someone rang the emergency bell from the northern wall. Ringing it for four times, the threat is at its maximum. Could it be that humans came to attack us? Don't tell me she was their spy. One of the villagers suddenly panicked in between the crowd. Silence, calm yourself down. Blin send your men to confirm the situation. While some of us will head to check on all the other villagers and just in case get the emergency exit ready. Suddenly a man came running and at the same time the village chief noticed his granddaughter rushing to his side. Grandfather what's the matter? Why are people pointing finger at Miss Alicia? She is not like that. I am sure of it. Lou, it seems that there is an emergency. But for now instead of panicking we should contact the northern gate as quickly as possible. The man that came running presented himself in front of the village chief. Village chief it seems that a total of five dragons have formed a new nest near the northern gate. For now they seem to be maintaining their distance but they try to come closer every now and then. I see. Saying that the village chief receded into deep thoughts. Wait it's not the humans then. But being attacked by dragons is way worse. Do you think they are going to use this village as their feeding ground? At the mention of these a wave of terror struck all the villagers' heart as they looked up in the sky, seeking for salvation. Could the earlier stampede of monsters be because they were running from the dragons? It was Blin who had probably returned with the report. But suddenly some of the guards started talking about something they had heard rumors of. We can't fight the dragons on our own. What should we do? There is only one way to save our lives. We must contact that person. You mean him? Yeah the other nearby villages were saying that taking his protection was the right decision they made. Only he can protect us. So how do we find him? Grandfather about whom they are talking about. Lucia looked at her grandfather's alarmed expression. 
Lucia there is a rumor going around of a very strong intelligent being giving his protection to nearby villages that can't protect themselves on their own. So isn't that a good thing? That might be correct and yet far away from the truth. This world is not so kind when it comes to greed and fulfilling the wishes of others. It can be only done by those who desire nothing for themselves. Just like Sophs. Lucia had always admired that one person and every time she remembered her. It brought her peace, if only that were true. Replied her grandfather in a thin voice as if avoiding anyone unnecessary from hearing it. Just then a gust of wind seemed to have blown away almost all the leaves from the cherry tree. A being dressed in black descended from the sky. Long black feather wings protruded from its back and a face far from humanity but more close to a monster. The overwhelming dark aura it exuded was felt by everyone and no one tried to defy his descent. It had a head of a crow hands akin to an eagle's legs and feet covered in his long black tunic robe. His dark eyeballs protruded on the sides of his head focused itself at each of the villagers that were present there as if they were some kind of mere objects. While most of the villagers recognized him as the being who calls himself an apostle. Chapter 2 The light of their stars reflected on the snow. The village chief stepped forward from the crowd leaving his granddaughter behind. He came face to face with a strange creature that had suddenly appeared before them without any admonition. I am the chief of this iron village. May I ask who you are? There were probably strains of tension on his forehead, and the way he stuttered while walking showed how badly he was affected by the overwhelming magical aura released intentionally by the visitor. But the old man did not falter and stood tall to represent his village amidst all chaos and danger surrounding his only home. Greetings beastlings. I am the appointed protector of this forest by the order of my master. My name is Corvus and I am the eighth apostle. The apostle stood aloof and his inhuman way of speaking showed how he looked down on the people standing in front of him. Disgustingly weak that's the impression his expressions passed regarding the assessment of the villagers. Most of the villagers were panicking, or either fell down on their knees because their legs could not hold them for long. The coldness from this creature had put everyone on the edge. May I ask the nature of business that you have come here for? Asked the chief, directly moving on business are we? I see. News regarding the benefits other villages have received because of my protection must not have passed unheard of, I suppose. Yes your humble presence is surely welcomed here. But what can this small village offer to you for your utmost commitment you have shown in protecting this tiny village in the middle of nowhere? The village chief knew there was a catch to all of this which even the other villagers were afraid or did not wish to share details of. A quick one you are saving me a lot of trouble. Then for you I can get rid of the dragons that have nested here and also assure you that no other monster or anyone else would ever bring harm to this village. Oh great apostle thank you. Thank you for your protection. We are so grateful to you for gracing us with your powers. Cheers of the villagers crashed in the compound while their voices were muffled and dried out, contradicting to the enthusiasm they meant through in words. They were acting like they were pushed into some kind of suggestive hypnotic force. However, nothing offered by those in power ever appears itself without an offering from those who shall receive it. The Apostle made a deep remark, Great Apostle, but as I said this village possesses no luxury that I think would satisfy your taste. The chief's worries were surfacing on his face now, while the crow head took notice of it and increased the push of his aura as if making fun of the and taking advantage of the insecurities of the people. Of course there is, I want you all to offer one of your people to me for the rest of their lives. That to offer one of us to you. The shoulders of the chief were now shaking hard. His breath became heavy as he gasped for a mouthful of air from the thin cold atmosphere in his surroundings. Is there a problem? All I ask is to offer one of your people's life to me and accept your happy lives. Is that such a heavy price for the happiness of hundreds it is fitting that one must sacrifice his own freedom? Everyone stood silent, while the crow head rotated in first clockwise and then anti-clockwise as if searching a specific someone from the crowd. His eyes fixated on one of the villagers. A young girl with light brown hair with fox ears and a bushy tail. The eyes that were embedded in the crow head, narrowed to as fine as needle-like, a curvy smile surfaced on his face. That one will do just fine. 
He pointed his wings at the young Lucia who were holding her hands tight as if offering a prayer, but it seemed her prayers were damned even by the forest spirits that were said to listen to every heartfelt wish. The color at the face of the chief paled to almost make his cheerful face look dead. In desperation he could not hold himself back and in his anxiousness begged the strange being, Great Apostle, I beg pardon, but a young child as an offering. You can even take food, money or me but spare her. She is just a child who hasn't even enjoyed her life yet. Please do not rob of her at least that when all people in this corner part of the world of their small meager life to live for themselves. Please reconsider it. A wish of this old man who will soon depart from this world. Also this girl is an instrumental force in keeping the people of this village healthy. If there is even something else you can change your mind on please. Everyone in the village was now under a pin drop silence to hear what the chief said. Lucia's mind had gone blank as she stood expressionless there trying to fully understand and cope up to realize the predicament she was about to face. Her eyes flinched, almost shaking out a small stream of tears. There is no room for negotiation. You do realize your situation. Do you not? As I can tell the dragons nested nearby would probably make this their feeding grounds the very next day. I have already made up my mind with the offering. It's for you all to decide whether you would give up on one of yours and save others or either end up being annihilated all at once. But just so you know, if you displease me a great disaster shall befall on you. Now I shall take my leave. The next moment the huge wings of the crow flapped for once and a heavy gust of winds, almost destroying half the walls and wrecking the nearby houses he vanished into the vastness of the sky. The people around were too devastated to realize the amount of damage incurred. While some of them stared at Lou and the village chief, most of them were dumbstruck with the warning that had left a bloody picture in their minds. Lucia quietly started walking towards her grandfather as others watched silently, unable to come up with anything they just stood there as observers. Even in that crowd Lucia felt lonely. Village chief and Lucia's grandfather caught her by the shoulder before she fell on the ground. Grand. Grandfather, I am sorry my child. I couldn't do anything. I feel so useless, even though I promised to keep you safe. It's all right. It's really all right. See I am just fine. I will be just going to another place with that person. He won't do anything bad to me. Isn't he just going to protect our village, so he might even sometimes allow me to meet you? I will be just fine, so please don't worry. Astonishingly, Lucia wore a calm expression, but her eyes said otherwise. No, Lou it's not fine, but Grandfather will figure something out. At that time the cries of a young girl being separated from her family might have been heard loud and clear to a great distance and yet the people near her were powerless. Even the only person lending her a shoulder, her own family member, no matter what he sacrificed, things just couldn't be restored. The same usual tomorrow where she would go to gather herbs won't come. The basket would stay at the rack, with no one around to move it. Endless despair doesn't even come close to describe what she was feeling then. After being the only survivor of the tragedy three years ago, she again ends up bringing sadness and misfortune for people around her. Finding yourself at the center of everything and even then being unable to control the situation and things starts heading towards complete dead end. Nothing is more painful than that. Right about the same time, the eighth apostle landed on an elevated plateau, or rather a long chain of flat top mountains. His large dotted black eyes looked furious as he was unable to locate the dragons he had left there to scare the villagers and corner them. But his plan was coming along so smoothly that he decided to rather ignore the situation. Those damn young dragons always run away and never listen to what they are taught. Hell with those empty-minded ravenous creatures might have run to somewhere else in search of food. No matter, I have as many monsters at my disposal to take care of the village if need arises to. Tomorrow just might be the final day. The wait is just about to end and Master Zero will be glad to hear of its success. Alicia was Scalon Ashborn. Lucia is taking quite longer than I expected. Did something really bad happen? Al did you come up with something in the search? Affirmative. Fired dragons directly to north confirmed. Now hearing of dragons makes me all fired up. I fought one of them in the labyrinth, but I never saw one of them flying. 
Dragon riding is one of the things I wanted to try. Then again it might be a sport here. And if it's not what about I make a racing one. I can roll a fortune if I start a betting business on the dragon race. Then again I don't think gambling is a thing that can save this world. So I should drop the thought of opening a gambling business. Probably. I mean for sure. But I won't give up on riding dragons. Now for the address. If it's nearby then I can directly teleport there. Better than traveling and again getting lost. I have already learned my lesson. Teleport. I was now on a plain grassland, but the smell in the air stink of rotten flesh and blood. The wind was stronger than other places. I didn't have to search for them because five large lizards with wings growing out from their back, long thorny tail with sharp claws and fangs embellishing their bodies were flying right in front of me. Now that I remember there is always a den of overdramatic, overexcited and extremely weird possessing overly superficial tendencies going beyond the cosmos. The UFO club, which probably studies on finding evidence over existence of extraterrestrial life forms, and they make it sound so legit even displaying a flying frisbee in such a dark background and a glowing light with an overly descriptive account that one ends up in believing them. They are a scary bunch of people, for sure. And now that I remember, I wonder why someone never bothered with dragons. Finding dragons in my previous world shouldn't be impossible if people really claim on finding UFO and aliens. I mean we can even club the two factions in one to increase the scope of search and success rate, but a dragon club existence might be another perk of being reincarnated in another world. I can probably tame dragons, see dragon eggs hatch. Dragon riding. I might even ask their help with a gambling business. No. No. I mean with a dragon entertainment sport race. But now that I take a closer look at these five, are these five really dragons? Shouldn't they be 20 times much larger than this? Even if I add hundreds of these, they don't even come close to the one I defeated in the labyrinth. Might have been a mistake by Alan identifying them. They probably are wyverns, a subspecies of dragon. But even if they pose a minimal threat to the villagers' life they don't deserve to live. Wag. So they finally noticed me. The screams of the dragons became louder and louder until they started talking among themselves. It would have been bad if they continued. Then it might have attracted attention and I might have been found out. I smell fresh prey, but what's a little puny human doing here? We have the strongest of all races. How can you be just satisfied with one? Can't you see there's a whole village there on whom we can feed? We have already disobeyed those stupid laws that bound us from attacking people and confine ourselves on the Dragon Island. But now is the time for the big haul. You all can wait all you want. I am going to taste dish that human. Look how afraid the human is to wear a mask and hide their crying face. Saying that one of the dragons bending their mouth and strong fiery heat rays started collecting in its mouth. It seems they think that I cannot understand what they are talking about, but it makes me happy that I learn all of the languages, because now I know that I can get rid of these guys, it would be quite distasteful and boring when I wouldn't even know what they were actually doing out here, as the flames were about to leave the huge mouth of the dragon as it opened in twofold, I launched my own simple magic, black flare, a small black flame ball headed towards it. The inside of the mouth of the dragon suddenly turned black, as it started shrieking in pain. The other dragons unable to understand what suddenly happened. They started flying around him, though their concerns doesn't matter to me now, as they had already stated their hostility towards me and the villagers. Leaving a single one of them can prove to be disastrous. I can't allow myself to be a merciful person to leave the others alive and later learn that they caused another accident. Hey! What's wrong with your flames? You haven't still learned how to control them. Ha! <laughs> what a joke you are. It's not me. Something is not right. I'm burning. Suddenly the insides of the dragon being burned he died and fell to the bottom. The other dragon stood puzzled midair. Did he really die of his own flames? No. I think it's the work of that masked human. Go and get her. Make her her pay. Damn you human. Just die. The next moment the remaining four charged their mouth with blistering fire blasts as it was released into a brilliant flash of light, to even change the density of air as the oxygen in the area was burned out in an instant. I snapped my two fingers a small black flame launched from my hands, 
the moment it came in contact with the huge magical concentration of the raging fire magic, it spread like a virus corrupting all of the fire into a dense black flame. You shouldn't play with fire, if you can't take the heat, and don't go on creating environmental hazards in this new world. The next moment I knew the remaining four sizzled flying monsters too fell down on the ground with a huge thud and disappeared in my black webs. Since the problem has been taken care of, I should probably return before they find me missing from my place. I don't think I will be able to explain myself and I also don't feel like lying to them either. Something tells me that even if I did, they will catch it no matter what. Teleport. I was quietly sitting on the designated sofa, when the three of them walked in. Lucia and her grandparents. Now I started wondering that I did not see her parents or any of her siblings if she had any. As I was about to wish them on coming back, I realized it was not my place and also something made me hesitant when I looked at their depressed faces. Wait, didn't I took care of the dragons, so what could be the matter to make them sad? Were my actions that made them upset? Now I was having second thoughts, about re-evaluating my work. I make sure not to burn a single ribbon of grass, or harm the land. I was as secretive as a pro-assassin at work. No one would have noticed. So what it is actually? It can't be. But surely I be. No, what have I done? It's my fault. I am sorry Lucia. I know, but it's something I cannot prevent from happening. Even though I am such an avid fan of fantasy worlds and yet I fail to notice that dragons are quite a delicacy, though I myself have not tasted them. But when I think deeply about it, the disappearance of five hefty fat dragons, from the food chain of there is quite a big loss, but how could I even tell them, don't worry Lucia, those were just twivens maybe, I will hunt a real dragon and they'll make a new tasty dish out of it just for you. It's all those wyverns fault, who decided to attack first, those fat lizards, I will ask Xenos to make their soul suffer and make them pay even in hell, as you command my lady. A bone rattling voice rang in my mind, as my shadow flickered a little. Wait. Wait, I was just joking, but then again maybe I shouldn't stop him, because it's his actual line of work perhaps. Then also, I purified and destroyed all the souls he kept in his personal purgatory, so it's fine. For the remaining day, the atmosphere of the house remained gloomy, though I talked with Lucia for a bit and also had a small chat with her grandmother, but they were just normal things. Most of them I already knew about and the rest was evident from the technological development and the lifestyle of theirs. Most of the time the village chief remained quiet and kept himself shut inside the room. I also helped Lucia in preparing the dinner and she was thankful for my help. But rather I pitied myself for snatching away what could have been their main course dish. Just look at Lucia how sad she looks. That it frightens me to even think about it that I won't be able to see her smile again like she did after saving me. Later that night I was invited to the dinner table to share the meal with them. They're quite a generous family to let a stranger sit and eat with them. But then again, traveling is quite common in this world and people's hospitality is what attracts the traders and merchants in the first place bringing riches and information from all parts of the world. But the atmosphere was quite tense. The chief and Lucia's grandmother did say that they liked the food and how the taste has accentuated with some of the ingredients I added from my storage. He also complimented Lou and me for the sweet root dish, to the extent that he cried as if he would never be able to eat that dish again. After a few moments of silence and some small conversation that ended following a small crackle of laughter and a deep sigh, as if they were subduing their feelings on purpose. Lou, why don't you get the room prepared for our guest? I am sure she has been tired after all the things she went through today. The village chief said to his granddaughter as he passed his plates to his wife who was cleaning them. Lucia left the room, while after the washing of the dishes and the strange silence, Lucia's grandmother joined the two of us on the dining table once again. Miss Alicia it's my understanding of the present predicament I find my village that I ask you a favor. The village chief curled his fingers round the empty glass as his face revealed his true expressions. He was purely sad, and I could feel the pain that was akin to losing someone important to us. Please don't hold yourself back. I am willing to do anything in my power to pay you back for your spontaneous hospitality you have shown a stranger like me. 
I know I might have stammered in between my speech a bit but I meant every word of it. So, before that I want you to know something, said the old man in a serious tone. What is it about? I had no clue to what he was reaching at. First for a favor and now suddenly answer my pop quiz. My hippocampus couldn't get its way around comparing these two things. I want you to know that we are not the real grandparents of Lucia. Also Lucia once had a sibling and her parents. The old man suddenly stopped speaking as tears dripped from his cheeks and wetted the tablecloth. I see, but can you tell me what exactly happened to them? It seems that it is quite important for me to know. Now that I remember Lucia did mention of a tragedy, it is probably something related to that, of which details I must know. About three years ago, Lucia lived in a village located on the other side of the mountains. Wait isn't it in close proximity from where I came from? If there was a village, I must have seen it beforehand. So what happened to make it disappear like that? The village chief continued. At that time a human army invaded several of our settlements and took our brethren as slaves at the same time killing any of those who tried to oppose them or run. It was a complete disaster. No matter even if we put all of our resources and manpower it was difficult to repel them, with their huge army. Unfortunately, Lu's village was wiped on the previous night before our main forces arrived. No matter how much we tried we failed to locate her parents and her big sister. As for Lu I found her lying almost dead on the snowy mountain covered in a blanket of cold white ice. I still remember that event as clear as day, when I thought she was dead but I still carried her back home. At the end we were glad that she still had a faint heartbeat. She not only survived an entire ice storm but was also the last and the only survivor of that tragedy. I see. That's all I could say, my head facing downward I clutched my hands tightly, thinking about how difficult it has been for her to lose her parents at such a young age. But why are you telling me all of this? I asked the village chief. You see we thought that Lu held a grudge against humans or were rather afraid of them. Just mentioning about them makes her feel uneasy, but around you she suffers from no such pain and I rather find her happy. I don't know what caused this change, and as an outsider I don't want to involve you into the village matters, but tomorrow early morning I want you to leave this village as soon as possible and take our Lucia with you. Thuck. The three of us heard the crashing sound of a pot placed in the room next to us. The next second we heard the outside door booming with the wall and the running footsteps of someone. Lucia. Wait. The village chief and his wife stood from their place, but their old age seems to be preventing them from following her. In that case, I won't try to find out what really happened, as you asked of me, and I will consider your proposal. Let me go after Lucia. I looked at them straight into the eye for their permission, because I wanted to be the one to bring her back. Please bring our granddaughter back for us. We will be grateful to you for the remainder of our lives if you can take her away from here safely. She is a smart girl, I am sure she will find a way of her own. We too can't bear to watch her to be harmed while we too are still alive. She will be back smiling in no time. I promise you too. Saying that I too left from the house, a western cliff. I'll please track Lucia as soon as possible. She shouldn't have gone far away, and I will be able to teleport there. Location confirmed. Good. Teleport. I was now standing on a cliff just behind some huge rocks, and in between through a passageway. There was a short extension, providing me a perfect view, through which I could see a figure staring up at the sky and the sweetness of a song I had never heard before. One day, crossing over the highlands, I hear a voice calling me. I may turn back now and then, you are always by my side no matter what. Let my voice, let my song, connect with those memories. Your feelings give me hope, that in the end I will meet them someday, Miss Alicia. Suddenly Lucia called out to me, and I felt a bit worse seeing that I might have interrupted her song. Ah ah ah, so you found me out. Sorry for listening on, on you. I came out from behind the rocks through the passageway with an awkward laugh escaping my face. But I think Lucia didn't really mind at all. She had a calm expression on her face. Her eyes swollen from tears dried and wiped away. She looked lifeless and yet her eyes held kindness for me. Her hopelessness and alone struggles were obvious to someone like me, to make me realize that something else was bothering this village. And of course it was hurting her too, more than I can imagine. 
because it's her home now. I felt shut down and powerless in my inability to provide them with help. The chief village already asked me not to meddle. It is probable that if I am unable to solve the problem, then I might bring more harm than good. Just having the information might prove to be disastrous. Then again, he asked me to take Lucia with me. Tomorrow early morning, is her life in danger? And if it is then she should run with me. At least let me ask that much. I am so sorry Dot for running away like that. I made grandfather and grandmother upset didn't I? Even when I promised myself that I will never make anyone else cry. So, why don't you come with me back? I hurriedly asked. Miss Alicia how do you find the stars here? Lucia suddenly threw an unrelated query at me. The stars. I looked up and my gazes froze. How I had forgotten the night sky, and the bright little lights twinkling in its emptiness. A garden of glowing flowers, and a single moon shone like a ghostly silver disc in the sky. A carnival of scents blew in the cool breeze, which made me forget all the tension around, as strands of thin light shone upon the colorful flowers growing right down below the cliff. Almond brown trees stood serenely, awash with a tender glow. It was such a mesmerizing and spirit-lifting view that I felt blessed for the first time after coming on the surface. So this was the world in which Goddess Athena helped me to come. How could I ever repay her? But more than that, it was thanks to her that I was able to see this place at all. Miss Alicia did you like it? Yes. It feels like I can touch the stars from here. I said excitedly. The night sky in the labyrinth did not held a candle to the darkness the night reflected and the dazzling soothing light the stars poured itself in my eyes. However, it would be nice if I can do that too. Lucia was shocked and at the same time amazed to see the wild nature of Alicia whom she thought to be a quiet and a secretive girl who kept to herself. She always felt a boundary between her maybe because of that mask that she did not want to reveal herself about her much. But Lucia still wanted to know more. She had a feeling in her hair which she just couldn't let go of. Did I say something wrong? Alicia had no clue of why Lucia was laughing, because just a minute ago she found her utterly sad and miserable. Lucia stood there for a while with her head down and then she suddenly spoke with a distressed look on her face. I am sorry for running away like that. I did not want to eavesdrop on you. It's just that dot that. I put my hands on her shoulder because that's what I had seen in various shows people doing to give others support. I heard her clench her teeth. I felt like she had bottled up the loneliness and sorrow that must have been caused due to the tragedy, letting it lay dormant. She'd endured it. I don't know why and I don't want to know for now. Like a baby clinging onto their parent, Lucia grabbed my arm. There was only a faint glimmer of light left in her teary eyes as she gazed back into mine. If she was left alone now, I am sure she would still recover, because unlike me who shut down herself, she lived through each day and was alive. She was strong, and I know it. She slowly lowered her eyelids and brought her teary face closer to mine. She barely managed to squeeze her voice out through her tears. I don't want to leave from here. I don't want to go away from grandfather and grandmother. I am so sorry that I am only thinking about myself. It's okay if you want to be the only one happy. That's what I think. And it's exactly what I truly believe and for that purpose I was willing to do anything. Seeing Lucia sad, made me sad too. After she had quieted down and became calm, I wanted to ask her a question for a long time. Lucia why did you help me, there? Even though you know that I was a human, that you lost your family because of dot M. I was unable to speak any further, seeing that how painful it was for myself. It was not like I couldn't change my race using my skills and then later pretend nothing happened, but I wanted to live in this world, mostly in my human form, because that's who I am, but now seeing how cruel this world humans could be to do such a terrible thing I might have lost sympathy for any of them, it wouldn't come as a surprise if Lucia hate or detests me too, Miss Alicia you really want to know about that? Yes, I do. I said adamantly. Lucia gulped for a moment and then looking straight into my eyes she smiled for the first time, as if she wanted to share these feelings of her for the longest of time she had known me. It was because I was attracted to you. What? Somehow I felt uncomfortable. As my eyes circled out, I never expected a straight out answer from her. It's not like that, it was because of your smell. So, 
It's even worse than I thought it to be. Yes beast folk, obviously have an excellent hyper senses and catching on to someone's scent shouldn't come as a surprise. And someone like Lucia who had shown excellent beast capabilities, like her quick speed and sensing me from this far. I would say she is naturally talented, but don't tell me I have a peculiar or funny kid of smell. That would be disastrous. Are my cleaning spells not working? When I was traveling deep in the forest, it was then I felt someone's presence and the smell. It was so familiar to the extent I could call it to be that of my own family especially it reminded me of my big sister. Even now you know that it's not possible. I still couldn't help myself but look for you. Even though I never met a human later on or avoided them, I wanted to come closer to you. Please forgive me Miss Alicia if I offended you in any way. I am so glad that you finally felt like talking. But I think you should be glad that you reached out to me because you finally can have a big sister. What do you mean Miss Alicia? I am confused. Lucia looked at me with a question mark expression on her face. Therefore, I didn't make her wait long. You should start calling me big sister, and from today onwards I will be looking after you, Lucia. Then I want you to call me Lou as well. Okay big sister. I blushed with redness spread over my face. The way Lou spoke it even made it more embarrassing and we ended up having a good laugh over it. You know Lou, I came from very far away from here and I am searching for a person very dear to me. I will do anything for that person and would go any length to search for her. I finally said to someone for what I was here for and realized that I was still far away from my goal. I didn't exactly know where she was, what she might be doing, what her name is or whether she is even safe or not. I needed to move fast, as each days passed by I could sense the danger increasing. It was as if my own spider bells were ringing loudly giving me a premonition of the forelooming disaster. Since we will be together. Big sister then let me help you search for that person. She must be wonderful just like you if you care about her so much. Lou finally looked for a moment cheerful and had something to look forward to. Maybe this time she was ready to move on. Of course she is. She would be really happy to meet you too. So, let's now go to bed so we can head out early. With the new fangled sunrise a new journey will begin. I said pointing at the dark sky decorated with twinkling stream of countless possible stars. But even such a motivational pose made Lou hide her face, as if she did not wanted me to see something. After that we returned back to the village, while Lou's grandparents hugged her as soon as she stepped inside the home. I am sure they needed some personal space to discuss things, so I retarded to the assigned room I was given to sleep. The bed was not as big and comfortable as it used to be in the mansion. The roof was low and the walls were not even strong enough to withstand a gale storm. It's not like I am complaining about the weather or the living conditions here, but more importantly I felt saved. Today, Lou may have taken my hand to save me from monsters, but in truth she actually saved and rescued me from my loneliness, which I might have suffered if she did not happen to be there. All alone lost in the woods, I might have lived the day, but this beautiful possibility would not have existed. The feeling of being surrounded by people whom I can trust when asleep made me realize how abandoned I felt in the labyrinth for the year I spent alone, where no one knew me. I thought the outside world will be similar to that, but it was thanks to the kindness of Lude that I got to spend such a fantastic day. It's all thanks to Lady Athena I was able to come to this magical place and meet such wonderful people. I am sure that I will find her soon, but now I needed to sleep as I hoped that that Lou too would get some rest, because we were going to have a tough day tomorrow too, Lucia, it was just before the daybreak, I was about to open the door, behind which big sister Alicia was sleeping, I was so glad, when she allowed me to call her big sister and I could finally tell her something that which was precious to me, but now I was going to betray her feelings, I am such a horrible person, even when I promised her that we will be together when she searches for her friend. I am going to turn my back and run away, just the same as I did to my parents. I never turned away. Did I? Nothing has changed and I am still going far away from the people and village that I care about now. Grandpa and Grandma who looked after me, even when I had no one and when times were so difficult. I had to do this, but I did not have the courage to open the door and face her. The closer I get to the door, the stronger and heavier my breathing becomes. 
The thought of losing everything if I did not surrender my life terrified me more than anything. What if that apostle finds out that I ran away with her? With his power he could even chase and harm big sister Alicia and it will be all because of me. No, I won't let that happen. No one will get hurt anymore. Even if it means I have to keep diving in the darkness, my feeling does not matter any longer. I started running at my fastest towards the place told to us by the apostle. Even if he asks me to serve him for an entire life as a slave, I will willingly do as long as he promises to not harm anyone and keep my village safe. Being a sacrifice means turning and giving my entire life to the person indebted to. It was an old practice in the demon continent but still being followed now. We had no choice but to accept it, otherwise the strong would always crush the weak. I was just near the bottom of the foot of the chain of mountains which the apostle described. I turned around to search for him and when I looked straight, a black figure was standing in front of me. Where? The apostle standing in front of me made me scared. The terrified aura he exuded made me submit to him in a moment. I realized I had no say in the matter except to follow him. So, those inferior beings finally decided to make an offering. Well weak people always know how to turn up a scapegoat. The crowhead was now laughing with his beak wide open in air. It's not like that, I came here to protect my village. I will do anything you say to me. I will prove to you my will is strong enough to protect my village. I put my hand on heart and as if listening to it said every word I meant from my deep within. The apostle twisted his head and following up a curved smile towards left he glared at me in amusement. Perfect, perfect, perfect. That's what I really wanted to hear, but this willpower you say of will be the one which make will make it more the painful. Now come along. The apostle did not move from his place and so I too stayed still, awaiting orders. But then the vision around me distorted and in the next second I found myself at a new place. Most probably it was one of the highest grade space magic teleportation, so he is even stronger than what we imagined. To wield such powerful magic and aura, there's no way we could have escaped his reach. But if I be a good girl just like mother wanted then I am sure everything will be fine. Even if I have to live a life of a slave. If it's for the sake of my beloved family I will do it without a second thought. Looking around we were walking on a thin road and on both sides there was a deep chasm whose bottom I could not see. And in front of me was a hand-shaped rocky platform, towards which we were heading. The apostle remained quiet and I was unable to understand the purpose of our visit here. It didn't feel like anyone could live here. As I reached to the center of hand and was pushed to stand in between a huge circular diagram, Thick magical bars appeared in a circular pattern enclosing me inside like a trap rat. Why I'm trapped here, please let me out. I shouted in desperation and confusion. The apostle looked at me with a satisfactory expression on his face as if he was expecting a good show. But didn't you say you would sacrifice yourself, do anything, which means even putting your life on the line. So, we will begin the sacrificial ritual. Without further ado, I hope this will finally fill his stomach. The apostle flew high in front of me, as if escaping from something and started chanting some unfamiliar phrases I had never heard before. The platform below me started to shine with a bright red glow, as dust swept away a concentric and intricate magic circle formation appeared below me, with me at the exact center and entrapped. It felt all wrong. Was my life really being sacrificed? So am I going to die? Before I could proceed further or try to escape from the bars, the place started shaking heavily, but it did not felt like a natural earthquake otherwise I would have been able to predict it. But this shaking was caused by something from deep inside this chasm. I tried pushing and separating the bars, but just by touching them my hands got burned by the heat but I did not take them away. Blood and steam started flowing off, but I tried pushing even harder, trying hard are we, but it won't even budge, it's a magic that is beyond a mortal's reach, now do what I say and give your life to me for the greater good, for that my master can finally claim this world for his own, now you will feel the wrath and sorrow you mortals and gods have given to us. The crowhead then again flew away to the top of the roof. I did not understand what he was saying but I was going to die if I do not get out of it. I was certain of it. My hands were burning but now I could hear strange noises form the chasm of something flowing. 
My ears were picking some heavy movement of something rising from deep underground. Even though I felt like screaming with pain, I kept my head in shape to not lose focus if I wanted to escape somehow. I tried to take a peek by bringing my face close to the bars and making sure it did not touch whatever it was. It was glowing as light itself traveled from bottom to the top and a yellow and orange mixture of burning fluid started forming a pool all around me. The heat was already giving me a hard time breathing, probably the air was being used up by the lava coming from all the sides. I tried this time kicking the bars but to no avail. I kept on banging and again glanced at the lava, something peculiar about it struck me hard, the lava was not flowing as it should have been. It was slowly but surely traveling towards me. Somehow I was attracting it. Within few moments I was surrounded by the lava as it slowly started jumping along the bars making its way inside. My breathing was still growing intense as if each exhale also took away some life out of me. Finally the bars were about to melt and when the splash of the magma was about to hit and burn me alive. I wanted to be quiet in my last moments and die peacefully but something from deep within me let out a loud howling scream reaching the skies as if forcing every bit of my life out of it. The next second I knew everything turned black and everything was wiped out in front of my eyes as the world became oblivious to me. Is this what happens when people die? I tried to open my eyelids as hard as possible, but to no avail. My body was slowly but surely growing cold as my burnt legs and hands stopped responding to me. It was all over. I might be already dead. Will anyone feel sad for me if I disappeared? Obviously I won't be able to make any more medicine for the villagers nor serve the sweet dish grandpa liked. For the longest time everything seemed grey and endlessly stretching on forever into a dark cold sand desert. After losing my family and my birthplace, I escaped to a snowy mountain and then was caught in a violent snowstorm. Since then I think I have been stuck on that path and the same storm that swept away the happiness and peace from my life. But I had to live. Even when I had no hope, I had nothing of my own possession or my own power. But I wished to keep on breathing, to lie back on the ground for the first time and slowly fade away. But that everything changed when I met her and fake splashes of light started seeping in through bit by bit in that ice cold desert I walked alone. For the first time instead of a violent snowstorm, today it rained snow frost with a brilliant shine and a gentle touch. I was glad that I met her before dying, but now that I remember big sister Alicia properly, I never got to see her face. The mask she used to wear to hide her true identity. I wanted to at least know that before dying. I wonder how she looks under that mask, or maybe I just couldn't figure out that she may be hurt underneath because she never took it off. I might have even gotten the chance if I went with her. I might have lived a happy and fun life, being cared by someone else. But for my own happiness someone else might have been sacrificed. I just couldn't bring myself to stay like that and turn a blind eye to it. As long as I am alive I don't want others to suffer the same fate I had gone through. Everyone deserves to be happy and not to be dragged around by my own fate within which death dwells itself. So, it's better if someone like me disappears from the face of this world. Lou. Lou. I heard a loud scream in that stale piece of snow that was going to finally bury my face under it, but as if the sound shook it off, voices and images returned back to me. The fast blowing wind passing and hushing into my ears. My hands and legs spread out only to reach and touch thin air. I looked around and I was probably falling. The hand platform disappeared from my sight and the narrow path through which I came was already melted down, but directly above me, the view that stood in my front, the rooftop blown away, as myriad color of morning glory light illuminated the entire cave like holding. Even though I was now falling at a great speed, I was not afraid. I was not sad anymore, rather I was smiling and stunned. Still the white hair like freshly fallen snow, shining and beautiful, spread out like the pure wings of the bird I heard so much about just like the one on which Sophs traveled. The light illuminated on a face I might have always known my entire life. My big sister, the one who called out to me. Chapter 3 a seemingly bleak future. How someone just left the observation sphere I placed outside the village. Is everyone in the house alright? 
My eyes suddenly winked open when I sensed a breach in the outermost observation magic sheet barrier I laid outside the village. Mother always told me that being careful is the way to survive in this world. But I still don't get it. What's wrong with people leaving the village at night? Shouldn't they be free to do so if it is their home? Monster inhabits the surrounding area. Leaving the village at night especially attracts monsters if they go beyond the village's monster repellent barrier. I see that would explain things more properly. Q. Huh. I nodded in agreement with Al. Every time I seem to forget that this is neither the labyrinth nor my previous world. Danger looms everywhere and yet I find it strange from the very beginning. That people are happy and connected to each other. The more the danger is around, people tend to socialize the more, gaining trust and seeking the help of others. It's nice for no one to be left out alone. Not when people are falsely misunderstood or considered useless and non-responsive to the calling are neglected and despised, because not understanding someone attracts suspicion and bad eye are those around you. Lucia Presence unfound. What? Hearing that I almost jumped from the bed, I was not expecting Lucia to leave at night. Didn't she promise me that she would accompany me and I was also looking forward to it, but then seeing her smile. I knew something did not fit right and she was still conflicted with so many things going around. No one. No, not when this mask is on me. Even though mother told me that I should only show my face to people I trust. But I too know that before asking someone to trust me, I must trust them too. No matter how difficult it is to make someone trust me, it's many times harder to put my own trust in someone else. I was not affected by the behavior of my guardians in my previous life because I never placed my trust in them. From the get-go it was made clear to me that I had to look out for myself and that there was no place for me which I could call my own. But not when I think of Lucia, and I know that she is not the person who would take advantage of others, not when she has shown such kindness to me. I must lay all the truth to her and then I know we can reach a common conclusion. I'll confirm in which direction Lucia headed and I want to use evolution authority of my title. Please select target, Lucia. Hey, hey, are you sure of it? Didn't we decide to only evolve into other races to gain more skills and replicate the strength of the strongest member of that race? That's what I am doing. It might seem like a useless and not so worthy approach with an unjustifiable answer. But I will do it not because I have to but I want to. Lucia who too lost everything at her age, unlike me who shut herself down and lost all sight of things in front of her. She instead broke through the same walls I never thought to cross over. The kind of person I aspire to be and the strength I seek to overcome all sadness and that stagnated pain. But more importantly it is because I want to understand her better. Because she reminds me of someone, I might have. Forgotten. A feeling of guilt drenched heavily on my heart as I heard Al's voice and at the same time white webs swirling around my body spinning into somewhat like a tornado. Evolution stage, initializing. Beast. Lucia, soul core analysis complete. Species evolution. In process. Gress's system, code set up. Code. Legacy of Goddess Arachne, authority granted. Species evolution complete. Race, human beast. I was now flying towards the direction in which Al told me Lucia headed. I know she is quick on her feet, but what is bothering her to elope from the village without a word? I don't want to have a sad and waiting goodbye like this. As I was using my search field to look for Lucia, I heard a huge explosive sound coming from the range of flat mountains directly in front of me. A tremendous increase in the dark magic in the surrounding I had never felt such waves before. But the next moment before I could even process what happened light faded as the top layer of the mountain caved in. Turned out that the mountains had a huge cavity inside it. I headed in that direction at my maximum flying speed hoping that Lucia would too try to reach the same place on hearing that huge block rock displacement and also I wanted not to think of Lucia being caught up in that disaster. It was worse than I thought as I looked from above levitating at the topmost point of the open mountain. A huge hole presented itself freshly opened with hazy black fumes escaping from the top. The region above was a mesh, but the bottom was filled with erupting lava. Could it be that a dormant volcano suddenly became active? But it does not seem to be natural, as I could still feel dark magic surging in the area. I'll suddenly sent me a chill down my spine as I looked below. 
noticing a small figure with brown hairs and two sprouting ears freely falling unconsciously. Without wasting a moment in trying to recognize that person, I throttled myself downwards, ignoring all the falling debris, hot fumes and erupting lava. Lou. Wake up. My voice seems too thinned out by the past moving fast wind as I never tried to scream before, but this moment to save someone dear and important to me, I had to try to scream to let no others in myself what I really wanted. Lou. Wake up, and grab my hand. Closing my eyes I screamed once again, not knowing whether that voice would reach her or not. As my eyes opened again I saw Lou looking right at me with a depressed and surprised face. But even in that moment I could feel the happiness she emanated on seeing me which she expressed through the warmth of her hands with which she was firmly holding mine. Lucia, that voice, that silhouette, and that dress, why, why it is that everything matches her and yet I find her so close to my sister. Those white outspread shining white hairs, even the fox ears and tail is similar to mine. She appeared so beautiful and extraordinary without that mask. I wondered would my big sister look the same if she was alive right now, because the person who was trying to save me right now was not her, it was Alicia. My big sister, the one who promised me to be together even when I thought I was about to die. It doesn't matter how or when she came, but she did and all because of me. I don't know what happened that I am falling to my death but holding her hand gives me relief that everything is going to be alright. Her voice was so innocent as if it belonged to a baby. Her ears twitched with all the magic surging in the area and her tail swept over and over like a broom as if she was unable to control it. She reminds me every time of a newborn child who just now came out of their shell whenever I look at her. She suddenly pulled me towards her as I was now onto her shoulders from the front grabbing her slender waist. She tightened her grip over me shifting me towards her right. Lou, hold tight. I think we should leave. Ha dot leave dot but how? I couldn't understand how we could escape this fall. Within a few moments we were going to crash with the exceedingly hot erupting magma that even melted the rocks which was holding it as its vessel. Right about now, before big sister Alicia's words could reach my ears, our bodies blew in upwards direction at a terrific speed. And within a moment we were standing still midair above the mountains, with no land to speak off below our feet. I've always dreamed about flying before, but this feels even better. Somehow. I was not afraid of the heights this time. Otherwise I usually avoided going near to cliffs and high off places. Incredible this is amazing. That's what I really wanted to say out loud. But even amazing was the person holding me as bright colorful rays of the sun came crashing on the landscape as it gracefully dawned on my savior's face, while the lush green forest greeted it by drenching itself in its golden yellow color. I don't know whether she is really a beast human or a human now with her appearance, or is that just an illusion I have cast on myself, or how mysterious this all seems right now, but her eyes were so beautiful that it made me stop thinking about all the dreadful events I just passed through. Right now I thought I could get my all feelings out if she was with me. Every time I looked at her face the more attracted I felt towards her. I really can't stay in this form for much longer, with all that heat. This body really is very sensitive to surrounding changes. Alicia spoke in a distorted and uncomforted speech as she tried to curl up her body and stop it from shaking. She for the first time realized what it meant with beast humans having high sensitivity towards magic and all kinds of stimulus and she being not accustomed to it from birth. Her body was excessively heated up with the steam swirling around as her breaths got heavier. She still couldn't control the sweeping movements of her tail. She finally decided to return to her human form. I am sorry but can we talk about this later? Alicia said to Lou, who was now looking confused when the ears and tail of her turned into white thread-like structures and disappeared into nothing. But maybe I was too much soaked into the happiness again, when strong gust of winds flew in our opposite direction stinging us like invisible needles thrown at our faces. A black figure emerged in front of us maintaining a certain distance. Was it because of big sister Alicia? It had a frustrated look on his face and at the same time was puzzled to look at big sister. She on the other hand stood expressionless with her gazes set on that being as if seeing right past him. 
For a moment I thought she didn't even consider that being important to not even notice its presence and its glaring looks. Damn you beastlings. What did you do to the unsealing altar? Now this disaster. It's going to happen all because of you. What is he talking about? Didn't the place got blown up on its own? Even Big Sister came after the explosion so she didn't cause it or would know anything about it. So, why is he blaming me? It doesn't matter even if that mighty avatar goes berserk when he arises from his slumber the mortals shall face his wrath and you will burn with him, but it hasn't been a loss either, surely my master will be exhilarated to hear the good news, indeed you have proved to be the best of the best sacrifice and have served your role, we finally have traced it down and every key will soon be in our grasp, now I will watch as I see your demise and take the trophy for myself. Saying that the apostle left. But Big Sister wasn't looking or worried about the absurd things he said to us. But her focus was below at the mountains which were almost filled with lava to the brim and with a sudden explosion, lava bursted out as the earth shook fiercely. Even though in air I couldn't feel the tremors but the moving land was more than enough to strike fear in my heart. I was now tightly clinging to the arm on which I was resting then. I did not have the courage to look up and face her after what I had done. Maybe she removed her mask because she trusted me with her typical secret, but I failed her, my grip was loosening up as my own strength departed, I felt lifeless from the inside, something did not set right with my body and it felt so hollow and yet I felt restless at the same time. Then I realized what big sister Alicia was waiting for and what that apostle meant when he said we would have to suffer a gruesome death. The sight was just so impossible when the mountains suddenly appeared to rise up from the ground, the flow of lava opening several channels as black smoke radiated out from the towering giant, hands of black rocks mixed with red hot fluid and strong leg rocks emerged out of the ground as the mountain being pulled it out of the huge depression which was now left on the forest. The mountain was somehow alive as a huge roar from a mouth-shaped opening which appeared to be its head decimated the entire front forest area just with its breath. But somehow we were unaffected by the wind as a blue color thin light sheet levitated in front of us. I looked at Big Sister who just took a deep sigh as if unaffected by the overwhelming disastrous sight of uprooted giant trees which could easily withstand against a great windstorm and a mountain-sized monster that went beyond all imagination and logic. The only thing I could muster up to say was, we need to run please, take me away fr. I once again succumbed to my weakness could not speak anymore, was it me who was stopping myself from speaking any further? But if you just leave like that then that thing would surely destroy your home and your family. But, if we run away together with everyone's help. I tried to answer Big Sister's question in haste without thinking. The golden fiery dust was already messing up with my senses and making my nose and ears uneasy. I tried to close my ears frustrated with my own thinking and resolve to live happily with people for whom I care about. But their feelings were now betrayed by me. Don't think too hard, just tell me your wish and I will make it come true. Alicia called out to Lou who was not aware of her surrounding which had now changed to the ground location somewhere safe and far away from the catastrophe. The monster still hadn't resurrected properly as it was still taking shape with loud booms of volcanic eruption disturbing the ecosystem of the forest. The bellows of monsters and animals and their frightful runs as they chased themselves out of the village. I was scared as I realized people around me were always pushed to danger and yet someone was asking my wish. But at that moment when the question sprung up which I wanted to hear for a long time every noise and perception had faded away, the explosions, the cracking of the earth or the screams of animals from the ends of the forest nothing was clear to me, it was as if time had refused to move for me and it won't budge unless I stated what my heart desired, that I still wanted to live and stay happy and most important of all free from this curse. Then I want everyone around me to be safe and happy. That's what I would wish to come true. I slowly whispered hoping no one to hear. Clutching my teeth after the absurd situation I have pushed everyone in. Had I not been swayed by the false promises of someone. This would have never happened in the first place. I should have just done what everybody told me and then. And then. Then I will make your wish come true. 
As big sister Alicia was about to complete the sentence a huge boulder half melted in its own fire came crashing on us. For a second I thought we were done for but it blue shield again appeared out of nowhere and protected us. Its color was akin to the bright sky which was now drenched in the color of blood and fire. With several fire boulders raining from the sky it was evident to say that we had angered someone from among the gods themselves as the sun was itself outshadowed by the redness of the catastrophe. So how can big sister keep her promise? She must be saying that to keep me relieved after what I have gone through. But that's enough. She don't have to go to such lengths for someone like me who brings misfortune and calamity in others life. Lou, it's not safe here. I know you must be worried about the villagers so I am sending you back to Iron Village. Evacuate them and take them far away from here. She smiled at me as if everything was just going to be fine. But what about you big sister? Before I could perceive my own voice reaching to nothing, my view distorted and before I knew I was standing in front of the wooden gate of the Iron Village. Eighth Apostle, Corvus. Everything was finally going according to the plan. The last sacrifice accepted the end of the deal by promising to offer their life on their own accord. The sacrificial ritual required young maidens who would willingly present their mortal bodies to lift up the seal and be consumed by the eternal flames of the heaven that binds him. As per Master Zero orders, I was asked to uplift the seal over a demigod avatar sealed in this forest during the Great War. According to my calculation and the procedures of sacrificial rituals I needed exactly eight mortal young girls for my purpose. By serving as their guardian and at the same time threatening their existence by my tamed monsters, I was able to get through the seventh line, but this eighth sacrifice. It doesn't matter why, because I can't believe it, it's just too amusing. Who would have thought that I would finally find one of the living keys here? It's absolutely perfect. I am sure, that I saw it and it was no mere coincidence. That would also explain why she is still alive in the explosion. Just when that beastling was about to be consumed by the flames and being subjected inside the ritual field she had no way to escape. A black shadowy miasma emerged out of her heart and surrounded her in a protective black orb. The sky piercing light that concentrated and launched from it blew up the mountain's top, magma and the ritual altar. Fortunately I was able to escape otherwise I won't have survived the outburst either. But now that human with white hairs has appeared who was able to wield flight magic and took her away. No matter, she is not someone special as her level was too low with no skills to speak off and no special magic aura to be felt around her. They won't be able to go too far in such a dense magical area which would probably affect their magic spells. Even my own magic is being suppressed and being sucked to uplift the seal over the avatar. Even if the ritual is incomplete the black poisonous miasma was more than enough to alter the sealing spell and forcefully resurrect the demigod. All I need to now is collect my reward from the pile of corpses that would be laid waste by his anger. Even though I have failed to control him, he would be out of his mind and destroy everything in its sight. While I watch from far, nothing less would suffice. As for the beastling, I have felt that power before, from one of the keys that Master Zero hold dear. If I think what it is then, she surely must be the cursed child. I must present her to Master either alive or dead, Alicia Escalon Ashborn. Now then that Lucia is safe and so would be the villagers after they evacuate, I can freely take care of that thing now. A strong magical aura now surrounded me as I tried to negate the effect of the skill through which the mountain monster tried to absorb her magic reserves. Until then I had been avoiding it by suppressing my magical aura that everyone radiates. But now to deal with such a monster just the very next day after coming out of the labyrinth. This world is really not safe and has more to offer than I think. On using analysis it turns out to be a demigod and I am sure I have defeated some of them in the labyrinth. Surely this one won't pose a problem but some of its skills are really difficult to tend to. I was hoping for a nice Sunday morning walk with Lou, even though I don't know whether it's a weekend or not. I wanted to learn more about the ways of people living here from Lou. Not having school makes it feel like a Sunday every day either way. And what I get in return is a walking disaster and psychotic bird brain who wants to hurt Lou and dispose of all the villagers. But I am going to make them pay every minute of it with interest served. 
For starters the demigod needs to know that blacking out the sky and deforestation is not a good afterthought or a heroic sight to glance at as a measure of someone's power. I can blow the whole forest area too with a single wind spell of my own invention too, just so it knows. Activating flying magic I went above the surface of greenery formed by the top of the dense forest, and fixated my gaze at the demi-humans. The next moment something blinked in the sky and a trail of giant fire boulders haphazardly were heading towards the entire mountain region, to extend even further to the village's perimeter. That's not a good sign, now is it? This monster has no regard of its opponent. Nothing like the monsters of the labyrinth who would do anything to crush their opponent. This one was going on attacking things mindlessly. Wait, is it possible that he is not in control? Al is any form of communication possible with this being. Negative. The soul of the being is corrupted from absorbing too much dark miasma. After the seal forced upliftment, no sign of control has been inflicted. So it is doing all this purposefully. Well a monster is a monster. Saying that several of the meteors from the sky was about to hit the surface now. But suddenly in midair their trajectory was stopped as they blasted into fine pieces of finely chopped debris falling to the ground. In this meantime I took the trouble of placing my world, severing webs midair as I myself stood on it. It will probably help me to fight the monster at the same height and keep the place safe too. Even though my threads were thin to the point of not being visible, I exactly knew where they were as I started running in the direction of the monster which was not far away. It had still not spotted me and looked upset with the frustration and anger it displayed in its deep loud cries. It couldn't even speak to show its remorse. This world is not its place to begin with and even if it did die it would just return back to the place from where it came, the divine realm. Pretty easy for their life, but harming others likely for their own fulfillment is simply unacceptable. Not like I am interested in the affairs of a nefarious being sealed away with the banner of do not touch. Why can't people just seem to follow the guidelines and act responsibly? Just when I was near the foothill of the demigod mountain monster, it was probably trying to free its hands and legs from the chains attached to the ground. Was it simply restraining it and the seal which that bird brain was talking about was not broken properly? Then that would make it an easy target. Black Flare. I simply did not want it to waste any time and return back to Lou to see that she is really safe. A thin trail of black fire caught on my webs as it intensified further on the entire network laid around the monster forming a mesh and the next second I blew up the magic inside the webs to intensify the flames without burst of magic and act like a landmine of continuous strings. Boom, boom, boom. More than hundreds of explosions set off at the same time around the mountain monster, it was now burning over a black fire as for the giant dust smoke trail. Blurred out my vision. I properly made a landing on the ground merely summarizing the fact that everything is over and hoping for the red sky to clear. I just wanted to enjoy a fine summer morning, which I couldn't back home. As the smoke screen cleared out, there lay the rubble of demolished huge rocks and flowing magma which I thought was about to disappear any moment being engulfed by my usual gluttonous black webs. Phew! Why isn't anything happening? I said as I tilted my head to my right in confusion. Another shaking of the ground almost set me to fall, when a suddenly large cavity opened on the ground and everything fell inside it, forcing me to take shelter in the skies. From within a large drumming sound of clashing stones and the burp of a liquid continuously being pulled out made me anxious. A formation of red light blinked from the depths and out of it rose another giant made out of black rocks and overflowing in a red liquid like a grilled meat steak simmered in a special exotic sauce. Why am I thinking of food even in this situation? It doesn't make sense, unless I am going to miss my breakfast now. Looking at that sturdy built and the figures of monster I am used to, I was not surprised, but at the same time couldn't feel but correct my comparison that the steak would be probably burnt. So long, so long. This humble one being finally free from the seal a goddess of purity placed on me. A loud muffled voice erupted from a small opening in its lower head like a pouting mouth and every time it opened, some amount of lava flew out of it and fell to the ground almost melting it to several depths. So, it can speak now. 
I said in amusement as I took out my fan and with a single blow of it I twisted the wind direction and sent all the black smoke away, making a clear view between me and the hymn. Maybe, just maybe new doors have opened, but right about now, why it suddenly started speaking. I tried to compare the picture from before and after only to find that except for its larger size and dot and those metal chains everything turns out to be the same. Crap dot crap dot crap. Did my new magic attack just made it break free from its seal completely? I again looked up and the monster was trying to move freely as it was collecting magic power from the surrounding. There really were no chains. So it's really free now and the reason turns out to be no. 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 Did I really help a convict from breaking free from its chains? So am I a part of a scandalous escape event now myself? Shouldn't a sealed monster rampaging be criminal of some sorts? But why time to time I have to remind myself that there is no police in this world so everything is fine. I turned left, then right and again left. Probably there's no one watching. You are pretty good to break free on your own, huh? I said out loud with a straight face trying my best to fake whatever happened here and bury it from where it originated. The monster who was now drenched in the overwhelming magic by absorbing it from the trees and air turned to the voice, whose source was me. Probably I wasn't affected by its absorption power, because I was restraining my magic flowing in my body. Hugh dot so long. A human. A muffled voice akin to an old man was now aimed at me. The color in my eyes faded because in the next moment I succeeded to catch my target's attention, and here I thought that I could be sneaky in my strike. I tried to look here and there, avoiding direct contact with its eyes, to which I would most probably be appearing like an ant. Not that there was anything to look at in its hollow empty eyes from which tears of lava seems to flow continuously. Who? You amuse me human girl. To meet a beautiful maiden right after my resurrection is quite a sight, really. I was amazed to see a monster with a rational mind with enough intelligence to have taste and interest in things. If that's the case then we can surely talk and ask him to stop. I really don't want to fight if I can avoid it. For that I happily announce and bestow upon you a painless death. Before I could speak anything a heavy punch from one of its huge fist came flying striking with a direct hit sending me flying off from my trajectory as I crashed on the land dragged several hundreds of meter away. I was able to stop the impact by covering my body in the blue barrier, but the hit still hurts. I see so it was a usual fighting tactic, to set the course of conversation in another direction by complimenting someone and then make a surprise attack after someone's guard is down. I swear I will never fall for that trick again. This time maintaining my distance I came flying towards him. Impressive for a human to survive that. Why did you attack me? You are free now so stop harming the people who live around here. I shouted at him, to make sure my voice reached him. Surely, I would get rid of them too, after I see your mortal self dead. As he ended his words a storm of fire blew out of its mouth which tried to engulf me from every direction. But that kind of half-hearted attacks won't work on me anymore as I opened my fan and swinging it diagonally with adding wind attribute magic to strengthen the swing the flames were dissipated. Why are you doing this? Please stop. Otherwise someone might get hurt. I tried to make him stop again. I am not like a madman who was confined for getting angry on small things and goes on killing and damaging stuff. I probably won't unless I have to. You might not be an ordinary human to wield magic with such efficiency and delicacy. So this humble one will just tell you before you die, that I have to get this world rid of every mortal and bring this great war to its final end. But the great war has already ended. There is no need for you to continue fighting. I did not move a bit even though he just threatened to what I was asked to protect. If that's the case, then it just means that this humble one can slaughter anyone. Surely. Mortals disgust me with their low value and weakness but still dare to live on the lands where we gods were supposed to tread and made it impure with their savagery, greed and hatred. Detestable creatures needs to be wiped from the face of this world and I will be right at it after getting rid of you pesky human. The demigod without wasting another second launched another punch at me. But before it could even reach my proximity, his rocky arm suddenly cracked with hot steam, letting off from the crevices and with a blast turned into dusty smoke. 
Well, that would make it even more easier, if you have no reservations to change your mind, I will get rid of you first. I said to him holding my fan pointing its blade in his very direction, announcing my very own rebel against his ideals that sounded like an old man's final words who fancy for humanity to perish just because he couldn't land a fiancé in his entire life. You dare say that to a humble one like me. The demigod was totally offended by the open disclosure of Alicia's absolute defiance. He was unable to understand that how such a creature inferior to him smiled peerlessly at their own foreseen demise. The next moment Alicia launched several fusion balls at its body from all directions, while the demigod quickly went for defense blocking everyone one of them with his knuckles to the extent of using its own body as a shield. Whichever part was damaged it quickly healed and replenished his rocky hand from the stones on the ground. Earth was his turf. No matter in what way I saw it, I was at complete disadvantage. Black Flare had already failed because of its magic absorption skill. As for my freezing spells its area of effect is small. It could easily break free from my spell if it increases its heat or break off the body part affected by the magic. There were no chances of any more negotiation. I didn't want to waste my time complaining about not being good at that. The poisonous gases and its acidic fumes were only damaging the morning glory flowers and the crops grown by the villagers. If its siege went on for long and it went for another aerial attack I don't know whether this place could even remain habitable or not. This is supposed to be someone's home, and not because of my mistake I want for it to vanish. Because, it would be just too bad to let my chance pass to use my oral arts at full power which I was not allowed to do at my own home. To stop further damage I need to defeat the enemy at the same time maintaining the forest in its former condition. If I used to form a domain by using magic power along with my oral arts and not use my swords then the damage could be at minimum while at the same time maintaining the effects of the formed domain would persist and materialize in the real world too. Instead of vanishing, I flew a distance fair enough from the demigod to take a proper field view in my consideration. Condensing magic power with my oral arts would probably take much longer to activate so I need to avoid its attack for some time. Suits you human to run away from my supreme prowess. Rejoice for I am going to show you my ultimate fire that would one day burn this world along with all the mortals to be damned for eternity for their crime of sullying this holy land. The demigod suddenly started beating one of his hands at chest and the other at stomach. Honestly I did not find it a healthy habit for a being in flesh. Speaking of hard stones is an otherwise. Flames were erupting from every spore of its body as its belly started to grow in volume amassing gases and being drastically combusted. Surely the fine evolved and compressed form of that fire would be no joke. I had to avoid it at all cost but my preparations were done too. Suffer human. For the wrath of my flames melt your sullen hearts. Saying that the demigod forcefully opened its mouth wide and a jet of golden spectacular light seemed to blind everything from my vision. It's so sad that you never understood how difficult you are making this for everyone who cannot dry their clothes on a sunny day like this just because you cannot let go of your sad clouds. Erroneous technique, third form, ice calamity. As light was restored, a bright sun hanged in the sky while the cold wind of the heights seemed to shimmer with the white light being reflected from the ice land my magic technique had created. All and everything was covered with a shining thin sheet of ice. The forest and land, everything far and wide was encased in ice. But in front of me was a towering ice statue of a demigod covered in a special block of ice. Absolute zero. Its power being amplified by being activated in the entire domain at once. From being resurrected and reborn as an immaculate crystalline icicle. I wonder how it felt in the inside. Well that would be the thought line of a villain and masochist. So I would just drop the afterthought here. But I can't stop but feel pleased by my own new magic technique of combining. Absolute zero. Into an oral art and materialize the domain in the real world. Mother and further would be absolutely amazed and happy to hear about it, at least I hope so. On second thought for imposing restrictions on me, I should delay this fact for now. This time I was completely sure the battle has ended but I couldn't rub off this gaze on me even now. 
I had made sure that even the heat produced from its very core wouldn't have been enough to melt the ice on it and any movement was impossible, but before anyone spots all of this and the mess I have caused because of my one starting negligence I had to sweep everything under the rug, and that too fast, with the snapping of my fingers. The ice cracked with a thunderous clap from the center and dispersed into beautiful shards as they twinkled and scattered the sun's light, spread into the vast creation of my icy woodland. Monster Diary I faced to O. World Disaster Class Monster Name I faced to O. Age Race Demigod Progenitor Level 7000 HP MP 980,000 SP 700,000 Skills I face dear Genesis, Spirit Absorb, Spirit Disperse, Immunity, Fire Conduct, Love Meteor, Crossing Jab, Title, The Persistent One, Progenitor, Aper, Irignes, Chapter, 4, Converging, Paths, But Why, Why Did Big Sister Push Me Away, Is She Really Going To Be Alright, As Every Muscle Of My Body Felt Inadequate In Holding Up My Skeleton And Aching To Prevent Me From Thinking Straight, I Glanced At The Horrid Red Sky And The Blown Away Uprooted Trees Scattered All Around The Village, Even From The Inside I Could Hear A Loud Commotion And Screams Of Small Children Spurring Up Now And Then, The Earth Shook Again And With My Balance Displaced I Was About To Trip And Fall Hard, As A Small Black Cushion Supported My Descent. I looked back and found a small hazy black fluid that protected me from getting hurt as it dissolved in the air and disappeared from my sight. I had no space left in my brain to process what I had to do next on my own. Big Sister's last words were to get the villagers out of here. Surely she won't try to chase after that giant monster that was just revived. If she can use long-range teleportation magic just like she did then or fly, she could easily escape any dangerous situation. It's imperative that I inform the villagers and follow Big Sister's lead. This time I won't let anyone get hurt and I also need to act fast in case that Apostle Being makes a return for my life. I took a high jump and slipped from a small opening a bit above the gate and between the horizontally placed logs. My physical strength has always been better than anyone around in the village and these things were normal for me. Even grandfather said that I had a special talent for body augmentation magic and heightened sense. But he never told me a reason for that, though he always pointed out that my father was a strong beast human and probably I have inherited my strength from him. At the gate of my house grandfather and grandmother were already standing outside while some old folks, guards and Mr. Blin too were standing there probably discussing about the tremors and the loud explosion we can still hear from this far grandfather, grandmother. Feeling a bit exhausted I stopped to take a deep breath because I needed to be precise in explaining the situation so that we could act properly and quick. Lou where have you been and where is our guest? Grandfather threw a quick question at me. Dear don't worry us by suddenly vanishing. Grandmother quickly moved forward to get close to me and to look at some parts of my clothes which had been charred by the heat from the lava, even before Grandfather could complete his question. It's all right now. It seems that you have something to say, so take your time. Grandfather the mountains to the north have exploded and has been causing these earthquakes and I think it would continue to do so. We need to evacuate with everyone before the effect of it reaches far and wide. I see. Grandfather was deep in thought, he probably must have figured out that I was hiding something, but he also understood at the same time that prying further could probably cause hysteria and panic among the villagers, so he must have put further questions on my whereabouts and about Big Sister on hold and pretended to believe whatever I said. Thank you, Grandfather for understanding my predicament of not telling you and hiding things such as about the monster revived because of me that threaten our very lives now. But after we are safe from this disaster, I promise you that I will tell everything to you. I can already hear the animals running away from the central parts of the forest. It just might be true that our village is no longer safe, said one of the village elders. Probably his rabbit hearing aid works wonder in discovering about shocks from earth and monsters approaching before anyone from the village gets to know of it. But his shocking and shaking body tells me that he couldn't predict this because this was not caused by natural forces but set up by that person. Maybe this land has really forsaken us after all. First it was the humans who drove us this far and now even mother nature is against our survival. 
I wonder what lies further in our fates, added another villager who was also the part of village's administrative council. Is there any chance that we could still protect the village by staying here? Mr. Blen might be the only one who still doesn't want to give up on this place. His father had always protected this village and when he retired, he passed down his duty to his son, Mr. Blen who was born in the Iron Village, and grew here, no doubt did not wish to abandon his birthplace but protected even if it meant laying down his life and protecting its people. No Blen, it seems that this village is no longer safe, even the animals and the tremors which have left our lands and homes disarrayed speak the same. It is no longer coherent to stay or remain adamant and ignorant of our weakness and I as a village chief refuse to leave the lives of my dear villagers at the crippled hands of fate itself. This is no time to ponder when, why or how but we must keep everyone safe as our responsibility of being the elders and our calling to our people. While most of the villagers by now had gathered near our home awaiting grandfather's order in their eyes they reflected deep respect as he tried to stir their deep emotions and love for the harmony and peaceful lives they lived in this village with their dear ones whether alive or the departed. Samuel, you will be the in charge of leading the people and help them collect the necessary items for their survival. Varian you will make sure that the escape route is safe by sending your scouts while Varian will assist in localizing the poultry and carrying of heavy rations and daily commodities. Blen I want you and your men to make sure that no monster comes near us during this time and secure the escape route. The immediate silence of grandfather's orders and everyone's saddened face and depressed demeanor was soon broken by Mr. Blen. With his head held high and without a shred of fear showing on his face, he stood tall his hands clenched tight and his Pantherian clan's blood running high. He lifted his spear in a victory pose. I will defend the people of this village with every length and power remaining in my arms and legs. Shielding this village from any catastrophe is what I was meant to do and even if it means abandoning this land a new iron village will be awaiting for us somewhere else which will be built into a new wonderful and beautiful place where my children and family can live happily and safe. I could see Mr. Blunt suppressing his remorse by piercing his palm with his own sharp nails and resolved himself with a blood pact common to his clan's traditions, one whose resolve should be of the strongest nature to protect the place after his father passed away, knew his own limits and made the decision that was befit for his family and villagers' survival, and not biased on some personal historical pride that cannot withstand and crumble at the heels of a real disaster. All of us knew if anything it was the hardest for him to abandon this village and yet Uncle Blen reaffirmed his way of living to everyone and how proud he was of his birthplace. This village which I never once considered weak caught torn off from the far and wide world is because of people like him. Other people who seek refuge in isolated lands whether in search of peace, abandoned, banished or escaped from the hands of oppressors. It was a one big happy family and being forced to leave their cherished homes which they worked so hard to build would be something hated by all. Regardless, what Uncle Blen wanted for everyone to understand was that Iron Village is not tied to some land but lies in the bonds of the villagers to help each other in times of need and we can always return to or make a new place to call our home. Village Chief we will see that every preparation are made on time and Iron Village would once again blossom into a beautiful village, cried all the villagers in unison as they left to seek to their deeds to their final ends. I too entered the house to get all the important essentials and ration which grandmother and I put in our extra storage. Grandfather was overseeing and advising everyone's work and before we knew it all preparation were done at a splendid speed. Within minutes a trail of 200 village folk comprising of about 50 families left the village in a single line like a cavalry of nomads in a sunburnt desert and a fire hurling sky. Within the next moments the tremors grew in magnitude as all of the villagers could hear the earth cracking and most of the houses demolishing in our village. But villagers instead of trying to look back still had a glint of light to survive this disaster and hope to return to their peaceful lives. But this was just the start of trials we were about to face, when after a few moments from the sky we could see huge rocks on fire heading in our way. Most of the villagers took shelter under the trees and were being assisted by the guards, but there was no telling of how many of us could survive. As I looked up in the sky and saw the doom heading our way I once again made a wish to for everyone to live. 
and the next moment I knew all the rocks blasted midair and converted in defiant trail of dust and smoke gas particles. Was my wish really heard and the next moment I realized that all this time I never had an idea to whom I was offering my wishes, when suddenly the picture of big sister Alicia came to my mind her dazzling figure and unique appearance burned and imprinted by the rays of the bountiful sun into my memory. I wonder if I could again get a chance to tell what I think of her, but now I along with grandfather and grandmother with all other villagers continued to head to southwest. The tremors continued for a while but none of us had any afterthoughts or lingering feelings as our legs kept up with the pace and we had traveled far from where we once lived our normal lives. It was then when I felt that touch and it was not just me but all of us. At first it felt like a numbingly frigid chill at my fingers which continued from my foot to neck. Everyone's limbs started to shiver uncontrollably as a gust of wind carrying ice and snow flew past us. Clack, clack, clack. There was no reason for it to happen, no explanation, no forecast, nothing but it felt like Ice Age was upon us. As the green ground turned into solid ice, the trees, the leaves went ahead in time and then later jammed in that transparent clear frost. The air, the tree, the ground, everything that I had seen moments ago in an instant was encased in cold glittering ice. Everyone for a moment was worried. But maybe grandfather was already prepared for this because we didn't know for how long we had to travel and warm clothes were distributed shortly. Putting on a long thick coat I exhaled white vapors which seemed to redden my face even further. Most of us even with the cold raining on us we were glad that the tremors and the shakings had finally stopped. It was as if the wind itself was blowing in our favor carrying a wonderful heartfelt song along with its winds. But my thoughts were inclined and dictated further far away, beyond this icy forest as I hoped for her safety. But seeing a giant towering icicle from this distance and then a sparkle of twinkling light particles seemed to make my worries uncouth for. Somewhere in north, deep in the forest. How did this happen? I never meant it to go this way. Said the apostle in despair as he scratched his own head harshly to leave marks and pulled out some of his fine black feathers. How did the avatar of a demigod succumb to a state of a statue of ice and lost? Is it because of that girl? Could it be that she is hiding some secretive power? But I hadn't seen any special kind of abilities in her appraisal. She didn't even have any superb magic so to speak. It shouldn't have been possible. Could it be that she had a magical artifact? But then how could we never know of such a rare existence that could freeze an entire forest in a blink of an eye? Such a thing should never have existed there nor missed. I must inform the great master, surely he is the only one who can handle all of this. All I wanted was to capture the cursed child, and get rid of every witness including that human girl child. But now I must make a retreat. Even if I have to face the humiliation of failure. I would be forgiven by him if I bring useful information. I must escape and survive. Clack. Suddenly, a cranking noise on the hardened smooth ground caught the apostle's attention. As he sharpened his eyes, to search for any unaccounted observers. Even after taking such extreme precautions, he wondered how he could be found so easily. And just when he was planning a retreat, he heard the sound of unsteady footsteps echoing across the ice which for some reason were not in steps. Could it be that there are more than one pursuing him, thought the apostle. A girl in set of fine white clothes fit for the royalty of the most prosperous kingdoms came out from beside a bunch of tall wide bushes. Her beauty was meant to be behold and held at high esteem by any bystander or so he thought and these were some of the details he missed or seemed to have overlooked before. Alicia on the other hand who had located the person behind all these crimes, started approaching him. But due to her first experience of walking on ice she couldn't maintain her balance. Switching off the magic flow between her and the ice sheet while also avoiding flying magic just for the one in an experience to skate or walk on ice. She regarded it as a bad idea and tried to overthink it. Frantically pacing herself and to avoid the embarrassment to sully her first impression she tried and regained her flawless ready posture. So, are you the one who was behind all of this? Surprisingly the apostle found her voice young that did not match her height or looks of a human who should be around 15 or 16 years age. What are you hoping to do, even if you knew an answer? Tell me who are you? The apostle said without thinking as a result of his frustrated mindset, 
As for my introductions my name is Alicia. What would be your name? Should I call you Mr. Crowbird? Alicia said putting her finger on her lips, hoping that she did her introduction right and to get a fervent good response. That's not my name. State your true purpose as I asked you to. The apostle still tried to use a harsh tone engaging himself in a conversation and hoping to find some clues of the girl's origin. Then should I call you Mr. Birdbrain or Chirply? Or how about Crown Crow? Mr. Crowsley sounds better to me too. HMPH, HMPHHH. She nodded after feeling content over giving someone a name of her own choice. Alicia disregarding others' thoughts on the matter ventured into her own fantasy world of naming and classifying things. You have a very bad naming sense. The apostle responded, but these are the names I would like to use for having a crow pets I found recently. Alicia seems to have responded truthfully and yet the apostle failed to see her innocent speech and even made her feel depressed over her naming sensibility, or so she thought. What are you talking about? Don't try to fool me and stray from the topic. Answer me what are your goals? Who sent you? Are you alone or is anyone else behind you? At every step he took the apostle seemed to get angrier as the loudness of his tone increased after every word he pronounced in his eccentric tone. A curved sharp smile appeared on Alicia's face as she tilted her head downwards as if hiding something. Straying from the topic. It would do you no good if you are pretending yourself, so stop wasting my time, and if you would come clean with what you have tried to do with Lou.shh. Who is that person you speak of? The apostle voice seemed to have calmed down as he tried to suppress his worries but the anxious look on his face kept deepening further and further as he couldn't meet eye to eye with her, as her head was facing downwards. He was unable to access the thoughts of such a human who could still keep calm even in front of his raging magical aura. Still playing the fool I guess. So let me tell you something if you are waiting for this. Alicia struck out her hand and from a small black distortion she pulled out a black curved streamlined body which easily fitted in between her hands, while having some playing around with that monster back there. I came across these birds which I first felt so sorry for to be caught between my webs, so I transferred them to a safe place, but later when I found out that these were just some magic made familiars, I traced back their magic back to its creator. Alicia made some stroking gestures on the bird's back but no one could feel its warmth reaching to anyone. The color at the apostle's face seems to have whitened out as he saw two small birds in Alicia's hands. To think that someone else might be behind all this mess. Alicia's voice deepened as she lightly pressed the small neck of the bird of magical constitution with her icy cold fingers and saw them as they dispersed into a black mist dissolving in the air. I will kill you inferior creature for what you just did. He shouted gritting his teeth. The apostle was about to leap forward with his magical output set at maximum and his claws overgrown from his hands, fully transformed and to gouge out the flesh of whatever it touched. He thought if he could reach her before she could activate her magical artifact, she would be totally defenseless. According to the apostle for activating such a strong magical artifact surely required huge activation time. That's why she couldn't use it before from the start. But he stopped and he couldn't move either, even if he tried to do so. His face was as expressionless as ever as if he could neither think nor speak for a second and all life had been flushed out of him. The frozen atmosphere between the two of them was blown away by the falling of some of his feathers on the ground and seeing them merely covered in ice and frozen like a showcase, the tension in him exploded as he tried to look front. Alicia lifted her head and seeing her glowing red eyes. The blood in his brain froze as he was overwhelmed by an extraordinary aura he never felt like before. Too strong even to look at the flow of magic his eyes strained and the only thing he could extrapolate was that its nuclear source was a little human girl. Who are you or what in the world are you? These were the only words the apostle could express in his feeble state. I have no reason to further answer your questions to a person who tried to harm Lou and a stranger at that. But how about you answer one of mine and I answer one of yours? That seems to be a fair trade to me. Alicia was back in her joyous mood after expressing her hostility if the apostle again tried to attack her and his faith tied to that action. She wanted to finish it all fast, 
wrap it up and return back to the side of Lute to ensure her welfare, with his senses returning to him and trying to stabilize his own condition with his own magic, he somehow realized what a big mistake he made in assessing the situation. The thought of her possessing a magical artifact was not well thought of, since it was made after making various adulterated assumptions based on his very own supremacy. The messenger birds he sent to his master about discovering the location of the cursed child had now but miserably failed. Instead they were used to trace down his very own location. He had no options further left, than to follow her lead now. If only somehow he could survive he thought he could still make a difference. If he lives he would get to take back revenge on her with what she did to him. Then answer me this. What do you hope to achieve and what are you going to do to me? The best way the apostle thought to counter her now was to know what she really wanted out of all of this. Corvus, since he knew he existed as an entity, always stayed among powerful people trying his best to make his own place and gain recognition. He knew for those who are powerful always are in want of something and willing to go to any length to get it. Their actions are always self-motivated and have hidden meaning. If only he could decipher that then he will figure out her weakness and then use that opening to corner her. Now, now don't be so impatient Mr. Crow. For starters why don't you tell me who is behind all this? Alicia smilingly asked the apostle which agitated him even further but he did not let it slide on his face. He needed to be cool and in possession of a calm mind, even if he had to act to try to throw her off her own game. My name is not Crow, but I do have a proposal to make. If you make me your accomplice then I would provide anything you want and I would even ask for your forgiveness. The apostle wanted for his enemy to be indulged into thinking that he really has no extra card left to play at his own advantage but to surrender to the victor's will. So you want me take you as a hostage but also a two-sided informant? Is my assessment correct? You truly are cunning to reach that conclusion yourself. So what do you think of it? The apostle was now laughing in his mind while holding a poker face up front. Yes, take me as your hostage. Don't think more. Perfect. Accept my proposal and I will give you everything you would want to know. Perfect. And then when the right time comes I would backstab you and make you suffer in my rage and see you die. Perfect. Perfect. This is what truly gives me pleasure to outwit my enemy and rise to the top. Nothing suits me better. A human girl can't even come close to my genius, not to mention a child. This is so hilarious and exciting, makes my day even better. Or so the apostle thought to himself. Alicia after a second or two came up with a quick response. Oh, if you don't want to tell me and you won't change your ways then I simply have no use for you and I find you to be more of a threat for me and those around me. Since I cannot forget the fact of you trying to hurt Lucia and I might not be as forgiving as you. Alicia said what she actually felt, since she didn't know any better, than to do this. What? The apostle realized that he couldn't ascertain her nature, or he rather doubted her recklessness or it was entirely something else. Surely there must be something else that I could be useful and in doing so try to find your kindness. The apostle made a final attempt to find her true purpose. I see. Then how about you tell me the direction of the human continent? Alicia waited for a response, but the apostle stood there silently as if in his deep thoughts he had realized something important, something which was amiss till now, a missing piece that would sit right between all the questions and the only answer to these. Gaining confidence he straightened his face, stiffening his thick neck, he said in a slanted tone, You speak as if you actually don't belong to this world, Hugh. Wait, how did you? Alicia stuttered at the sudden question, which was sprung on her after so many years. So. Could it really be? The apostle was literally jumping out of joy to be accurate with his assessment. He couldn't realize that there really out there was someone from another world unless they are a reincarnate. How could it really be? By far in my knowledge all the reincarnates were taken care of or had been handled by master. They had been from starting in our grasp. So how could it be that one was left out unless they have never been accounted for? The one who was thought to be dead for that useless weak goddess to show up finally here, right in front of me. I have finally cornered her and if only I could add her in Master's collection as one of his pawns to do his bidding, he would surely be happy by my performance. 
thought the apostle to himself, where hadn't it struck him before, her way of thinking, her speaking habits akin to those reincarnates and then her unfamiliarity with this world. Everyone alive here, knows, what's the difference between the demon continent and the human continent unless they have been either living under a rock or did not belong to this world. I have finally cornered her. She is now within my grasp because I know of her weakness. A chance smile littered on his face as his thoughts leaked all over. Well, I cannot seem to contain my rage anymore, so I won't kill you at once. To think I was afraid of you until now. You all reincarnates are nothing without the power of your gods and once you use their blessings you cannot immediately reuse it again. So that why you are avoiding a direct fight with me. Wait dot wait. Alicia on the other hand who just wanted to talk and settle things peacefully, while also finding clues was dumbfounded with her secret found out. She still did not understood that the fact which was kept to be closed about, reincarnates and gods being sent to this world would be known by a bird brain like him. For a moment there her eyes lit up thinking that he just might be able to help her find Athena quickly instead of just squandering her way around the world. But then her hopes shattered when the apostle dictated another of his plans. You must be the one contracted to that weak goddess to think I was keeping my guard against you. But who knew that she was hiding someone like you this entire time? But there is no need to worry for me anymore. I shall repay you in full when my master brilliantly takes away that life of that goddess and I would just torture her in front of you until I am satisfied by the look on your face. The apostle passed a good laugh thinking that he was finally able to get a hold on the strings that would tie his enemy. However Alicia in response shook her head. What did you say? And a very rare expression appeared on her face, one which twisted her features with displeasure, revealing her anger. You shall die here and now you little brat. You have finally seen what I can do to you if you go against me. Spectre Expansion Paraskina Alice the apostle activated his special skill and mastery over an art which among all the twelve apostles he specialized in. Alicia on the other hand found herself in a dark space, which appeared to be unresponsive to her presence. Under a dark sky she was still able to see a small group of trees withered and rid of all leaves up to its last branch as if every apple that would ever grow on it would be poisonous to its last bite. Suki, Suki. In among those woods she heard someone calling out her name as she tried to run in her direction. Her eyes for a second there felt a heartbeat of there as she longed to see that appearance for a very long time with her very own eyes, but at the same time she witnessed two dark bloodthirsty eyes tall above the ground gazing at that person, a thin fog diluting her view. Those were not the eyes she was unfamiliar to, but had experienced those a very long time before maybe closer to her than anyone else. As she saw her only first friend Athena running in her direction, calling out the name she was associated to before her reincarnation. Suddenly the woods caught on fire of which flames surged high to reach the impenetrable night sky, while those bloodthirsty eyes kept on chasing after her. But all she could do was keep running too, trying to catch up with her, but her hands would never reach the person she cared for. Or so did the apostle thought, but Alicia silently stood there with her head calm as she saw the whole thing unfold in front of her, and the next second he knew he was pulled down by a superficial force towards the ground as he landed a head fall, which disturbed his concentration and the illusion vanished. The veil of feint and trickery was finally pulled up from the show, as the apostle shuddered in fear for the first time his illusionary arts failed him. But most important of all he was confused and unable to understand of how his illusions failed to charm his opponent who should have been mystified and eternally caught in its temptation for the thing they longed for the most. While his body was still being crushed to the ground by an indomitable force, apprehending his action, but as the illusion disappeared, the force weakened and he was able to set himself free. This does not end here. Shouting that he launched a trail of hundreds of his magically enforced sharp black feathers he prepared beforehand strong enough to even break a huge boulder into rubble. Dodging all of them coming from every direction would be near to impossible, but even before they were able to reach her close proximity they all turned into nothing by some kind of inconceivable black flames whose nature the apostle yet again failed to fathom. You just did the last thing one could ever dare to do to me, trying to hurt the people I care about by falsifying and manipulating my own memories. 
but just so you know whatever strategy or tactic you deploy and have all the luck and miracle in this world on your side, you will never escape from me, because I can see everything. Seeming very pleased with herself, Alicia smirked at her own achievement of coming up with such a creative threat that she always read or thought of but could never find a use in her previous life. But still she was hurt and feeling the pain. The only thing she could think of was hide her emotions as she pulled out her white mask and put it on her face. She was unable to understand why she did it and from whom she was hiding things but she just felt like doing it. While the apostle prepared to take her down anyhow by engaging in a close combat hoping that by now his opponent would have tired out after expending high reserves of their magic in pushing out of the illusion. Even though it would have been an impossible amount to be possessed alone by a mere human body. White room. Alicia uttered, and the illusionary domain contorted as though some entity was crushing it underfoot. It warped and broke into some huge pieces of black glass as it made a thunderous cacophony, screeching under the magical pressure of an absolute power. The next moment Corvus knew for what waited for himself, he was immobile. He tried to move his head to look but all he saw was white, his head facing down as he was half knelt on his knees, no matter how much he tried. He failed to lift up his body. He wanted to cry for help from his master or call for his companions, but every time he opened his mouth his breath turned into shimmering white ice. How could an apostle fall to such powerlessness? I refuse to succumb to such weaknesses to which my master made me immune to, Corvus thought to himself. But even after such strong determination and trying his best to break out by exuding his magic allure at full force to the extent of exhausting his life force, every attempt failed when he felt a sharp grasp on his throat which paralyzed him. He was instead of being more than frustrated after his movements being restricted he was nonplussed and astounded by the fact that his domain was overwritten and a new one materialized by a human. Just forming one takes a lot of practice experience and high level of magic control, it felt for him like all that awaited him was death, there was no reason, no answer, he couldn't find or wish for one at this point as all sense of reason had been turned into topsy-turvy after this encounter, thinking that there was not any left purpose he could serve his master a realization dawned on him, he heard some footsteps approaching him from high above as he could still perceive a long range of stairs going high up where even his gazes couldn't reach. The only thing he was able to saw were the short legs of a human approaching him, but could not see her face. As it drew closer time stretched out like a melted toffee, finding a blue scabbard so beautiful form out from the accumulation of a blue cumulonimbus of light particles and the most majestic of swords he saw in his life being pulled out in a twilight. And the final realization that struck Corvus was that this was never a fight with a mere human of the mortal realm. Because, that isn't a way of a human to cower in fear of the strongest or run away in the face of danger but this was the way of a monster to sentence their enemies to eternal death. Wah, damn you human. Even though he wanted to say that the silence of the room was never disturbed by his voice. The next second a much sharper and vibrant white light raced through him as it cleanly wiped off his head, as for his final moments he was able to see a red glare, a pleasant smile under a mask and a trail of long stairs with a throne at the top that might have led him to the higher realm he was once promised to ascend by his master as everything slowly melted into the whiteness of his eyes. You have leveled up. You have reached level 31. Status window. Name. Corvus. Age. 300 years, race, devil, level, 7800, HP, 75000, MP, 68000, SP, 60000, skills, dark matter magic LV6, fire magic LV6, self regeneration, shadow movement, curse magic, advanced illusionary magic, umbrakinesis temper feather, titles, dark blake, 8th apostle, bottom of the dark realm, a figure in black cloak stood smiling in front of a wall with a shining pattern, akin to a triangulated huge key, radiating a silver light and as it reached under the long hooded cape which hid his face, only revealing the smile that would one give when possessed by the devil himself, but the surrounding and the element of the space only spoke of it being the devil's home itself. Finally, the cursed child has been born in this world, and after getting hold of all the remaining two septing keys, 
the laws of this world will twist to my own desires, the curse of misfortunes that the cursed child bears will surely bring him to my side. Outskirts of Aran village, I tried to touch and slid my fingers on my mask wondering why I put it again as I teleported myself near the Iron village. Now I understand what mother really meant by keeping my identity a secret, and how this world is not a utopia but a foreign land where I have to travel alone and also where Athena is waiting for me or at least I want to meet her. He was able to figure my secret out and also might know about other reincarnates, just what is happening in the outside world and how many years has it been since everyone reincarnated exactly. For me it has only been about three years and half but I have no answer of how time stretched in the outside world. Or could it be, just because I am bad at finding directions, my secret was exposed. Maybe from now on I need to hide that fact, to keep my secret safe. I wonder why Lou and the others never pointed this fact out for me, or they were just being considerate and concerned about my welfare. I am glad I met such kind people as my first encounter. Since this was a chance for me to realize more about myself, well then, that's enough of thinking, besides, there's nothing I can do even if I keep looking back at the past after all, but still, I was thunderstruck at seeing what ended of Iron Village as I saw its remains. Almost most of the houses crushed and the land's topography distorted, the crop fields crippled, I couldn't do anything to stop the earthquakes and at the end I ended up freezing the entire forest and the village making it inhabitable. I don't know how many months it would take to melt all this ice and if I use my flames, I might make the land infertile by taking all its magical characteristics. If only I had someone by my side who could fix all of this or clean up my mesh then that would really help. But is there really someone out there who could help me with all of this? I need to ask for their forgiveness because it all happened under my watch and I am responsible. I asked Tal for Lou's current location and headed in that direction. Maybe, it was finally time I reinforce my search after hearing that Athena is alive but also about the forlooming danger. It would also mean that again my existence would bring her harm, so I still needed to keep my identity a secret. Lucia. I sat on an almost round-shaped small rock to take rest while most of us were exhausted since the road ahead was long, my mind still not able to figure out what to do next or how should I act when I meet with her again. Or will she really come to meet me? Or should I go back to find her? But what if we miss each other, and on realizing that we again cross paths and then again miss each other? Then the cycle would never end. I covered my ears to stop thinking any further but try to finally make up my mind. It was then, Grandfather approached me and taking his seat next to me and putting his hand on the back of my head, he spoke, Lucia if you are conflicted about anything then you can probably talk to me, I am sure even if I am old, I can give you ample of advice after all I did not turn my hair silver under the moon's light, but Grandfather, your hair has always been silver, and not because you gained excessive knowledge and experience, is that so? then my old age may not be keeping up with my memory. <laughs> Grandfather laughed for a moment while a small smile curled on my face too. Grandfather, how would you associate with a person who is willing to go as far as to risk their life to save you and yet you can't find to do anything to repay them? If anything it could be only Grandfather who can help me in this situation. Is that person you are talking about our guest? HMMPHH I revolved my hands haphazardly but Grandfather only laughed, so I continued, it's just that I don't know what to say to Big Sister Alicia if I meet her again. I have caused her so much trouble and she even saved my life, I just can't decide what I have to do. I see, you two have gotten pretty close in a short time, then you should be honest with what you have decided and I am sure she would understand if she feels the same way. Probably if anyone is willing to go as far as risking their life for me then I am sure it is what makes them the happiest, and if you end up doubting their intentions then you are only hurting them even further. To make them happy, you think so? Would that really happen? I stared at my grandfather's face, making sure that he isn't just making fun of me. Lucia if you remain too focused on the future you will miss with what's happening in front of you. As your grandfather who wouldn't be able to see you grow into a fine young woman, I would be glad to know that you would have someone in the outside world you can trust. 
I want you to find happiness even if the day comes when we depart and you would never have to see a day of sadness in your life. I want to treat Miss Alicia well and keep her promise but I don't want to leave you both so everything's a total mess and I don't know anymore. I again went into a trance on realizing what I wanted to it was impossible. Then why don't you not just tell her all of that? You both find each other inseparable then you can surely work out a solution. I don't want you having a regret of a painful goodbye, with whatever you choose. You will always be our child. I glanced at Grandfather for a moment realizing how old he really is. As I watched him scratch the bare skin under his overgrown beard and how he had always cared and loved me like his very own child. No maybe I am his child. Suddenly I heard a voice rang in my ears, which Grandfather did not seem to notice. So was I only able to hear it. Lou can you come here? It's just that I wanted to talk about something to you. I easily recognized it as Big Sister Alicia's voice. Without wasting a single second I glanced at Grandpa and affirmed my willingness to go. While he nodded his head as I saw him bask under the scant light of the sun. Maybe seeing him like this I finally realized what I really needed to say and what I wanted in the end or rather how I want it for all to start again. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne. I called out to Lou a little far away from where I spotted the villagers evacuating the city. I did not want to face anyone after having the guilt of what I have done to them. But if Lucia could forgive me then I can somehow lend them my hand and make up for my mistakes and troubles I have caused. As I heard clean fast footsteps and in an instant I knew who was approaching. But then suddenly my eyes could not follow with the figure in a red cape as she rushed in. Tightly hugging me. I shivered not because of the cold but because of the chills I received after she grappled me. Or rather it is a real hug. As I brought my hands close to her shoulders, or maybe that's how it goes. I looked at Lou who was crying and smiling at the same time. I had never seen a tearful smile before. I thought crying was always meant to be sad but maybe it's not all about that after all. Lou it's really alright. Everything is fine except for. Before I could finish Lou suddenly wiped her tears off and tried to look directly in my eyes as if asking me to do something first. Taking her gesture I again removed my mask in front of her as my hair color returned back to normal but with my depressed demeanor, she must have noticed it after all. Big sister Alicia from all the people in Irene's village and me I want to say thank you for saving us from that monster and prevent any sort of tragedy with our village, but the village. It's in shambles. And it's because I couldn't. Lou suddenly held my hands, which refused to accept her appreciation for me being involved in any kind of positive act. No. The Iron Village is still one big happy family, and it's all because of you that no one got hurt. It won't be long before we find a new place to relocate ourselves. But you have to go through such inconvenience because of me in this harsh environment. I objected. Even if you say that. Grandfather had already prepared for every kind of situation in case for a permanent evacuation. See we all have been wearing winter's clothes, since, winter will be on us soon. Lucia raised her red cape close to her shoulders which reminded me of our first meeting. But I still had no way to know of how it would end. After a steady silence, finally broken by Lou herself, she folded her arms and circulating her hind right leg in circles, as if forcing herself to say something. Lou if you don't want to, then you don't have to say anything to me, big sister Alicia. I am sorry, you went through the trouble of risking your life and saving me and yet there isn't really anything I could repay you with. I am so sorry. Tears again sprouted in front of Lucia's eyeballs and I was speechless, but they did not harbor sadness, which I was sure of. You don't have to, because those were the things I wanted to do on my own, because I wanted to see you happy. I said to her. Not knowing what to do next, I was in a dilemma whether to pass on to her a handkerchief or wipe her tears on her own. What if she didn't like the way I do it? So I just made a white muffler out of my web magic and put it around her neck. This way you won't feel cold. I said to her, and started looking in other direction. I did not know how she would react to the gift which I gave her as a sign of her hospitality and maybe the little bond we shared now after coming to know each other. Big sister Alicia for a long time I wanted to tell you this that for you I have always found you to be the person I idolize the most, Sophs. Who is Sophs? I have never heard of him. 
He is a person from the legends my mom used to tell of how he granted people's wishes and made everyone happy. When you asked for my wish and it came true I couldn't help but find you so similar to him. But you are still my big sister. Lucia looked so determined with those final words. Yes, I sure am. I said smiling at her, but Soph's only sounded like a supernatural scammer to me. It's best to stay away from people like them. But then again if Lou wants then, I will be her Soph's big sister Alicia do you have a destination in mind? Lou asked with their face depressed again a bit and I could still understand someone's attachment to their family. So I too tried to be honest, with my own terms. Yes, just as I told there is still not a specific place, but I have to find someone. A friend who is very dear to me. I don't know where she is or how she is, but I will do everything in my power to make it happen. I said to Lou as I tried to decide in which direction I had to head to. I must really be a bad person, to break my promise to you after what you have done for me. But for now I still want to stay with my family. And so I cannot go with you, not at least now. Lucia's head was down, unsure, as she lost her composure and waiting for my reply. You really don't have to force yourself to do it. I won't feel lonely I promise. And I want you to make as many good memories with your family as you can. But promise me that you will meet me again. Lou tightly clenched the white scarf I gave to her as finely smiled, which seemed to reflect in every refined and polished surface of the ice forest. And if someday when we meet again I would like to know more about you and travel the world along with you as your companion just as you are doing now. And that's how our first encounter came to an end but at the end it did not take me much to realize that I had added a third friend with whom I would plan to journey the whole world. Status window. Name. Lucia. Age. 12 years. Race. Fox to me human. Level. 800. HP. 9000. MP. 8000. SP. 12000. Skills. Wind magic LV3. Fire magic LV3. Body reinforcement. Space Magic LV2 Water Magic LV2 Status Window Village Chief Name Arkle Age 85 Years Race Fox to me Human Level 500 HP 7000 MP 8000 SP 5000 Skills Wind Magic LV2 Body Reinforcement Water Magic LV2 Sound Magic LV5 Title Sounds of the Mystic Interlude The Fate of The Cursed Child I am really fine I will keep on waiting for her and one day we might just I said feeling a bit let down by the cool fresh breeze which seemed to have almost stopped blowing She ear up dot she e a soft purr like voice responded diligently to my swaying mood That's a funny way to say it but you are really saying that to cheer me up aren't you I responded to the weird clatter of the oblique lips she era lee the quirky voice kept on making the same set of abstract sounds, when suddenly a large group of giant eagles, five times larger than the ones on earth, took a jump on us. Don't scare us during our conversation like that. I simply controlled the wind flow and sent them straight up in a heavy wind vortex. I looked beside me and took a deep sigh. That really gave you a scare, huh? Nibira, chi e e chi e e crying that the being with the dark head, wearing a warm orange wide underprint and a brown skin, soon disappeared from my sight. Wait, I am sorry I gave you a name without consulting you. How about Robin? Then, but that's too common a name, don't you think? So I just tried to add a special twist. Please come back. It's no use. Maybe it can't hear me anymore and in fact left. I have been for an hour flying at a normal speed matching that of the bird, who has been enjoying my good company, at least that's what it seemed to me. As I dictated to him the things that recently happened to me, in the start it seemed that he was quite interested as it kept on increasing its cheering tone and started flying faster as I followed it round and round. It was just too excited and influenced by my oratory prowess that it couldn't stand down any longer. All right, according to Lou if I went straight in this direction which is supposedly southeast of the Iron Village then after crossing the ocean I would reach the human continent. While on the other hand, her destination lied at a perfect right angle to the southwest. We couldn't even travel for a bit together. It's not like I believe I will again lose all sense of my direction. 
This time I made a brilliant move, and marked the tree from which I had to just keep on moving straight forward. It's just at the back of me. Looking back, as I turned my head dot dot it's right there. Phew, I am sure, it's just there. At least a moment ago dot dot maybe when the sky gets clear a bit I might be able to see it again. Honestly speaking, I think it's all Mr. Nibiru's fault, if only he hadn't been so enthusiastic about my story and distracted me. So I just need to increase my speed to catch up soon. After what that bird brain had to say I need to meet up with Athena soon. I don't have any information regarding my other classmates and what have they been doing up till now. But more importantly I also need to find out how that creature got hold of our secret. He did never tell me his real name though. Well I'm not the type to force out an answer from someone, better to wait, than to keep on pondering or worrying myself. At least that's what mother would say, but I just can't stop tormenting myself with the question. It's just that it is such a mystery to me. And that's why I need to be extra careful. The mask which I am wearing right now. Even though Lou wouldn't like seeing me wearing it again, but I have to be pretty strict about it myself. I can't let myself be discovered unless I know whether I can trust that person truly or not. At least that's how it is meant to be. But I really don't know how to do or find people like that. Meeting Lou was a fortunate encounter, but what if I had met that talkative and nosy crow first? Well at least for now I would find nothing less suspicious than a flying person with no origin or identity to speak of. So I need to create myself one on my own. And I just happen to know what it should be. And I would just have to count on more fortunate happenstance and encounters. But then again, that just might be me raising flags for myself and later complaining about it. And then this feeling of drowsiness in my body, sinking in. I can't hold myself steady any longer. I need to find a place quick. After a minute or two I chanced upon a waterfall and a small dry bank surrounded by tall trees. If not for my protective field which acts serves as a preservation and observatory sphere over my adjoining surroundings, then I highly doubt I would have been able to spot it even from this height. In the middle of the clear compound, I created a small tree house with a single room and a bed using earth and wood magic. I have trained as far as making a castle, but then again I probably won't be needing one, not at least right now. I still fall asleep for a minimum of 5 days after I level up, while according to further my body keeps on accumulating magical energy and condensing it even further. So. I need to be careful that I don't absorb too much magic from this beautiful landscape and render this fertile and scenic beauty to a miserable state of a dried gouged desert. If only I could instead visit here for a picnic with Athena but taking a nap in nature doesn't seem to be a bad idea either. I really wanted Falu to come with me, but more important than me for her should be her family. Right now, I just don't want to be myself anymore. If only I can have someone by my side to look after me even when I am asleep. I would rather rely on a person to take care of me now rather than an ultra protective barrier which will cut me off from this place for the next five days. The Black Vathy's throne room. So, this is where you have locked yourself. And what this is about one of your servant apostle getting killed. Akihiko took an offensive tone in his outburst as he walked on the sapphire rug laid down from the huge mantle gate of gigantic doors up to the very last inch of the front legs of the throne. The throne's huge size and uncommon structure was not the only thing about that room, but also the walls and the run-down pillars did not have anything new to offer to Hakon an onlooker's eye. That said, only an expert in the field of magic would be able to decipher at how amazing the built of the throne was. A researcher in the field of magic engineering would claim it as the breakthrough in discovering the most efficient way of channeling the surrounding magic and transferring it directly to the living systems of the people that inhabited it. That again said, such a technology was still far from the grasps of the humans, rather all of the mortals because this place was submerged in the deepest parts of the underworld. The runes and magic circles inscribed on the walls and the pillars were not only a medium for channeling the dark miasma from the mortal realm into the realm of dead but also it was the one and only means known to travel between the two realms. Every tiny spot and a little rock that could be excavated from the room could be considered equivalent to a piece that could cause a magic's boom if not handled properly. 
but this was none of the concern of the man with deep red hair and a scar on the face, that appeared to be the mark of a sword, which was yet to heal, who just showed up in the Vathi's throne room, once known throughout all the realms where the kings of the underworld would dare to take control over several of the world systems. He entered unannounced. His question directly demanded an answer from the highest ranked figure in the room, as one would assume of the being who inherited the throne itself, his long hands resting on the broad armrest of the stone chair. His eyeballs were static and his chest refused to move, even while breathing. One just couldn't ascertain that the being reigning over the throne was even alive or not. And yet the overwhelming force, his mere existence exerted everywhere in the room was more than enough to make the impatient Akihiko to not overstep his bounds and get close to the master he serves, called Zero. And what's your point? Running like a dog around everywhere and complaining about every little thing. I loathe weak-minded people like you, who can't even finish their own job without someone looking after. Kariba Chioda intervened before anyone from the three figure could turn their head to zero for a response, as their leader. Her voice showed utter contempt for the protester but at the same time she seemed to be totally uninterested in that matter with her feeble looks as she carelessly twirled a finger round her twin tail hairs. I hadn't asked for your opinion, and I am least bit interested in your power play games. So that is clear to you now, get of my way. Akihiko taunted Kariba who instead of standing just near the steps that led to the throne was now looking straight at him eye to eye, he found her eyes, as if they were thirsty for something, they would go to any lengths and pain to get hold of that elixir and satisfy that thirst. He did not wish to fight her, even now when she just might have walked to him, she was too fast for him to even catch a glimpse. He had no doubt in his mind that if they both go all out, then he would be taking the short end stick of the fight. There was a land and sky difference between the power and abilities of the unique skills granted to them by their gods. Not only that a unique skill had already evolved once, that did came as a surprise to everyone who learned of this fact. But in fact the unique skill could be evolved even into a higher existence to the extent of calling it a godly skill. But at the same time he was not into the aesthetic of being ordered and played around like a damn fool would and getting killed. Not to forget this was quite an arrangement where two other reincarnates were still standing in the room, which was quite a rare occasion to occur since most of them only kept to themselves and their reason for joining Zero. In destroying this world and building a new one as we would desire, but he still found it strange, that such rare existences could be gathered in such short amount of time at one place and under the same power. Suspecting an existence of a third force, which tied all the thread and events that occurred to this day since his reincarnation, he always was at odds with other reincarnates who followed him faithfully and Zero himself, but as long as he gets what he wanted, he knew this was the only place he could find it. This was the last place he could turn to. Because he had even closed and sealed away the final gate to his salvation and peace and that scar was the proof of it. Using time for the scar and the wound he had succumbed to heal, he did not rely on superficial powers to soothe his anger or justify his cause. The other reincarnate included Sakamoto Sander who spent the most time with Zero discussing about a major plan that they even wouldn't let others know, though Kariba was unaffected by all of this. Akihiko never figured out what she wanted, or why such a normal girl who was average at everything in her previous life as far as he knew landed up here in this godforsaken place. What exactly happened between she and her god? Dash that they tried to kill each other, and even if she did, what happened to her goddess? The next one in attendance and line to another set of purely sardonic and unknown origin was Hashima Katsuragi, another rare hybrid monster race like Akihiko Totsuka, but unlike him he always acted high and mighty, as if belonging to a noble race that transcended all other existences, his own self clouded by an undeniable superiority complex to the extent of imposing it on others, sentencing all those to deaths who refused to accept it. He probably must have been here to report his success over the mission of stopping all types of communication and trade between demon continent and human continent by raising pirates. Otherwise, he doesn't even respond during meeting summons or bothers to train and be actively a part of the plans. 
However Zero lets him do anything as long as he is told what to do, and these bunch of people think I am pathetic. These are thoughts of Akihiko could not have been that far off the mark. But for those who knew their real side and the brutalities they have committed which might have outshadowed his very own sins, they were no longer humans, but monsters in human clothing. But even their pretense to act normal was so brilliant that no one would be able to catch a glimpse that they wanted to destroy the world, or rather they want everything in their sight they hated to be destroyed and plundered. Indeed, Akihiko. It seems that Corvus is no longer among us. Zero responded in his icy voice which emanated no emotions, at least not what a human, or a previous life human would feel in the very least. And what's really the point? He was not that special. All he was good with illusionary spells and lifting off seals. He did not possess that rare of a quality or skill to make us worry. He was pretty weak even among us if you ask me. I said good riddance. In my world where only the strong would get what they really deserved and be the number one, as if I would like to live in that world. But that's just why I'm concerned because Corvus was apostle. In Isleguard he should be powerful enough to take down any opponent and if his enemy is even an army he could use his illusionary spells to make every soldier slit their own throats in despair. So I want to know who did this because they would surely be a hindrance to our plans and anyone who stands in the way of my goal, I will strike them down. Akihiko pushed back Kariba at her shoulder as he started walking towards Zero showing signs of pure hostility, while totally ignoring the murderous glare Chioda was passing to him. He still knew Zero was hiding something very important to be this calm and relaxed as if nothing had happened. Corvus did manage to complete his mission by being a sacrifice and paving the way to the awakening of the cursed child. Zero said in a polite tone as if he was not at all affected by Akihiko's defiance to his order. So, you finally found the cursed child. So is it that thing which ended Corvus? Does that mean he is not on our side? And why did you hide such important information from us? That was rather not my intention, so as to displease you all abandoned gods blessed but rather there was nothing you could do regarding that matter. Your job is to find me helping the Septim Keys, while this matter of the cursed child will be totally handled by him. So there really is a collaborator. So how many truths are you going to hide from us? I don't like it. First Vertigo, and now Corvus. They were your loyal subjects who wanted your hard work and ambitions to come to fruition, and yet you abandoned them in their deaths. But the words of Akihiko suddenly submerged in his own throat as it got mingled with the saliva which he gulped down. In a heartbeat the atmosphere of the room had changed, as the magic circles and inscriptions on the throne, pillars and walls started glowing and a pressure of magical aura being radiated far worse to even melt down the skeleton of a human took control over the room and its proceedings. I chose to take on the name of the King of the Underworld and so it's my duty to use my subjects in the way I see fit. I will achieve the ideals which I desire where I bring the gods to my knees and rule over the entire world as its true master that would stand above all powers. This pitiful world will not be reborn by those who are forced to do evil but by those who cannot stand to watch it get destroyed and never to be born again. Zero's anger was justified as the loss of two of his powerful subjects only impressed upon another powerful existence that negated and berated him while living in the unknown. Even if it was the cursed child, itself, he had no feelings for possessing it but considered it merely as a tool and a means of executing his project. For a careful being such as Zero, he would never allow the continued survival of such an opposition force, but it is on the request of him his collaborator that he chose to leave the matters of the cursed child in his hands to be taken care of, he knew that now he had a new piece on the board moving on their own or rather a new queen might have emerged all by itself all along. Chapter, 5, A Friend's Request, Are you sure you want to come along with me? I asked her, Yes, as my duty and in this very short lifetime I am bound to following you, I will accompany you on whichever path you decide while I will be your guiding light, she said. Then I will be apologizing you for putting you in such a tough position right now and for my foolish actions I am about to take, by making him my enemy. This reincarnation of ours has no longer remained the little game I thought it to be. 
I stared at the dense overgrown jungle with trees growing at an alarming rate and not being pruned on a yearly basis to control its growth, but more importantly an eerie melancholy hung over the dull greenery of the forest and even the scantiest brighter rays of a full moon night couldn't seem to reach the ground. Well, that does sound foolish, and every fiber of my divine being tells me that it is not the brightest one, but I chose to be part of this foolish ploy and bet my everything on it. Freya chuckled and broke into a small smile, none could match the elegance and attraction which the goddess of lust emanated, trying to lighten the mood. Is she now, but the road ahead is going to be the most difficult. So maybe that smile would really help. As Keith Layton, and reincarnate Homura came to end as a covenant to Freya, a divine goddess, we both were here to seek the truth all by ourselves. The reason why Yumeka had to die and also Freya too was concerned about her friend Aphrodite, who was later then kidnapped. The truth about the devil so-called Zero and his true accomplice in all of this madness. Born as the first prince of the great Latavania kingdom, situated in the southwest of the human continent. I had everything I could ask for in my life, fame, glory and a rich noble life of a prince, great academicians to guide me, a reincarnate memories from my past life and even friends from my previous life too, but most important of all a goddess who stayed with me at every turn of my new life whether good or bad, but now that peaceful life is being threatened, I need to take matters in my hands before anyone else is harmed and things goes the worst with more of us being slaughtered like that cursed day. Ever since the day I have been working hard training myself while fighting against strong monsters, conquering dungeons and labyrinths while also learning the strongest magic spells I could use. And all will be for this day, when I bring back what was lost to me and for her too, if I am able to. We won't have anyone's help in this. Whatever happens today only we will be responsible. I reminded Freya for the last time what was at stake. We had already prepared for all the consequences. Of course you wouldn't want anyone's help, planning to do everything all on your own. Nonetheless I too like doing things this way, we can't believe in anyone else anymore, not when things have escalated to this point after all. Freya responded with a nod as a small and elusive smile appeared on her face. Truthfully speaking, majority of my other classmates were too scared after the display of power of that foreign being zero. Most of them hid themselves in fear, stopped all communications or vanished never to be heard even from their families. Such useless bunch could never come to of any use, but only a nuisance and I wanted to keep those away who weren't involved that day. What if they had an accomplice to, or would turn against me? Such thoughts were inevitable when I could not trust anyone except myself and Freya. Tilting her head in curiosity, Freya seemed to be more worried about me at the same time reminding me not to overthink on the decisions I have taken yet so far. If I do that I will not only be hurting her feelings but also the feelings of those for whom I am doing this, and that's why we need to do this as early as possible. Let us go Freya. I won't let that tragedy happen again after I have taken my revenge on all of them. Homura's voice proved his determination and even though he might have a calm presence but that was in appearance only. From inside he was burning with rage for almost two years, which kept him going even to this very day. The heaviness and the feeling of being outmatched he felt almost two years ago, he now believed that he had finally lessened the gap. Both me and Freya looked up at the clear starless night sky and even though I didn't knew anything about astrology our path was enlightened by the moon's light alone as we delved deeper into the forest with eyes filled with resolve. Every once in a while, parts of the forest would be engulfed in explosions. They came from an unmatched and unfazed power that had been acquired after experience and harsh training. Flames raced, sparks from a single sword strike like a crescent marked to be permanently engraved on the land. The air brought with it the scent of burning woods haphazardly turning into ashes. Freya used her explosive fire magic to take down every single monster in the vicinity. Monsters numbered in hundreds were plaguing the entire forest and spotting them in night was even tougher than the duo holding them off made it look like. Standing alone yet unfazed by these numbers, scything down entire hordes of goblins, orcs, rockiglums and mystical beasts, 
We finally made our way through the forest only to encounter a barren piece of vast land which enshrined an unimaginably enormous construction, standing before me and Freya. Wild plants had been growing in its perimeter and the walls and pillars seemed to be rusted, giving us a bad premonition of an abandoned and a stronghold fortress of forgotten times, which meant anything that was going to happen here was too meant to be consigned to oblivion by the world, for him to choose this out of all places. I said in a deep heave of discomfort and nervousness. Humans from your world sure have a difficult taste. Freya chided me with a mean look on her face. It might be just him only. Don't lump all of us together. I hastily replied, to clear the misunderstanding from its roots. I was not a fan of occultism and ghosts. Neither in my previous life to the extent of not believing in it, and even if I believe in the undead now, I do my best to stay out of their way. We entered through the huge opening of the castle, its gates seemed to be run down by time alone, as the mechanism to close and open it seemed to be stuck and clogged by dust and moss. Usually such empty fortress would be a perfect home to bandits who did pillaging and would use it as their main base without even being spotted by the knights in such an eclipsed part of the forest. But hopefully we didn't find any of them. But something did suggest their existence as the grey stone walls of the hallway and upper staircase were stained with fresh blood and a lot of it too, to be precise that such massive amount, one would fail to collect even from fifty men. Monstrosity would fail to describe the brutality and savageness of the being who did all of this, for the most part I wanted to puke, but Freya looked in much worse condition as she tried her best to look away from the grotesque view. Before long we climbed to the top of the castle and on the upper terrace stood two figures, with whom our meeting was predestined today. I welcome a young man and a flawless beauty to my lovely abode, if not for such a quick meeting I would have rather chosen a luxurious castle and would have arranged for a feast," said one of the figures sounding excited as he stepped to the front into the moonlight. Lucas Perilous, the second prince of Perilous Empire and a reincarnate just like me, Kenma Takeshi, and the other figure standing behind him was Erebus the god of darkness and his god in contract. A week ago I sent an anonymous letter to him telling that I knew about his secrets and asked him to decide on a place of meeting, to entice him into meeting with me alone, and yet he seems so unsurprised and at ease to see me. How long has he known that it was me? But it doesn't matter now, because in the end I got what I wanted and that is all. It matters. Enough of the dot stop with your phony pleasantries and start talking. I said to him but my gazes were all around as even the open terrace was drenched in the stench of blood. If you are feeling ill, then perhaps we can go to some place else to discuss after such a long reunion of ours, won't you agree with me old friend? It's just that things got a bit nasty while taking care of some bandits which were residing here and they would rather raise their swords against me than being humble to a prince of the empire. It was an indifferent and smooth form of speech. His relaxed attitude mixed with a sense of his superiority was making me impatient. Don't call me your friend after what you have done to us, by selling us all out, you bastard. I shouted at Kenma. You will end up hurting my feelings if you say that now class president. Fine then I will answer any of your questions since you went to the pains of coming this far while I was hoping you would turn your backs and go home. There was no turmoil or sense of fear in his eyes as he straight out confessed his crime. Damn you, to think you were able to raise so many monsters to obstruct us. I won't mind intruding on you after you have given us such a troublesome and grand welcome. I haughtily answered, I have no reservations for a prince but because in front of me stood a person who betrayed their friends or at least people whom he should have protected as comrades or as a group's allegiance. But before why don't you tell me? How did you know of my secret and ploy? Was it my demeanor that gave way to suspicion or my actions were rather too swift and dictated? You know what, never mind I asked. You have always been a wise judge and a swift learner. I was not surprised in the least if you would have found my secret someday even though this was quick. But it would be too simple if I didn't turn it into an opportune moment. Homura I want you on my side. Join hands with me and others are sure to follow you. Ken raised his palm fully stretched out towards me for a handshake and seal the deal. Had it not been for what he had done, I might have accepted this alliance, but since then, I feel nothing but repulse and hate for this person. 
I would if only you answer my one question. I responded to his offer, even though I was unhappy with how nonchalant he was making all of this sound. Surely I can't refuse such a simple bargain now, ask away. Kenma said without thinking twice, his overconfidence with whatever he had decided was weighing heavy on me like a sword on my neck. Who is zero to you? I looked at him adamantly, a sworn ally who shares the joys and fruits of my ventures. Kenma said in a light tone. Clang, the clashing of two blades each drawn out by two reincarnates a blue mystical sword in my hand as I rushed forward and used it for a quick uppercut to slice his body into two but was blocked by a heavy jet black sword before it could even touch a single being of my enemy. You are rather fiery today class rep. Maybe we should discuss things some other time or you might end up regretting it. Homura said in a crude voice as he parried my slash in the last moment. The deal is off. You are going to die by my hands right here and I will never regret this action of mine. I said before jumping back to a safe point and took my sword stance holding the blade horizontally aligned to my eyes, my crescent blue blade superimposed over his neck. You have rather grown quite strong and fast class rep. Then the last time we met, I would really like a man of your caliber as my equal in all of this. After all we both are exactly the same. People like us want to be left alone in our actions and not to be judged by anyone. Kenma stood up from his knee-bent position of blocking my sword and pushing his right leg back he too took an offensive stance but was still relaxed as if he still didn't consider me a worthy opponent. I am nothing like you heartless traitor. I am going to shut that stupid mouth of yours forever and then we would see who the strongest one among us is. This is going to be far more interesting than I thought. It has been too long since I have invested myself so deeply in a fight. Kenma murmured to himself, prepare yourself. I screamed like a lion, as I swiftly moved forward fortifying my body and sword with magic at the same time. That's quite noble of you to warn your enemy first. Kenma again replied to my sword strike by a quick block and parried it away, but I did not lose my ground and shifting my body accordingly with the flow of my sword. I moved and turning the position of my hands I redirected another quick blow at him. You haven't seen enough of me, have you realized it now? Then indulge me. The sword of Kenma started emanating a dark aura as it overpowered my blow with a single swing and pushed me back from my close advantage point. Swinging that heavy sword still won't be easy for him, at least that's what I thought. But he is so proficient with it that the weight of the sword only complemented his fighting style. Kenta. Let me help you. Shouting that Freya brandished her hand as she accumulated hundreds of fire lance after chanting a small spell. All of these only to be launched for our one single enemy Kenma. It was only befitting for an existence like a goddess to amass such powerful magic at a single point in such a short time. But before any of them could propel further, heavy thick tentacle-like shadow structures emerged from ground as they touched the fire lances. All of them were extinguished in a blink of an eye, as if the darkness infested and manifested as a parasite to eat away the light. Erebus used to control shadows and drifting in between them he appeared in front of Freya casting his very own magic special to negate towers. You won't be interfering in their fight. Let us, God settle their dispute among ourselves alone first. Erebus wore a dark expression as he expressed his hostility. Fine then I will take you on first Erebus. But don't tell me I didn't warn you if you get hurt at the end. Freya drifted backwards in a blink of an eye using wind magic and so did Erebus denying to leave the sight of his enemy's shadow. Freya! I shouted, but got nothing in response. She did not have time to look away and be distracted from her own fight. And so it is as much as my fight too. I was worried. And yet my nervousness was slowly turning into a feeling that I used to feel long ago, but had forgotten until now. To crush my opponents with all I have got unless they stop trying and competing. Maybe this is what people used to call a battle rush in my previous life. I am not deeply crazed about it but for once I wanted to be get deeply involved and introduced to this feeling anew. Honestly. I would be too disappointed if I had killed you as easily as I imagined. All my training would have been for naught if you can't even keep up with me. I giggled. I had not strayed from my path. I had still not forgotten to what end I was here. What I had to accomplish. To prove. 
and turn things right again. Even if some people cannot be brought back, if I stop trying I'm afraid I might lose and forget the pain I felt that day. Damn straight. So don't try to look away even for a second. We are going to have a fight to our heart's content and settle it once and for all. How about the victor will gain all, while the loser becomes his servant for the rest of his life? Laughter spilled out from his mouth as every word he said sounded repugnant. Your mouth runs too much. Maybe we should start with fixing that smirk on your face. Just try it. Our hearts raced as the ground shook with the impulse of the sprint. We took off from the ground and ran at each other and pushing our sword directly aimed at our chest. None hesitated to kill each other. I was prepared, but I still might have considered my enemy's actions to be childish and a mistake of youth. But now I wanted to know the reason. But that comes after my victory. I raced onward again, thrusting my blue blade before him in a feint as I took advantage of it and suddenly turned its course upwards. The deadly point of the blade plunged towards his chin, the tip moving so fast as if cutting through air itself, but it still failed to connect with his body. Kenma's body half bent backward. He raised the hilt of his sword which bounced my speed attack again. After my first attack was evaded in a grand manner despite my enraged speed, I did not let it go to my enemy's head. As I kept my sword raining at him like a storm of sharp blue petals in a synchronized gale trying to pierce through his very being, still titled, he pushed his body forward while his legs moved backwards. Seeing the chance my sword plunged forward as if it had a mind of its own, while Kenma stood frozen for a moment there, before my brain could process the strange stillness and the odd tranquility mixed in my supposedly winning strike, my senses returned to me as my sword grazing there left sharp edge of the long black sword almost too perfectly to be true only to end up sinking deep into the thick walls of the terrace of the castle. There was a soft smile on Kenma's face. This fight was not a joke. Neither was he smiling at his achievement of predicting my move or luring me into attacking up front. It was a pure display of mocking me. His gazes infuriated me, telling me repeatedly that I might have lost this round. The more I looked at him, the more I remembered her expressionless yet grim face after she was brutally murdered and behind all that plotting was him. I wanted to destroy him more than anything. And then I would finish Zero and everyone associated to him. My blows are meaningless and so would be my resolve if I can't reach him after I have come this far. I am not done yet. I screamed as I pushed the hilt of the sword hard, leveled perfectly at his neck's height, with a screeching violent thunderous sound of grazing to the very deep of the concrete walls with a thin blade which was meant for swift attacks I cut the walls in half as my sword sparked fire and rubbles into my enemy's face. As his face narrowed in disbelief, he was quickly able to dodge by pulling his head downwards along with his lower body. His swift movements were now shaking, still unaware of my surge in power, it was at that point he stopped holding back as he reflected his true powers on me. Without a second being wasted, he brought his left leg curling up a half circle from below enforced with his special dark magic his kick crushing my insides was only about to throw me from my position, but just when his foot made contact with my belly, I ignoring all of the critical pain, grabbed Tenma's collar tightly and since he couldn't maintain his balance well in that state, the thrust of the kick was strong enough to knock us straight into the high wall and wrecking it, we fell from the heights. Freya, Homora. I cried as I saw my partner fall with his enemy from such a lofty height without any guard. Doing my best to reach him with my magic control. I tried to help him out, but that was all I could do. Aren't you too worried for him, than your own well-being, Freya? Erebus asked. Don't call out my name so frivolously like that. Hiding and plotting like a coward, how low will you fall? I said as I prepared another wind spell to cut down those shadow tentacles of his. You can do it Homura, hang in there, I prayed forgetting the second enemy who was also in front of me, clutching my hands together wind in form of blades forced its way through the magical defense of Erebus as he was being pushed back only to land on soft clay to hold back his fall. Wiping the blood spilling from his cheeks he called out to me, Freya, you are really strong. If possible I didn't want it to fight you, but seeing you feel endearing to the humans I would say you have become a fool. From when did you started caring about them? 
They are just lowly creatures who stoop so low to gain our favors and powers only to push back all their wrongdoing and unhappiness on us. So, why are you trying to save them now? I know I must have felt the same back in the divine realm, but not anymore. Because now I understand that true beauty not merely lies in possessing eternal life and divine powers but it lies in the lives of those people who exchange their life for those happy memories which these mortals has as their only possession during their time of death. It's not for power, money or a chance they have a smile at the end of their life, but a feeling of satisfaction you reap after living a happy and fun life. Not something we too can understand. But still this new life has taught me more and more only to realize that they are not weak alone. Huh? You honestly think that way? Don't make me laugh. And if you really believe that then we would see soon enough who wins this. What are you planning to do Erebus? Do you even realize the gravity of what you have done? At the end you might not have a place to return to and forever fall from the grace of your godhood. But your cheap tricks won't change my mind. I said with an angry voice. It won't do you good to worry about your enemy so much. But hey now, since we are here, let's measure this resolve of yours and the things that makes you so cheerful. Erebus said as a shadow made its way through and mingled with my own shadow. In a second I and Erebus were sinking deep into the darkness like a small pool of quicksand, as if my body paralyzed I was unable to even move a finger. Homura Kenta, knocking over the walls both me and Kenra fell from the top of the building. The fortress was taller than even a ten-story building and none of us could control or wield magic properly because it seems that the walls of the fortress and its close proximity is a laid out and magic area. Could be that once this fortress was a stronghold for royalty in a war and as a precaution great measures were taken for its security and preservation magic which was still active on it to this day. But I was still alive and breathing. Only some few bruises and cuts from the fall with no bones cracked. To be severely injured in mid-battle could have proven to be a disadvantage because casting strong healing magic takes time. I will probably thank Freya later has she not used wind magic to lessen the momentum of my fall and provide an air cushion at time of impact with the ground. The hit would have been fatal, but what about him? I jumped back, sensing danger as I avoided the clear blow from his sword as it cut out a horizontal curve midair. Putting the weight of his on the sword amassed into the ground he rose up. Compared to me he was faring well, while the hit in my stomach was still aching from deep inside as a burning sensation made me almost numb from the shock. Comprehensively if I went at it again I might not be able to show the same speed and power but what about my enemy? He could be just pretending to be out of shape too if he could survive the fall then surely he can do much more. Homura why don't you first listen to what I have to say? he said with a contoured expression. Say it, as your final wish. I gave him a chance to speak so that I could recuperate in that time casting healing magic on myself, but I couldn't understand why would he give himself such a disadvantage. Then let me first thank you for listening to me. I would rather not kill potential future allies. He gaffed at me. Save your gratitude for later because after this I am going to kill you. I meant what I said as I might have made my intentions clear through my angry voice. Tell me Homura do you believe in fatalism? Do you mean as in fate and destiny? It's a simple belief that explains all things in this world are predetermined. The fact that we are fighting here might as well be the will of a superior being that controls fate. Behind this temporarily sustained piece of world, abnormal accidents keeps on happening and the world will slowly but surely fall of its track. We as the messengers of God were sent to this place to reinstate true peace and in return we get any one of our wish granted. What a crap exclamation mark dot 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 doesn't that means that all our efforts are pointless. If the gods at the top themselves are responsible for it from the very start, then this new life of ours was set on a broken table to make its fall a surety. I howled. Does he really intend to waste my time with such meaningless chats? Just what is his endgame? I am glad that you are a quick on the uptake. I too felt the same you see. But in truth when I met the gods and learned about how divine system works it all comes out to be the truth. Turns out we are all playing in the hands of the almighty god. Even yours and mine present actions might be determined by him. But I am going to sever this world from that fate and then take control over it. Kenma have you gone insane? We are not toys and this is not a game. 
We are living things too, so open your eyes and don't be fooled by some old philosophical decree. I screamed as I disregarded his idea. I really didn't want to think that way. It's like a distasteful thought that can crush any soul to the lowest depths of despair, and I don't want to be any part of it. I have always believed in my own work and talents and tried to achieve whatever I desired with my own two hands. The lines on my palms are nothing but mere lines and not restraints that binds me. So tell me class rep, what would you wish for? Wouldn't you want to change the world as you see fit? The excitement inside Kenma was taking root as his poker face which had clouded his real expressions was off and he was laying bare his true feelings. He truly felt that way and really meant what he said. He was no more joking but was more than serious enough to swear his life upon. You are in quite a hot pursuit yourself. I don't think I could possibly wish something that massive and unbelievable, but your ideas sound to me rather appalling and unbelievable. I scoffed at him. You don't have to believe what I say but you can obviously listen. I will become the ultimate vessel by reaching the roots of all creations to make all desirable possibilities and my wishes come true. Kenma replied to me and the more excited he sounded with every word he uttered. Trying to move his hand in front only to grab thin air acting as if he almost has that power in his grasp now. And how do you go on doing about that? Care to explain? so there really was something more to it, something of which I had been in the dark. That means I won't succeed in defeating him if I don't end up knowing what plans he had prepared to which end he is so determined to kill his past life classmates. And after I am done with my healing and prepared for my next attack I will take him down in the next blow. Don't worry I plan to tell you this from the very beginning. There are still chances you still haven't resolved yourself to defeating me. I can just tell by looking at you. What do you mean by that? I glared at Kenma. Tell me, class rep. Have you ever used your unique skill till yet? Dot. For a moment there I had no words. How did he know that? What has that to do with anything of this? I knew it. So why don't we try and learn and then you will be able to venture into my world and see its true virtue. I am in no way abided to do whatever you say or seeing your twisted vision. My unique skill has nothing to do with our fight. I can and will defeat you without using it. I pointed my sword at him, refusing to do whatever he said. Are you certain of that? Kenman narrowed his eyes and clapping two times. From behind him two shadowy figures emerged from the ground. One was Erebus and the other one was unexpectedly Freya. I called out to her, but she still did not respond. Her eyes were open that means she was able to listen and hear us but due to some kind of restraint she was unable to do anything. Kenma what are you doing dot dot she has nothing to do with our fight. Your enemy is me, so release her right now. I waved my hand in frustration to grab his attention. Oh I certainly would but unless you grant me an audience with your unique skill, I just can't. Despite that I have gone to great lengths for this arrangement, restraining a goddess's power is quite troublesome you know. Fine then, if there's no choice. I glanced at Freya and nodded. She looked a bit troubled with my instant approval, but suddenly her body was immersed in a golden light and I could feel the divine power coursing through my body. Somehow without a medium and only with our contract her powers were being transferred to me. Kenma you asked for it, I won't be responsible for any of the consequences. Oh don't you worry, I will be in turn using mine. I can't let my guard down around you after all. Kenma sneered as he felt the surge in the divine magic power. Let every fiber and material be charmed by my charisma I whispered and a raging amount of divine energy forced itself out of my body and spread into the area like a wave of endless pattern and current. In the next second I knew there were tremors from all around and when they finally stopped, the trees shuddered. The ground shook after each short interval footsteps as if in a procession were heard loud and clear even from far. Something huge and numerous was heading in our way. Kenma was unaware of the exact nature of my unique skill and now he was finally seeing it. Suddenly he looked at me and was frustrated to see Freya again standing by my side. To think that you will agree to use your unique skill so easily. She said, it's because you got so easily caught. It's not my fault, if I use too much power. Then your charm skill gets activated on its own and I would rather have you not complaining and nagging about it to me. 
But if I can use my full power even in this state Erebus is no match for me. You make me sound like a grandpa frustrated with the wrinkles on his cheek and I don't nag, but that is pretty reassuring in itself. I smiled back at her as I prepared myself to strike on my opponent when they came forth, for whom I have been waiting. In the nearest of places and from behind the group of trees emerged four ferocious monsters, undead, monsters we had killed previously, or monsters that once lived. Here, their skeletons and whatever of them was left, trees uprooted themselves from the ground as they grew out hands and legs. They were now my minions who followed my every command and were charmed by my skill. I see so your unique skill has got the ability to charm anything whether dead or alive as long as they cannot resist and you were hiding such amazing powers all up till now. How foolish. You could have conquered kingdoms and become the king in no time. Kenma cried and joined instead of being wary of the impending danger he was elated to see a multitude of enemies. Speak for yourself. It would be better now if you surrender. You honestly can't think of fighting against this many enemies. I shouted at him, it's not like I am not surprised I am really astounded to see the limit of your power but you see it has still got nothing on me. Witness my ultimate skill the power I acquired. Let there be darkness, I seek ruin of all. Kenma mumbled and the next moment the ground vibrated slightly. I and Freya reflexively looked down sensing changes in the magical flow below us. Instantly elongated thick black metal-like rods with pointed ends shot out of the ground. The large army of monsters, undead, living or non-living creatures that had arrived at my calling were skewered in front of me as their body did not even flinch after the impaling. Almost one by fifth of the charmed servants I had gathered were dead in the next instant. Lifting up myself from the ground as I pulled Freya up after we fell down trying to dodge in haste. We looked at Kenma who was totally immersed in a myriad flow of black aura. I will take care of him while you see to Erebus. I softly spoke to Freya without looking at her. The situation called for immediate action and we both understood that. But, it's fine we both will be the only one to finish them. I spoke cheerfully. The more you start acting cheerfully like a bright kid, the less reliable you are. Fine then, I will be the one to deal with him in this battle. Freya's worries faded in a blank expression as she casted a strengthening magic and defense magic on the remaining forces which have gathered. Dividing them in two groups, she started giving them direction in their empty minds as they started acting in a synchronized way, transformed into a trained group of soldiers, while our enemies waited not too far from us. A large horde of mixed monsters charged at Kenra from both sides, who was gripped by a strange joy of displaying his power. Moving his fingers along, pointed spikes again impaled most of the monsters. Only very few able to avoid them were their sharp senses, while others were hanging midair, their bodies torn in two. I dashed faster in between them, trying to either dodge by using the monsters as shield or by sensing them entirely through magic. This was the first time I was using charm magic on my own accord. After when it got out of control once while practicing the whole royal castle and my family was under the effect of it for a week even when I cancelled the magic. For me it was more of a moral sense otherwise I was not that affected by its consequential effects it brought with it. That's why I forbid Freya from using it and she got caught because of me. But the situation will soon be under my control. Just a little bit more time and I will show him that deciding to give me this chance was his greatest mistake. One of the ogre servant in front of me appeared to be that of a high level as he skillfully dodged all the spikes, and just when one shot in front of him, he grappled that spike, coiled his body around it, but just then from one spike another rudimentary spike emerged and pierced through its monster core. These spikes were really deadly and the closer you got, his defense seemed to be the more impenetrable with increase in his effective combat ability to tackle a multitude of enemies single-handedly, a perfect counter for my own ability. Did he see that coming too? Just from where is he getting his information, could it be zero? But it doesn't matter I still have this hidden trump card tucked between my sleeves. All I need is the right time to play it. I leapt in front and jumping onto the corpse of the ogre I made a second careful jump avoiding all other stakes that tried to follow me in my descent. Drawing out my blade, I swung a straight line downwards, 
the tip of the sword leaving a blue trail as if the path of the blade pierced through a deep perilous ocean turning it into a pacific clear blue surface. Smashing all the stakes that materialize in the way of my sword were crushed to dust and finally it came in contact with his heavy sword. The clashing of metal deafened our surrounding and with a burst of brilliant blue, my sword ran in between, cutting through his sword, its direction deflected by a bit it ran through his right shoulder injuring him severely. It was not deep enough to make it look life-threatening but surely it was not wise to continue any further. The long, long battle might have finally come to an end when Kenma holding his right shoulder which was leaking with blood all over. He wore a grim expression under his own dark shadow. I returned back to Freya's side as she looked quite pleased with the outcome. You finally pulled it off, and now we can finally take some rest. It would do you good not to forget that we still have to take care of some other goons left after this. I replied in a twisted manner, so that she doesn't start slacking off, like she did during the academy. She was the top students in the magic class and might as well be one of the best too. Not something too celebratory for a goddess but it came with its own perks of passing away the classes or sleeping during the training. Don't just start celebrating yet. Not yet. I might have misjudged your strength and taken this too lightly but I am not going to hold back anymore. Kenma growled under a tensed face as his nerves on the forehead twitched and his anger could be felt in the atmosphere. Spoken like a true failed villain. Freya mocked Kenma, but something was still not right. He was not the kind to bluff, not until now and after that blow he shouldn't be able to move like that. Freya get back. I grabbed Freya's dress from behind and pulled her back, when a long jet black metal cord pierced the ground turning it onto a huge crater, just where Freya stood. Eek. Freya screamed for the first time like a normal human would react on being attacked and surprised out of the blue. Otherwise as usual she acted always high and dignified. There were not that many moments of her. But she soon returned back to her serious demeanor. We looked at Kenma, and Erebus was standing right beside him as if they have just discussed something now and Erebus was not quite happy about that and yet he had a smug face as if he was fine with whatever conclusion this battle would have drawn. But now our eyes were stuck on Kenma and he taking just a single step further exuded a strong malicious intent at us. I nodded to Freya and she was on guard for whatever happens next. Step. Kenma rubs his right foot on the floor dragging it and then stomping on the pile of dust collected into the leveled ground. As if he was angry with himself and then soon got rid of that feeling, completely abandoning it. Unlike a normal average human, I decided to be the king of this world. And this showdown has just begun. You winning is a very interesting idea. But it's too bad, Homura. You cannot stop me from reaching my goals and I have decided that you're going to work for me whether you want it or not. Let there be darkness I seek destruction of all. Black armor. Partial transformation. A dozen of long metal flexible cords that could be bent into any shape and structure and yet hard as diamond were protruding from back of Kenma. As my eyes began to warp, by the dark light he emanated, it took away all of my concentration just to stand in that pressure of glaring eyes that peeked at us filled with rage and hatred. For a moment I could feel that one of those flying metal limbs could pierce me any time through heart and my hands hook in fear, just responsive enough to not drop the sword in my hand. Finally he was silent for some time, and the dark aura then materialized into more black ornate cords on his back as if forged out of his dripping blood from the wound on the shoulder which had been poisoned by his own magic. Listen Homura this fight of ours might not be what both of us seeks and yet we are fighting here like pieces played and thrown around on a battlefield. The world system has been broken for a very long time. We can never know for sure whether this system is flawed or incomplete and when our fate is trusted to such a thing that is no desire and form of its own, how can it know what's better for us? And that's why I as a king has taken it upon myself to replace this very system and stand at the top of the hierarchy to get this world rid of its imperfection and silence. His voice echoed in the plain grass land and in between the walls of the fortress. You have really gone insane Kenma, if you walk on this path you will never be able to get what you want. You are taking this too far. What you are seeking is unachievable. I shouted at him with my full voice. Something inside of me forced me to warn him for once, 
to take the chance maybe to turn back from wrong to right, but I was a fool, not to realize that to turn things right I need more than just words and maybe that incomprehensible thing which I needed the most right now, I felt it lacking in myself. Why do you think we were granted this power in the first place? With this power I will bring Adamus to this world and change it forever and no one will stop me from doing this. I looked at Freya who was as if stung by an anesthetic syringe. Her face had lost all colors at the mention of that word, and I myself have never heard of that word dash Adamus. After all this thing was foreign to me and yet somehow these two gods and my enemy knew well all about it. I call this project Adamus. I have not fallen so low as to accept doing someone's bidding and court favors from others. I will gain all of that power for myself and compile a completely new world where everyone will be free to do whatever they want and with its own set of new laws, while completely tearing this old broken world apart completely. Now then, Ken raised his hands as if signaling someone. And without me even realizing those long metallic black cords pushed Freya away as she crashed far away, knocked triumphantly into the wall. While Erebus followed behind her, I was so slow to react, rather so slow to even see that coming. But Freya was doing fine as she was still standing ready to face Erebus, but somehow all of this made her unhappy. But right now those eyes that were glaring at me even through this darkness, while I stared with my eyes wide open right back at him, prepared to have a second round. Freya, Freya you are really not someone to mess around. Even when you are so distracted right now, you saw that attack coming and protected yourself in the last moment. Erebus said as he waited for Freya to properly stand up. After all he was a god and had his own pride while fighting others at their full strength. Tell me, Erebus. Just what in the world have you done with that child? How did he know about Tadamas? I questioned him with a stubborn look on my face. I was really not going to move from there unless he would have answered me. The root cause of the problem ran deeper than I thought and more than he can actually handle in the present moment. At this rate, don't ask me he decided this all on his own. He just happened to learn about Adamus in the Divine Realm and through his curiosity he came to know more about it in this world and its deep secrets, and you would be astounded to know about how to resurrect it. Erebus don't tell me you are doing this to get your place in the main Apostle Council as one of the 24 pillars. I threw my next question at him which I concurred. How brilliant of you to so quickly surmise that. But do you think that would really matter if we are able to resurrect Adamus? Even the main Apostle Council and the 24 Pillars would be able to do nothing in face of its real power and all will be helpless. You will not succeed in this endeavor. You will never be able to get your hands on the Septim Keys. After all they were lost and hidden forever in the previous Great War. To be honest, we already have got our hands on one of these and the second one is just in our grasp. The more lavishly and quickly he replied, the more my hopes were being crushed as he dictated the truth to me. And all this information being shared to me just so that I the goddess Freya could be mocked. I won't accept it and nor let it end like this. Even so you will never be able to find the cursed child. Just like the last time this resurrection and summoning of Adamus will fail because a being like that does not exist. And lastly God Almighty will stop you from doing all of this. I laid the last line of defense of my arguments. Oh. Don't you worry, he won't do a thing but sit and watch because he cannot go back on his words of not interfering with the reincarnates with whatever they do, as for I am surprised that you even knew about the cursed child, that's quite a hidden secret which very few of us knew. Then again knowing you who was once considered to be a perfect candidate to ascend as one of the pillars, it wouldn't be a surprise now will it? TCH. That was more than enough to make me angry. I fired several fire lances at him, while the leftover monsters attacked him at the same time, but with a single swipe with his shadow tentacles it was more than enough to take care of them. I was running out of options, I have already been transferring my divine power to Homura to fight against Kenma, unlike his opponent's ability which needs divine power to just activate it. Homura's power demands a continuous supply of it. Though it is inefficient, it is still stronger with my superior abilities and yet I am being pushed back. As if from the start I have been losing my power slowly. I need it for now to keep Erebus busy so that Homura can complete his fight which did not start some mere hours ago but it has been almost two years. He had been fighting, 
as I saw him trying to improve by leaps and bounds, unlike me who thought I was always the superior and above all destined for greatness. I never tried to improve myself in the thought that I was born perfect as a divine being, a god, and that was my biggest flaw because I still had something missing inside of me. Not far from here, he was desperately trying to prove himself of what he is capable of. People like him and me always want to earn the acknowledgement of others and won't rest unless we would have achieved our goals. I heard very nasty sounds of continuous clash of metals as if they would rip apart my eardrums. I was doing my best not to scream loud or rush to his side without any plan and interfere with his fight. Blood was spilled all over the place and I didn't know to whom it belonged to. Homura had deep cuts all over his body as he tried to keep his vitals protected. He still had a tough battle ahead, but he had not given up yet. Facing his battle with a strong heart, he had not yet abandoned his weapon and ran away from the battlefield. Humans in no doubt are stronger than I thought. Even though this may not end well and the results might not be in our favor anymore. I vowed to protect my partner with my life and swear it on my godhood that I will not fail. One's lust for strength is not a result of his ongoing legacy of accomplishments but it truly lies in the process of aiming for something. I will press on so that we both can return back home safely and victory will be ours. Waving my hands in a semicircle, an arc of flame danced under the full moon as a giant fire storm raged to completely rip off Erebus and his bothersome dark shadow magic. But all in the middle of it a pink light shone as my magic suddenly turned pink and its changing nature as I felt it disappearing from the atmosphere. To an extent realizing what was happening I took extreme precautions and quickly cut off my magic before I could be further harmed. As my whole body shook in pain for forcibly doing it while still maintaining a constant flow of magic between me and Homura so that he can keep on fighting. As the storm cleared its reminiscence suddenly vanished and got absorbed into a pink crystal stone which Erebus held in his hands, I wouldn't have believed it unless I had seen it myself. To think that one day God would finally break the taboo of using those cursed origin stones. I sneered at him in contempt. Phew, I was outmatched even in this. You left me no choice Freya, fighting you fair and one on one. The odds are obviously not in my favor. But the scales of the balance have now been tipped with this artifact in my hands. Well for your kind information. Those stones might have worked as a charm against anyone else. But against me you are quite at a disadvantage, because my attribute is lust. While the same principles might apply to the origin stones, I can forcibly stop my magic being completely drained by that cursed thing you are holding in your hand. How low will you fall to use it on a fellow god? Do you realize that after this you will never have a place to return to if someone else learns of this fact? I might have sounded a bit confident, but I was more vulnerable than a common human now. With no magic to wield for myself, I would certainly fall. But then Erebus passed a hissing laughter as he called out to me. It seems that the battle is approaching its end. You wouldn't want to miss the final show. Saying that he vanished into a mist of black clouds, I suddenly turned my head in the direction where Homura was fighting. As I saw a trail of blood flow out from one of his hands as he was deeply wounded. His back, his hands, legs almost every part of the body was leaking with blood and at the same time he was still fighting back regardless of all the pain he was suffering or just relying on my divine power and the healing magic he was regularly casting on himself but couldn't keep up with the damage he was sustaining. Just stop. Stop now. I wanted him to end this fight now but I couldn't speak or make him hear my voice as I myself was growing weak. Was I wrong to grant him power that he had succumbed to this state? Or was this battle beyond our reach to begin with? I really don't know how I should feel but I have to keep my promise which I had made to myself no matter what. As I ran in the direction of Homura hoping to catch up with him before it would be too late. Homura, Kenta, you are going to fall here, sprawled into the dust and would have no choice but to be at my command. Kenma said, followed by a sharp whistle of air being cut. I looked intently for spaces as I dodged a whip from one of those cords in the final moment. As soon as I landed, one of the metallic spikes thrust itself out of the ground, like a spring-loaded puppet, 
but before it could reach my neck I cut it in half. Sooner than I realized what I was doing unconsciously as I was already engaged in blocking the attacks from his dangling whips as they tried to thrust holes in me, only to be parried by my sword, but I can't keep this up any longer. The speed of the attacks instead of diminishing became more accurate and paced as he tried to read my movements. I was getting restless and tired with getting nowhere with this dodge, parry and dodge strategy. I was still far from him, and the cords were tangible enough as if to reach any part of this world. I activated the magic enchantment on my sword, to make its curve glow like an energy plasma blade. With a blue lining, I clutched my sword even tighter and like an endless flow of a water stream I made my way through quickly dodging all the cords as I got closer to him with each step I took. I was ready again to use my final blow and this time I wouldn't have missed. Hurling a war scream at my full voice I brought my sword directly aimed at the area near his chest where the injured hand was attached. A silver curve glittered in the darkness as my sword stung my hands numb and the recoil crushed my finger bones. The glow of the sword went pale. How's that possible? It should have cut it in two. Somehow the cords were strong enough that it won't even let my sword pass through, as another of his cords grazed my side belly. Unfortunately, I was unable to properly dodge it in mid-air and it ended me costing more than I could have vouched for. My eyes were wide open in shock as I stared at my chipped sword because of the previous unfortunate clash and the incisions on my body which were spilling blood. It hurts, more than I ever had to bear, but it's nothing compared to what happened that day. And what might happen if I didn't take this chance? It's over, so what are you still smiling for? Kenma called out to me as I was still falling beside him injured and unaware of what I was truly feeling. At least that's what it looked to me. But I did not realize that a slight grin had surfaced on my face. Maneuvering myself in mid-air I pushed my body towards Kenma, placing my paw forward at his torso in his blind spot. I pushed him back as my sword hurled around in a semicircle as it robbed him of his balance and stole his senses of the world and only leave him vulnerable enough to be able to feel the pain I inflicted on him with my sword. He was thrown away far and made a crash landing on the walls of the fortress that were tough enough to stop him from being thrown away from the battlefield and at the same time harsh to not even provide cushion for the impact. It would probably take some time for him to recover and his right arm would surely be dysfunctional by now, but at the same time in impulse I hadn't realized that the wound on my side belly was deeper than I thought it to be, as my clothes were soaked in blood red. I clenched my jaws and shriveled in pain at the same time tried to hide my own tears. As I saw Freya rushing to my side, she tried to use her magic to seal the place which was impaired, but for some reason the wound was not at all responding to her healing magic and that would mean that it was some kind of curse magic imbued along with the attack. Don't worry, we can still get it healed if I can just use some of my divine powers. I held Freya's hands before she could move forward with it. We need to save energy to fight, we can't waste it here, not at this critical point. I said in my feeble state. But, Freya opened her mouth to say something, but no words emerged. Freya what does Kenma hope to achieve with all of this? I looked directly into Freya's eyes for an honest answer. You only need to know that if he gets his hands on what he wants then all of the world could be rewritten and his sick world would begin. We won't be able to do anything, it would be as through the world was that way from the beginning of time. Freya looked the other way as she explained to me in as short as possible. I didn't know of the details, but eventually we all will be as good as dead if Kenma ends up having his way. I am all right now. Taking a deep breath I tried to force my body to move. We dot can't afford to lose this fight, not right now dot dot and I still can use that. I said it in deep voice putting all my body weight on my sword as I tried to stand up on my own. I wasn't going to lose, not here, and never again. So tell me class rep do you realize now, that what I am seeking is far beyond what you can even imagine? I wonder now, what will you ask for your wish now? Will you want to change the past or the future that lies ahead of us or seek power for victory in this fight? But know this, the result of this fight was already predetermined and there was no hope for you but the same darkness that has made you end up in this situation. 
Kenman started with his blabbering as he and Erebus walked from the impact point to where we were so as to ascertain our state. Even when we were sent to maintain peace we were unable to identify the exact terms but I think I understand a bit now that what I have to really stop is from people getting your dirty hands over this world and corrupt it. But, you know what it's me who is going to decide what to do and not someone else. I won't let anyone else to make that decision for me. I said to Kenma pointing my sword at him, which might crack at the very next power strike I use it for, but that's what all I need. Next time I won't miss, Freya I will be using that. I said with a stern face, but I wasn't looking at her. If I did, she might have refused to do so and also because I did not want her to blame herself for any of this. Then I will fully support you in doing this and give you all of my power. Freya did not waste it any moment, she was relentless and at the same time did not hesitate to take swift actions. Ha, you really think you can defeat me? How about seeing things like this, if what I am doing is that wrong the way you think it is, then I am guaranteed to be struck down by your sword in this fight, so that the divine system can protect itself, but if everything ends up going perfectly then I will know this that fate itself has brought us up to here, how can I prove to you that I was correct, if this is not enough evidence? The power that I have reaped by my own efforts would not have been overwhelming enough if what I was doing as you call it insane. Or rather people are called insane when their good actions are misunderstood. Nothing will stand in my way, not even you. Kenma pulled out a good laugh after he ended with his speech, while we stared at his twisted face. Erebus this is madness, just what are you thinking trying to follow such out of reach and unrealistic ideals, what is there in it for you? Freya finally asked the question for which she has been niching to know the answer. For a god to involve himself in such taboos and obvious law breaks would mean falling from godhood and abandoned by the divine system and its protection of all divine beings. Then what it is that drives him to such lengths to cross the line of despairs? My role is very subtle but simple enough to understand. It's so refreshing that whenever I think of it, every worry of mine fades away. The world free from all control wouldn't you want that too? My partner and covenant has decided to become a king that rules above all. Then wouldn't every king need a god to look after them? A king you say? Don't make me laugh. Up till now there have been a lot of things that I did not understood and either left it neglected or labeled it as unacceptable. But I am still going to face you. I will take action by my own hands and prove that myself unlike you who only sounds to me as making excuses for himself. I don't have any clue of your plan and I don't care. I am not some hero fighting for justice and I am here all on myself and not because of you playing some sick mind games on me. I simply refuse to hand it over all to you and that's why I need to grab it first more than anything. After a small pause, Kenma's face lit up as he might have thought of an amusing idea, but that were the least of my worries. I see then, now Homoru it's time to clash our swords for the final time. I nodded to Freya who brought her hands together maybe as a gesture to pray for my victory, but this time that won't be enough. What I really needed now was an impeccable timing and a lot of overwhelming power to crush my enemy. I might be asking for more than what we can obviously handle, but I promise that this would be the last time we go beyond our means. I stepped forward and so did Kenma, with dozens of metallic cords protruding from his back. He pointed his finger at me and half of the flailing cords headed to pierce me limb by limb. But I as if on instinct, almost blocking each of them at the least successfully putting off their full force, taking on small hits. I headed towards Kenma as I accelerated along the smallest path it would take to reach him. I was not going to take a detour or go for a feint, but coercively it would be a direct strike and there would be no avoiding it. Kenma knew all of this and with my body language he might have been adapting to and would have eventually reached the same conclusion. With the only optimistic solution to block my, that specific one strike and in the final moments and making his own finale move on me, the thought of him outdoing me, the thought of him being superior. The thought that everything is under his control and no matter what he would win. All of these feelings brought together and coalesced into one magnificent line of pieces I carefully laid. And that's where the match will be decided. When the one who knit this whole chain of events would be the one to destroy it himself by toppling a single red domino and turn tables on him at his own sick game. 
just when I was about two meter away from him. Half of the number of cords shrunk so as to act his cover, while the remaining headed straight for my body all to strike at the most vital points, my heart, lungs, head, the legs and the hands, which was completely wide open. One would think this was a suicidal attempt, but I had not given up just yet, with the remaining power still left with me I can still change the course of this battle with one single strike I have to win this. Waves of heat roiled on my chest as I could hear my own heartbeat and the surrounding seemed to have deliberately slowed down. This was not a mirage, or the sentiment of me dying, but the effect of the ability which I was using as my final resort. The cords heading my way suddenly stopped moving, the cords that protected and guarded Kenma bloomed open like the black petals of the flower of death itself that was eventually going to fall on him. Kenma stood unprotected and in range of my sword's swing, ready to take down the enemy's head, with a definite hit that was the final trick up my sleeve. If I focused all of my senses and magical energy, then for a moment I could even charm the magic particles around me and they would do as I asked. If I wanted for them to strike Kenma back, then it would have been possible with just one. But me trying this for the very first time I only had the means to stop all of the cords for once and create an opportunity for myself. I had won the match there, as Kenma stared at me with his eyes bawling out, fear trickled from every muscle of his face. Clang! Everyone heard the sound of my final strike but there was one another sound that accompanied it. Z-R-R-R-R-R-Z-H-H-H-H. My sword had cracked in two as the other part went flying away. The remaining part of the sword crumbled to pieces in my own hand, and there was something else missing. I felt the unmovable pain surging through my backbone, Waha I cried. My left hand was not there, where it should have been. Tears of physical pain crowded over the lower lining of my eyes and in that haziness I saw Ken McClad in a black knight's heavy armor a broadsword standing on the ground. Its tip dipped in my blood and beside it was lying my ripped off arm. Black armor. Transformation complete. Kenma's lips moved as I heard him wording it. How is that possible? Was that not your unique skill? I screamed in frustration. My thoughts still unclear, uncollected. Something unreasonable, something absurd had happened and I still couldn't comprehend it. Kenma glared at me with emotionless eyes as if he felt nothing with what he just did. That's not quite right. You see my unique skill has already evolved further into a godly skill. Homori you have failed and now it's time to pay up. His words were cold and yet the absolute. No, 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 no. That's not the truth. I am not hearing that. I can still dry my sword. Where is it? But it was already broken, if not that then my hands dot dot but they were mostly injured that it would end with only me hurting my legs but they won't even have the energy to stand and respond to me. It's time for you to die, if you are of no use to me. Kenma made the decision in light words. The death blade was hanging on my neck, and light was slowly fading from my eyes. I failed everyone, I failed myself. After all, I did not belong to anywhere. No matter how hard I tried at last I couldn't win. Things again had to escape from my hand's grasp. What Kenma said. Was it true after all? And if it is then me falling to this state, Yumiko losing her life, Freya seeing me in this pathetic it's all the divine system's fault. But is it really? Or, it is just me putting my blames on someone else just because I met my match or hadn't considered my option properly? Was escaping from this ever an option? I don't know, but all I could see further was my end. And instead of looking like a reaper with a black scythe, or an angel to carry me away, it rather looked like a hopeless cat, the world stares at me and I would have slowly become one with it, wait, Freya had moved in between me who was lying helplessly on the ground and Kenma who held the victor's sword, for what you really want, you will need the power of other gods to support you, but if you kill Homura then I would be transported back to the divine realm, so, I offer my powers to you and in return let him live. Freya's words were still unclear to me as she hurriedly proposed a condition to Kenma. And what makes you think that, I would do as you say? Kenma replied in his cold tone. If that were to happen, then I would chase you to the end of this world and destroy you with my own hands no matter what I have to do. Freya said boldly. 
That is something I would avoid having to go through. Erebus do it. Erebus stepped forward excitedly, and me who still did not understand what was going to happen watched like an ignorant fool. Erebus held a small pink crystal stone in his hands and as a huge magic circle formed over it, a beautiful aura medium formed between it and Freya. For a moment she turned her head towards me, while her back was still facing me. My gazes followed her. Her face. She was in a lot of pain. I don't know whether it's right or wrong but regardless I want to do this. Do not forget that I chose you and it's my choice. You made your own choice and so I want you to make another choice and prove him that he is wrong. That what we both today tried to do was not meaningless. Thank you for everything, Homura. All this time she had tears in her eyes. I could tell because she had been holding them back for a long time. But you don't need to thank me I haven't done anything. I muttered, not knowing whether my words reached her or not. You are intelligent Homura I am sure you will understand. For a moment I saw her lips moving but couldn't hear what she said, but I knew it was our final goodbye as she laid standing frozen inside a giant pink crystal, cut off from the principles of time that governed this world as she faded away into a black mist. Tears continuously fell down from my eyes. Not knowing what to do next I laid helplessly like a lost child on the ground, who didn't know who he was. What was that I had to do next? I didn't know which way I go forward. It almost seemed that all paths had closed down. Just then a kick rammed me on my stomach as I flew and fell several meters away. Blood spurted out of my mouth, even in the final moments. Freya, though she couldn't have healed my hand. She had closed most of the wounds and internal injuries. What a waste. Just how pathetic you look. Kenma gleefully looked at me. Damn you, Kenma. I screamed at his wickedness and disrespecting others' emotion. But was that really what I was doing? Wasn't it my fault to push her into all of this? If only I could fix all of it again? If only I could try to do it right once more? Would Freya return back to me? I have an idea that will surely make you happy. Kenma walked towards me, and held me tightly by my collar as he gave a jolt to my head, to put me back to my senses. I had no strength to react or fight back as I tried to gaze at him almost unconsciously. You can obtain her back if you will do me just one favor. Find the cursed child for me. You will do it for me right, Homura. Just call it a request from your friend. I don't know what happened next. Whether I cried in silence or screamed like a mad dog or rather fell unconscious like a loser. But now I knew what I had to do more than anything to bring Freya back to me. This time let me turn this right for once, no matter what I have to do. Kenma Takeshi and Erebus were returning back to the Empire as I used the teleportation artifact to bring us back to the Royal Palace. The coordinates were set to a garden and just when I landed, I almost slumped to the ground while Erebus held me in the last moment by the shoulder before I fell. It seems that we would have to find a holy priest first. Erebus gawked at my injuries. There's no need for that. I will be fine within a day or two. I closely held my right arm as if it was just about to fall apart from my body like a broken machine part. If I had not used the evolved unique skill in the last moment then I might have actually died. But now I was one step closer to my goal. Since we had got hold of some gods now we could produce more origin stones. All we needed to do now was to use it to get our hands on the second septum key. Lost in my thoughts, I heard Erebus calling out to me. You asked him to find the cursed child. But what if he ends up killing him, before we could extract it? Then we won't be able to do a thing. Erebus, are you criticizing my decision? Well your determination was rather catchy to make even a god like me to be your devout fan. Hey, you must be smart to think that, and smart people are the ones I require for this dream of mine to come true. Don't worry he won't do a thing because I have every string that controls him in my grasp. He will be a wonderful pawn and do as I say. And even if he wants dead I will just have to cut the strings and he will fall deep in the abyss never to be heard of again. So it's time to head for the extraction of the second septum key, I suppose. It's just the beginning of what I have started. This world is not a paradise, and I will be the one to end it and it shall be born anew. But first maybe I will be playing my piano for some time. Interlude. I know who I am. I always thought that the life we live will always remains the same, no matter what happens or how much time passes. 
that I could always keep smiling and do whatever I wanted to. But, happiness and precious things eventually falls apart. Princess I have prepared the clothes your father has sent for you. His Highness has asked you to see him after you have finished. Spoke one of the servants as they would have set aside my clothes just outside the bath. I opened the door since. I was almost done with my bathing and stepped forward into a beautiful big room filled with abundant sunlight as it shed its light upon the huge bed and the decorative ornaments that adorned the room befitting of the status of a princess. Please inform him that I will be there soon. And thank you for... Before I could finish the sentence, the maid let out a surprise terrified sound on seeing me up front and close, as if she had seen an undead ghost. Han. Will do, princess, I will be taking my leave now. Saying that in a hurried manner, she quickly left the room as if she was running to save her life from something terrific and vicious enough to take her life. The big room was empty again and it alone sheltered me in the rightmost top isolated corner of the royal palace and the dangerous thing she was running from was I. The second princess of Ascalon, the great kingdom of elves, Regis Ascalon. The room was more than spacious enough to hold an entire feast for any celebratory occasion and yet I have been standing alone there, left alone to do whatever I pleased as long as I didn't bother others. Even this room, was still not as simple as it looked like. Everything in this room is specifically of non-magical origin. The furniture, the decorative curtains, the glasswares and all other items were all handcrafted and not made magically as they are manufactured. Not because they become expensive or rare, but rather it's unique to a monster like me, at least that's what they call me, because I always end up destroying whatever I touch as long it has magic in it. But it had not always been like this. I too once was living happily and smiling among my family members as they equally loved me back but after that accident everything changed. I had to live apart from others not because I wanted or was forced to but because I had to. I was born with strong magical energy and had great aptitude for magic as well as for combat among all my siblings. We used to play, eat, sleep and do everything together like a normal family would spend their time with their children. But things do not always remain the same and the sole reason being because I was labeled different from others. But who decided that? It was not me, and yet slowly everyone seemed to be so far and distant. Even though I know my family members deeply care about me I just couldn't seem to get closer to them, not when I have this devastating power. My magic attribute was not yet determined and when I was nine years old. I went with father on a simple monster extermination expedition along with my other siblings. It was just going to be a simple test for our practical skills and learn about the present dangers that surrounded our kingdom isolated in the northern west part of the demon continent. Everything was going well until then as I had already scored against two red wolf monster with my arrows that would chase down their enemies relentlessly unless they made a hit on their target. But then unexpectedly a giant red wolf shot out from one of the trees and pounced on me knocking me from the horse's mount, pinned under its powerful legs. I was unable to move. Father in turn jumped from his horse and running towards me he tried to push away the monster and knock it off. There was no time left to chant a magic spell or take aim and shoot. All that mattered to him was saving me and he didn't want to injure me in the attack. Howsoever. But its sturdiness somehow proved to even overpower him. There was not even a second left in which it would have torn or crushed my head in rage. My mind was drawing a blank and in that moment as a reflex and naturally a power sprouted in me from deep within as naturally as it could have been with me since my birth. My hands moved forward on its to grab something intangible, only to make the slightest of contact with the monster's body. The next thing I knew I was drenched in its blood but that was not the only thing I had destroyed as I saw the monster's body twist devastatingly in agony like a spinning top, crushing all its bones and blood vessels with the pressure of being tormented and its body compressed into a savage lump of meat. But that was not the only terrific scene I saw that day. Further who was also in contact with the wolf as he was pushing it with his hands had his left arm missing as a red blood fountain spurted out of the missing part of the arm. I was screaming and crying and yet Further who had a pained look on his face was smiling at me even just for a bit to tell me everything was fine. But that was the day when I lost my innocence. 
The affection I wanted as their kid and not some cursed foreign monster and the normal treatment as a fellow being. It was ascertained that I had an abnormally high affinity for destructive wind magic and on top of it a special skill air torn spin. No one could find out how the skill worked because whatever I touched made up of magical constitution would compress and twist in itself. No matter how many times I tried to suppress it, I destroyed everything of creation and turned it into pure disaster and that would include life itself which brims with magic and life force. Had it not been for my status as a royal and my family's intervention I might not have even been living a proper life of a normal being and I have always been grateful to them for looking after me. With no hope I was shunned and closed in this part of the mansion and everything surrounding me was designed specifically so that I wouldn't end up destroying it. All beauty and fun faded away as soon as I touched something and hurting my own family terrified me more than anything. That's why I decided to stay in this place and keep on learning more and more about myself so that one day I could climb out of this hellhole and be with my family again. Slowly I started venturing inside the castle trying to do and help things in my own way while continuing my magic and combat training. There were obviously people afraid of me. Those who despised me while some who sympathized with me, visualizing me as an unfortunate being but none treated me like their brethren, all because I was different. Because of my excessive wind affinity all my other magic became almost negligent and I was rendered unable to use wood magic as an ill-fated elf who was deprived of the touch of the nature. I was left miserable to live the life of the black sheep of the family. I wanted to sleep close to my family, tucked in between them listening to bedtime stories, but all I got was a huge cold empty bed. All because I can't even hug my own even for once. Even the food made for me is tasteless. Since the products were grown naturally without using magic for cultivating lands and germinating the seeds. When I was a kid, all I did was hold the bed sheet tight while I had to cry alone on thunderstorm nights as the lightning tormented me. But in all this time I have grown and learned in my own special way, that crying or blaming it all on my fate won't work. If I want people to accept me then first I need to accept myself. I wanted to be strong so I could protect the things that were dear to me. So, that I could finally obtain the things back which I lost a long time ago and are dear to me. I don't want to lose any more because of my weakness or lesser understanding of my own powers. And for that purpose I have to venture to the outside world and find out what really I am capable of. And only then maybe I will be finally able to understand what I can truly do with this power. After wearing the dress that Further had specially sent for me, which he does occasionally and seeing that the room was typically filled with all types of gifts sent by him, but they seem pretty useless to me and I am really not into wearing such grand sophisticated dresses, because it's difficult to move around in them and it takes an awful lot of time to put it on. Phew, but since he went to the trouble of sending me one and meeting me, I can't seem to prepare myself to break his heart. It's not like someone will walk up to me and help me put it on, but rather I have to do most of the work myself too. I have even refused for the workers to clean my room and took it on myself to do it on a daily basis. I glanced out of the window and beyond the small garden where a huge vine tree seems to be growing, beyond it expanded a massive vast blue sky, and beyond the walls of the royal palace was the capital city of Skal. But the palace administration has been in chaos because some days ago the sky had turned red, with raining stars that almost flooded the sky and the massive tremors that devastated the capital city. It was reported to be a monster whose origins were unspecified even on the magical radar and from what I have heard just by the magical output its threat rating went beyond any monster registered in the information directory list and even the machine seemed to be reported inefficient in predicting its true power level. I wonder whether such kind of monster even exists, because then not even the army would stand a chance and if it really does then why did it disappear so suddenly? Knock knock. Two maids entered my room. Princess Regis, we have come to escort you to your highness. Said one of the maids. I don't need an escort to see my father now, do I? I said in a bitter tone. I am sorry princess, but it's the code of protection to keep his highness safe. The other maid really didn't care what she had to offer me in answer. So, they really think I am that dangerous to harm my own family, so be it, take me to him. 
I followed them hastily, trying my best to escape from the gazes of the guards, other workers and officials in the castle, finally reaching father's office, where he usually worked and performed all his kingly duties. I stepped in while the other two maids still followed me to the inside. You are finally here my sweet girl. You two can leave us father and daughter alone now. The man sitting on the chair in front of the desk with a golden plate label stamped with the royal family's emblem and the right to the throne, while the crown was frivolously thrown on the table's edge as if he didn't care much about it, he stepped out of his chair to come closer to me. Even though he knew I am afraid to come close to anyone, he tries his best that I am not left alone. The two maids had already left my side and I could finally find myself some place to relax and demand further that he allows me to go outside the Elven Kingdom. Father, I. Now, now you have only just arrived and you look so wonderful in that dress. How about I ask the chefs to make something exclusively sweet for this occasion and we can enjoy it with some tea and talk. Pushing one of the chairs in front as he beckoned me to take a seat. Further before that I want you to give me permission to go and travel outside the kingdom. I said in a desperate manner before he makes me to forget what I was here for. Hugh Regis, we have been over this before, but I still think you are too young and immature to leave all on your own. Stay for a few more years, train as you have been meticulously doing all along and then we will see to your request. Is that okay with you? Further tried to force out his way by sweet talking to me but this time I was not falling for it. No, it's not. I have to go and see for myself what I can do and find out that. Then I realized that even though I have been wanting to go, I really don't know what's out there, what I truly wanted or how I might end up and do outside the kingdom and beyond my family's reach. But, I have already made up my mind, and you cannot stop me this time. I really said out loud what I was thinking, while father for a second there stood motionless as I might have heard him whispering my name. Suddenly fast-paced footsteps were heard in the corridor as a man and a soldier in silver armor entered the room. Your Majesty, it's bad news the forest spiritual magical device has spotted an intruder within our kingdom's borders and is squandering around our royal capital. But somehow our magic radar has failed to detect whether it's a monster or another living being. I am afraid to say, but with the increasing events of dragon invasions and the harm caused to the tree of Genesis, great. Further tried to endlessly stretch the word as he signaled the official knight commander and the administrative officer towards me. Princess. Regis, I beg your pardon your highness to not watch my tongue and speak without your permission. Both of them stood with their head down waiting for further orders by father. Well he did really a blunder to spill all the chaos in front of me since this news might have been kept a state secret from the start as the nature of the content made it sound like. The more the disclosure, the rumors are bound to spread, but it's not like father is going to punish him for that. But now that I know I have a rare chance to prove myself, the Dragon Island has been the home for the dragons after the four great spirits and the black dragon god made it a sanctuary for all the other dragons to live a peaceful life after the great war and exist without being hunted because of their ruthless anger which they might show in discomfort. Even then this kingdom has done its best to keep the Dragon Island a secret from the rest of the world and also act as its benefactor. In return they provide assistance in keeping the Tree of Genesis which is said to be one of the blessings of the Four, Great Spirit and the Tree of Life from the Realm of Gods, safe from the dangerous monsters which we cannot handle by ourselves. If for some reason, there is a single harm to the Tree of Genesis it might as well be the end of this kingdom, since the entire capital city is built inside a huge evergreen forest. Further let me handle the intruder let me prove myself that I am not that immature girl you still think, and if that's not enough I will fix all the other problems that worries you. Saying that I already left the room to make preparations and see that there are no threats that jeopardizes the safety of my kingdom and my family. Chapter 6 Thoughtless like a human. This has been more disappointing than I thought it would be. After waking from leveling up, I tried searching for the tree which I was going to use as a landmark to travel further, but as soon as I pinpointed out I find another green tree similar to it, resembling it perfectly in height and shape. Shouldn't the forest have been filled with diversity of flora and fauna, 
So how there can be an identical tree just like it everywhere I look? It was all the fault of that ungrateful bird that left me alone, but I won't blame it since it intently listened to my conversation and I am looking forward to another one of those. But I also cannot blame myself for bringing an outdated world map only to forget that I cannot zoom in or out of the map like I would do in the previous world and having zero experience with trekking is making this travel unbearable. So, I came up with a 100% working psychological decision making method which I used even in my previous life to choose between options when I didn't have a preferable choice of my own. I just can't leave everything to fate and do nothing. So. I let the vertical wooden stick freely fall under gravity, as it would point in the direction I have to move next. Though it's a crude method but this way I can at least have a path to follow than wander around like a vagabond. I cheerfully followed it, whenever I came across two or more junctions and within no time I had a huge realization, that, now I just don't know any more, how tea worked for me previously. I kicked the stone with a slight force with my legs as it fell into the depths of the cliff I was standing upon as the vastness of a new layer of greenery presented below me. I still couldn't hear the hitting of the rock on the ground, but something more interesting caught my eyes as I carefully scanned the massive forest from the top and realized the trees at several junction and paths had been cleared only to form a huge inspection magic circle as if someone was intently keeping an eye over it. I was overjoyed over the prospect that this would surely help me in meeting someone and then I can move with my next plan of action, which is one of the skills I mastered to my fullest even in my previous life to ask for directions whenever I get lost. Usually there were instances where I end up in a wrong place, to the point of admitting that was normal for me and I started avoiding traveling altogether. But seeing that it is a necessity now. I need to start believing on the decisions made by the ste.kk, I mean made totally by me and wherever my heart will take me to. I started walking vertically on the steep cliff, quite easy for a born spider like me. I just had to maintain a synergy between the magic in the soles of my feet and the magic energy flowing inside through the rocks to maintain a proper balance and body posture. If the magic is insufficient I would lose my footing and if I apply too much then that would lead to. I drastically increased the magic on my soles as the rocks underneath cracked and burst outwards. I jumped and flawlessly landed on the ground without a single scratch. That brings me to the present scenario where I am being followed by several pair of gazes from all around me. Maybe I should be thankful for the attention, but is it really the kind I should appreciate because I have never been in the spotlight? But even if they have to stalk me at least they should have followed the three golden rules which I read once on an internet blog about mastering the principles to be a successful ethical stalker, when I thought I should become a detective and try joining the detective club. A successful stalker perfectly mingles in the crowd, they cannot let the target know that they are being pursued and yet make them feel uncomfortable with the uncanny vibe that their every action is being watched. They have to deceive everyone including themselves that they are a part of the dark side of the shadows and no one can know their true form and intentions. And last but the most important is that to maintain a thorough logbook of the activities of the target no matter what difficulties the observer has to go through to collect information and bring success to the mission. Internet sure is a powerful thing, but now it has become a thing of my past. I am sure I wrote these golden rules on the joining form for the detective club. But I had to drop out because they rejected my joining form on the pretext that I would fit much better in the Chasing Bingo Birds Club. But I had no plans of joining a weird club that chases birds around all day in the zoo. Being not sure was another problem as I couldn't tell whether my pursuers were just some watchers, hunters or stray bandits. But they sure are doing everything for letting me know that I am being followed by carelessly using search magic and that too with material attribute. Did they forget to take into account that even if it reveals my location but on the contrary if I have a master of magic control then I can easily trace back their location too. I have been taking care of monsters by using my web magic, which are dipped again in my poison magic. A single touch of these sharp webs and the monster won't even realize when the poison paralyzed its brain and killed it. But then again I might be led into thinking that I have outwitted them, while they are outwitting me, to make me drop my guard and attack at the most opportune moment. 
but if I again outwit them by thinking that they think they have outwitted me, while I pretend to not notice and outwit them. I felt a crushing pain in my head. Why this endless cycle of outwitting others has to exist in the first place. Either one is a problem for me if they are hostile. But if I am able to explain them properly my situation then I can only be at an advantage. But if I try to face my problems head on then. This should totally work and it's not like I have anything precious on me to be stolen and following me around is going to lead us nowhere since I am myself lost. So. There is only one way to bring this loop to an end and that is Regis Escalon. Presently I am pursuing the invader along with ten other knights from the elite corps that serves directly under father. Leaping from tree to tree, the forest was our territory and we were confident with our ability to hide in it and use it to our advantage. While they are following the person in question, they are also keeping an eye on me. It could be that they might have been ordered by father to bring me back if anything goes wrong with this mission. But I don't care with whatever orders they have been given, I simply need to focus on the task at hand and successfully complete it. Only then I can prove that I am not useless and it would also serve as a test of my capabilities whether I can survive in the outside world or not. I am going to bring back the intruder and present them in front of my father. And if they are aggressive then I will take them down without any hesitation. Feeling a bit at odd as the other soldiers stared at me, I knew I was regarded as a malfunction from whom nothing could be expected, I had to show results of my hard work no matter what I have to go through and how much pain I have to endure. Pulling the hood of the green cap down on my face, stealing myself from their eyes, I pushed further to take a closer look on our intruder, only to be surprised to find a human girl by her body features about my height with medium sized straight black hairs going down to her shoulders. I could not take a proper look at her appearance because of the white mask which covered the top half of her face. It was rather strange to see someone in such bright exclusive special looking clothes I had never seen before and to wander alone, or, could be that she might be just a diversion and the real culprit is hiding nearby. I used my wind detection magic only to find nothing. For another point, I cannot seem to feel any strong kind of magic presence from her which would mean that she might not be tough to handle. Strangely there are no strong monsters in the vicinity which would usually be the case and I would take that as a good luck sign for me. Furthermore, I have a strange feeling that this human might already know that we have been following them, since she has been at times looking straight in our direction and maybe I even made an eye contact for once. But the elven knights are too proud to take that into account and consider it only a coincidence. I also cannot get a read on her movements that are quite strange, seeing that she has circled around the same route for a third time. Could it be that she is lost in this forest? But what business does a girl alone would have in the deepest parts of the demon continent? Humans are a species which we elves are mindful of, seeing that when some elves return to our homeland who have been freed from slavery, they are detestable species that make slaves out of their own people and even force and abduct other species and drag them into the bottom. Even the humans who live in the elven kingdom have to strictly abide by the elven laws and they are cut off from the outside till they decide to stay here. But even then I can't bring myself to accept that everyone is the same, not at least in my position. I can't rely on the knight's help and also because this is my personal mission which I will handle alone. Not that they would let me join in their plan because I can't use elven telepathy which should come naturally to all elves, but because of my strong affinity to destructive wind magic I have been an outcast and ostracized by most of them while they bad talk about me and I wouldn't even know about it. But that doesn't make a difference of what my priorities are and what must I do to become strong, that I wouldn't have to lose anything again nor feel inadequate. Suddenly, the human stopped moving and the elf knights at the back including me were on guard, but instead they had already readied their bows, on the contrary I decided to only carefully observe the target for now. Is she insane? I hissed to myself in utter shock. Out of all of my expectations she was waving her hands freely in the air, maybe as a gesture of greetings as she walked towards us, but that would be apparent only to me since the knights on the rear might consider it as a sign of releasing some kind of magical attack. Before I could warn them, bunch of magically enhanced arrows were launched from their bows. TCCH. I had to do something. Something and somehow prevent it. 
before she could have gotten hurt, but there was no escaping and if she might be innocent then I would only be able to blame myself. Not knowing when to act and realizing that it has already been too late has always been one of the biggest regrets of my life and it is just repeating itself in front of me again. Unexpectedly my mind went blank. Phew. Before I could think of anything further, my footing seemed to be off. As I seemed to have missed to inhale a single breath, I tried to curve my legs only to feel thin air as I was about to fall on the ground. In that moment I saw a black shine that made all the arrows disappear while the trees were cut down in half and the other soldiers met the same fate. But I was not done yet. I won't lose without knowing what actually struck me, and if I know that then I can absolutely win by forming a battle tactic. I tried to use wind magic forcefully to maintain the speed of my fall and at the last moment to turn around and hover over the ground. Impressive. You are still standing. I was dumbfounded to hear a voice that would have belonged to a young girl as I turned back to the source of sound. Should you really be impressed by your enemy who is going to capture you? I asked a quick question as I loaded my arrow on the bow, trying to take aim I fired at the hazy figure. How could I miss this close? I jeered, but the girl vanished right in front of me, too fast for me to even follow around with my eye, but something still did not fit right with the situation. I looked around and the soldiers were pinned to the ground unable to move, their bows and strings slashed in halves, while a strong sense of numbness clouded my body's movement. My arrows and bow almost felt weightless as I at least understood that using them further had no meaning. Who are you? I shouted, trying to pinpoint where she actually went into hiding. Me, I am Alicia. That voice this time came from up front. Astonishingly, she again appeared in front of me even knowing that I would attack her with the slightest chance appearing. But then something in me went berserk when she came close, her face lowered down, trying to see mine hidden under the hood. Get away from me. I screamed at her, pushing my right leg forcibly backward. I tried to manage and form a proper support for myself, as I thrust my bow forward to put a suitable distance between us. I wanted to push her away thinking that I would hurt someone again with this power if she touched me, but instead of making distance, she straightened up, a white closed fan in her hands, blocking my full powered bow swing midway like it had just been a gentle push. Out of frustration as a final warning I again let out a war cry, as I turned the direction of the bow and made it accelerate upwards, but it was dodged this time as she shifted to my right. I just want to talk, so... If you would please put that bow away. Even though I heard her words clearly, but I refused to understand the meaning of them maybe because of my own personal agenda, as I spin the bow in my hands to use it like a long pole in close quarter combat, I was about to land a menacing blow on her head but then the blades of the fan opened up with a metallic crackle and a gust of strong wind threw me backwards. Before I could stand up again to fight back, the sharp blades of the fan were close to my neck without realizing that my hood was off and my identity exposed. In that moment I took a proper look at her face, probably resembling to age close to mine, a faint smile surfaced on her cheeks, her mouth slightly open as if in surprise, but her red glowing eyes beneath that mask spoke otherwise the only thing I could think of was that my life was at her mercy. Alicia was Scallon Ashbourne. I always heard from great people speaking in books about how we need to face our problems head on and only then we can achieve our goals. And when I tried to do just that, even waving my hands in appreciation for coming to look after me themselves and saving me the hard work to find for them instead, I am ultimately rained by arrows that would have killed me on a first hit. Right. If only those great men were still alive I would have probably stormed their houses and sued them for their misguided teaching and for planning an attempt on my life. But now I have to even take care of this mess, that would make ten and another one close by. As I applied gravitational magic to restrain them and wind magic to break any harmful sharp objects they wanted to play around with. We can't have a peaceful talk with knives in our hand, now can we? but it seems that one of them is still able to resist as I saw a figure of almost same height as me still standing. I drew in closer to exchange a word of pleasantries and curious to see the face beneath that hood which covered only half of it. And if she turned out to be a girl it would make conversing easy for me. But things went quite differently as she got upset with me prying. 
I knew I was bad at socializing but not to that extent that they would try to kill me just for coming close, as if I had touched a special part of her that should not have been struck even under any special circumstance. I already knew being hammered around by a bow was not going to be a pleasant feeling so I decided to knock her unconscious too. Stop. A gentle and loud voice screamed inside of my head as the blades of my weapon fan stopped midway. Ow. Who was the one who called out to me just now? I was sure it was not one of those restrained people or her and I also cannot sense any other presence around. Unsuccessful to trace outside intervention. So, someone tried to contact me telepathically from the outside. Suddenly my eyes dropped lower as I saw long red hairs fluttering openly in the wind belonging to the girl I knocked down on the ground. She was had a tall figure while she wore a red cloth outfit with a lather girdle and long boots. Her slender yet fit figure was a sight for green-eyed jealous people, while I focused on the part which the hood covered before it fell off. She had long ears and a pretty face. Did I mention long ears, pointing outwards? though not to an extent I was expecting and yet they were long unlike mine, which no doubt implied she was one of the another world races. An elf. I was sure to meet them at some point but this is more than to call myself just lucky to just chance upon them. I took a closer look and realized that even the other pursuers under their hood were elves as I playfully pushed their hoods down with a little bit of wind magic. Why didn't I think of this before? A large forest with a large scale magic engraved over it. Such a masterpiece work could only have been owned up by none other than elves. I had just so many questions to ask. If I had to begin from somewhere then how about telling me that do they have problem while making their twirls straight? Doesn't their comb get stuck every time while combing their hairs in between the ears? Would they have preferred to use toothpaste or a chew stick twig to brush their teeth to propagate their close relationship with the nature propaganda? But then I processed the telepathic communication one of the pinned men received and understanding the merits of following them I finally decided to lift up the gravitational field magic. As I thought they were no more hostile against me anymore though they were passing unusual nevertheless suspicious looks at me. The elf girl had already pulled back by now while the others had made a defensive formation again. While one of them filled in the information to the elf girl and by his manners it made me think that it was possible for her to be a higher ranking person. Princess Regis, we have received direct orders from the forest silver maiden, to bring this human back to the royal palace. Wait, mother did that, but what has she to do with an unknown person like her? I can't think of anything. The elf girl harshly stomps on the ground and after crunching her teeth she started staring at me. Does she even realize that I can hear the whole conversation and why is she glaring at me so angrily? With the only option left for me to look the other way, even when I wanted to look at those long ears for much longer. The elf girl quietly walks towards me and without looking at me she spoke in a harsh tone. The elven kingdom will be taking you into custody now. Do you accept your crime of unlawfully entering the borders of this kingdom? But, as I said before, I am just lost, so I don't think any of those charges are valid on me. I didn't want it to become an unlawfully border crossing criminal without no good reason. This would have probably left a bad impression and then I wouldn't be able to learn much about these elves. Anyways, what was your name again? You can just call me Regis, I presume we are of almost same age. Did she really intentionally ignore what I had to say? On the contrary I was quite okay with knowing names as a start. After introductions, the guards and the girl called Regis escorted me to the royal castle, or as they described it to be. We walked almost for 30 minutes and the remaining time on a carriage we got on at the border gates, which was akin to a long, gigantic hall carved out of giant trees. During this whole time it was made sure that I did not realize the way to the royal castle from the border gate by covering the windows, not that it would have helped me either way, but since it was their job, I did not object, but would have appreciated the chance of sightseeing the kingdom. It seems that they use some kind of large terrestrial bird for man powering the carriage, but just putting up a small perception blocking barrier was not enough to block my analyze skill. How could I even miss to watch a supposedly another world kingdom for the first time when cramped in a small carriage with a bunch of soldier, 
and being taken to a castle on the pretext of being charged for infiltrating the kingdom's border. Beautiful houses in the shape of a tree, giant mushrooms with hanging rooms of peach shape, elves in leaves clothes, a landscape with a waterfall and a pristine blue river and long leaf-shaped boats floating over them. But on the contrary things did not look quite that right and that would also explain why the guards looked so frustrated. The land seemed to be mostly dry. There was nothing exciting about the place I was passing through, even the cluster of houses built around the trees most probably resembled like giant tree houses which I would have found either way in my previous world. I expanded my senses and realized that most part of the kingdom might have been going through a dark phase because of the lack of magic in the nature and the land. For a moment I wondered what the reason could be because only this specific part of the kingdom looked to be devastatingly affected while the forests surrounding it far away were still brimming with life. Obviously they wouldn't welcome an outsider like me during this kind of difficult situation. Either way if things become difficult for me to stay, I can just use teleportation magic and run far away. But for now it is the best choice to go with the flow, in order to learn more about the working of this world and to gather information about the whereabouts of Athena. I disconnected myself again and wondered why Regis had to alone board another carriage. I would have liked to know the reason from her, because she seemed to be easy going on me as well as kind. Also she had quite a special skill which caught my eye. I wonder why she didn't use it on me to attack. I will also ask for her forgiveness for attacking her respectively and I will do everything to know more about that skill and make it mine at the same time. I stared at the guards, who kept gawking at my mask. For a moment I thought whether they will brandish me as a traitor if I tried asking them about more information on this place. If I have to meet someone from the royal castle, then surely they can help me find a way to the human continent if I clear my name. It is also possible that if the person comes out to be a highly respected and resourceful individual then I can seek help to find out about Athena but no one helps another without something to pay first. So what if I am able to fix the condition of this place and solve its problem? But that would mean first I have to find the source of the problem and even Al cannot process any conclusion without more information except for the decreasing magic particles in the nature. But a huge source of this magic aura I can still feel coming from underground, but it's very unstable now. That could also prove to be the part of the reason of this entire predicament or more like an after effect. The carriage finally came to a halt. I felt tired more than I ever felt while finding my way through the forest. The castle was befitting of the title as the main center of an entire kingdom and the royal capital. Carved out of the hill's top and situated in the middle. I could have gotten a full view of the kingdom but a white dense fog prevented me from doing so naturally. The wind felt so fresh and the soothing smell of the flowers that grew around the perimeter surrounding walls caught my attention. We came across another castle gate, where the guards were surprised to look at me but they have somewhat their eyes tensed up to see Regis coming along too, and those were the eyes that I understood the best. When people start doubting your existence, for some reason I felt a bit frustrated and sad to see this happen all the time until in the hallway I was suddenly greeted by a young woman who still looked in the bloom of her youth. The guards suddenly stood straight, with their hands in some form of a symbol tucked to the middle of their chest they held their heads tight but tilted down a bit. Her green-hued eyes had a special charm to it and contrasted well with her lush pink lips, while her blonde hairs fell in curls down her back. Wearing a green straight gown and followed by two other elf attendants she first looked at Regis and then glanced at me. I am glad Regis you are back home safe, she said in a delightful voice. So, you are worried about me, mother? Regis replied in a tone as if she did not care but I could tell that it's not what she really wanted to tell by looking at her. She had a sad expression and did not try to speak facing her supposedly mother, directly. Why is it that we have to bring her, a human to the castle instead of being questioned and for initiating an investigation? Regis continued but was interrupted. I am sorry for my daughter's rudeness. You all may leave now. Can I please inquire your name? The one who comes from a faraway land and whose path is guided by the forest's spirits. The lady spoke in a gentle manner, while the guards soon left after bowing to her. 
and she was totally playing the part of being mysterious and her words pronounced of being a believer in occultism which made me excited for a bit. Though I already knew spirits and fairies existed because I had already made contact with them in the divine realm when Athena introduced them to me when we together visited the spirit lake in the Eleonora forest. I am Alicia. At least that's only what I can tell to people right now, since I have no other identity or meaning attached to it. I can't even give out my full name, but if I do remember, Mother is actually a half-elf by origin, so maybe I can find her relatives as well, and if they are hers relatives then they are mine too, but the fact remains that I still have to keep their identity a secret and so it's a no-go from my side. Miss Alicia, I am pleased to make your acquaintance. Please allow me to escort you to the King's Chambers. He will explain to you the situation well. Wait. Now Father wants to meet her. Why doesn't anyone ever tells me what is happening here? It was supposed to be my job and yet everyone seems to be only interfering in what I am doing and leaves me out alone. Dot dot nothing seems to be going right anymore. Saying that aloud Regis turned around and left quickly. No, one moved or spoke unless the loud footsteps had finally stopped. I too somewhat regretted for being inefficient in doing something but it was not my place to speak in between a family's issues. Ha. Huh? That girl is still in her rebellious stages. I would better have a proper talk with her later. I again apologize in turn for such a rude display of our daughter. Now if you would kindly follow me. I was for a moment dumbfounded by the fact that the king of this country was in fact Regis's father but her outburst almost seemed natural to me. In that order, the women in front of me, Regis's mother would be the queen of this kingdom. Wait, were my introduction even right? Did I properly address her and not break any taboo laws? Should I already plan my escape? But they seem to be so easy going people that I couldn't realize that until now. The fact that I was going to meet the king already sounded difficult enough but now things have become much awkward for me. Regis who is the princess of this kingdom. I couldn't begin to imagine with her being a part of royalty. Sure she is beautiful and has an endearing appearance, but for me she never fits in that role. And I even called her by her name, but she asked me to do it. So it's totally normal. It was now that I was noticing a wooden tiara encircling on Regis' mother's head that almost looked petrified into white color and glimmered in the light which the light orbs hanging on the walls showered on it. I quietly followed her through long hallways each decorated beautifully by flower ornaments as I wondered whether a plant which bears pearl flowers would exist in their knowledge. But my thoughts were more constrained by the fact of how I should behave in front of the king and now I know that the woman in front of me is in fact the queen of this kingdom. Should I start speaking to her more respectfully or keep up with the same tone? Is it even in permissible value? What if the king is short-tempered unlike her and would brandish me as a criminal or worst of all pass capital punishment and behead me? For a kid like me born and grew up in a democratic world. How would I ever know of social etiquettes in a king's palace? Beyond a huge gate with a circular arc, two guards pushed it open as soon as they saw the queen coming. She nodded her head and the guards closed the gate and left. Bit by bit I was beginning to understand that what I was going to go through should be of confidential nature and I would be expected to maintain secrecy too. Otherwise for a second I felt my own hand on my neck out of fear. The king stood beside a golden chair with curled armrest and an adjustable backside, which can be lowered to an extent of being completely horizontal. He was looking through the window and I think you could get a plentiful look of the kingdom if someone with a maxed out appraisal skill tried to. The king finally turned around, carrying himself with an air of dignity despite the contracted muscles on his cheeks depicting anxiety and worldly worries of maybe growing old. No. That can't be royal elves are supposedly high elves who are known to be the one of the longest living race in this world. The king had a gentle expression which reflected in how peaceful and sober it looked at the same time. The light reflected on the walls and the beautiful ceiling. The pleasant smell that the wind brought from the outside growing flowers all were in harmony. His tall build. And yet how thin he appeared to be with loose and decorated robe did not hide the fact that I should be wary of him. Not because he possesses brilliant magic or some kind of exceptional physical augmentation skill, but this is the first time I am seeing someone with a maxed out analysis skill and another rare skill investigation at its peak. 
at present though this mask might have succeeded in hiding my real appearance but there is no doubt that this high elf can probably see my capabilities and my magical aura. As the king of Escalon, I apologize for bringing you here human girl without passing on to you any information, but I am sure you understand that it is the nature of the information that demands me to use such makeshift methods to deal with it. His tone was gentle and yet he tried to be on guard against any kind of mental attack I should have been capable of exerting on others. Miss Alicia please be at ease, we already know that you harbor no ill intention against us and our kingdom, it would be an honor to tend to the one guided by the forest's spirits as our guest, said the queen, well I did feel a bit relaxed after hearing that but still her words had made me curious, as far as I remember I was guided by the stick, I mean by my own deductive reasoning, so, what is the story or should I say the catch behind it, I am sure you must be aware of the situation by now and the danger the kingdom is in, said the king sounding a bit hoarse as if he blamed himself for it about what was going on or he considered himself insufficient to relieve the situation and I could surely see that concern, not because I had experience with it, but since further taught me everything to know about resolving political issues in this world since I inherited the royal demon's family crest. But before I could say anything, another man in the room who wore thick robes and a heavy long white cloth around his neck, his age almost reaching the limits of hitting old age, probably some kind of high post minister at the court. I am sorry I don't follow your highness but you would be mistaken since we made sure nothing was revealed, and it would be wise to rethink before revealing the internal affairs of the kingdom to an outsider. He sounded a bit despondent himself, it's all right I am sure our little guest already knows half of what is going on, it would be foolish to underestimate her at this point of time, with how things are standing. The minister was surely taken aback with such a high remark for me, but me who was instead of being happy still felt that he saw me only as a kid, I am not sure what exactly are you telling, but even if I did, what has anything of that to do with me? I said confidently, but in actual I was scared from inside because, if I accepted of what I did by breaking rules then I will be declared a criminal, so I tried to look confident and throw back the question at him quite intelligent of me if I say so myself, pardon me, Miss Alicia, but let me explain the full situation to you, I looked at the queen who was now intently looking at me but she had eyes filled with it of being specifically attracted towards me, like how I used to be when I saw a newly launched game on sale, has it to do something with your title silver maiden, I said casually in the flow of the conversation, impressive, the queen was amazed and so did the king, to the extent he seemed as if he was expecting this. On the other hand the minister whispered to himself, but how? As if this was another of their kingdom's secret. Now I could hear my own teeth clattering against each other, as I repeated the word in my mind again, a secret, probably a top level state secret, to be protected at any cost. Even on the outside I tried to show myself as relaxed as I could be to maintain that strong position in the room, but from the inside I was screaming upon myself for opening my mouth unnecessarily and raising flags for myself. I already knew I was bad at playing Minesweeper from the first time I was introduced to the game because I would set off the bomb every time on my first try, but I still hadn't learned my lesson and went and stepped on it anyway. If I ended up knowing too much then they would surely not let me go off easy. I chuckled uncomfortably and scratching the side of my head showed that I was ready to hear. It all started a year ago, when suddenly our harvests dropped. The rivers flowing into our kingdoms started losing water level to the extent that they are almost getting dry now. Magic from the Kodra veins flowing below the ground that supplies the world with its raw magic supply has been unstable and drastically decreasing since then. Soon dragon attacks on our kingdom increased at an alarming rate, leaving our resources and manpower unsatisfactory. With only a handful of soldiers left to mobilize we send them to the Dragon Island for further investigation, but no reply has came since then. I am afraid to say but the unspeakable might have brought down our soldiers. The king stopped speaking as if he didn't want it to continue any further after speaking about how he lost a great number of his people on a military scout mission. He glanced at his wife who then continued with his narration, slowly losing all the magic from the land, the forest was harshly struck. 
The forest spirits did everything to maintain the ecosystem but ultimately all of them failed to stop the change. Below the kingdom of elves lies the world's largest tree, the tree of Genesis and as its sole mediator who hears the revelation of the great spirits. But I couldn't contact them because the dryads and fairies that guards her closed the gates of leading to the Genesis tree. But today I finally heard the voice of the great spirit, and it said to me to guide the human to the dragon island. And just then you appeared and now we definitely know that the revelation is about you. I was left in awe and with so many questions. Why send the human to the dragon island? And how someone knows that human must be me? Is someone keeping an eye on me? And then I suddenly remembered hearing that voice which asked me to stop. It might have to do something with it or I can be entirely wrong. It was like a quest on an adventure mission and the more the plane the mission looked the more twisted the results would prove to be. On the other hand I was already on a quest to the human continent with my personal mission, but even though I have not been making any progress rather than landing at random places but it's not like I disliked that either, but I needed a definite plan. What I really needed at this point of time is, so, in return I would be needing a guide to show me the way to the Dragon Island, if you really think I am the person you need. I said profoundly, imagining who my partner could be. Maybe an elf who specializes in archaeology wearing a brown outfit with a sand chrome hat and always holding a shovel in his hand with maps tucked under his arms, or an elf who specializes in astronomy reading stars under a full moon night sky and could tell the right direction of the place just by looking, how amazing that is. The king and the queen were deep in thought while the minster seemed to be going through the records in search for an appropriate companion to take me to the Dragon Island, but before their search could finish our meeting was interrupted by a sudden, bang sound, as the door was shoved away from its place and knocked down to the ground over which Regis lied flat, her face stuck on the door as she had hit her nose hard, evident from the puffed up redness that had surfaced, but she did not seem to mind the pain as she stood up fast and pretending nothing had happened she casually walked to the king but stood at a later distance away from him, her eyes staring directly into his pupils, Father, I will be the one to take her to the Dragon Island, Regis said proudly and almost incessantly as if not understanding the gravity of what she did or what she was asking for, rather I already knew that she was at the door, eavesdropping but I didn't say anything because I did not mind letting her listen to us. But for her to volunteer herself, I was overjoyed for some reason, as if I wanted to be in her company. But then looking at the troubled looks on the king's and queen's or rather the worried look on her father's and mother's face made me rethink my choice. I stayed quite with my head down unable to muster the appropriate words for the situation. Regis on the other hand understood the meaning of the silence in the room. Her head dropped down. I could feel her magic going out of hand as the door under her feet which had already been crunched into circles to some extent because of her touch and skill was now decimated to pieces. Why do you both always choose to stay quiet? Regis screamed, pushing her hand in frustration a strong wind broke the glass window and turned the room into topsy-turvy. She paused for a second there realizing what she had done, but instead of going for a breath to calm herself she yelled again, all I ever wanted was for you two to share your troubles with me. Even when everyone doesn't want me around or doesn't want to associate with me, you two always showed up whenever I needed you, I was fine with that much, I didn't need anyone else, but as time passes by seeing you so much worried, you refuse to share it with me even when I asked. So I worked hard thinking that one day I will get a chance when you would be proud of me. And now when I learn the reason, you still don't allow me to be the part of it. And even if I fail right now or something would happen to me, no one would really mind now, would they? Regis, how can you say that to your mother? Regis's mother words got tangled up in the end overwhelmed by her daughter's proclamation she broke in tears. The king holding the queen's shoulders sternly looked at Regis, his face was hardened, unlike the one I had met a while ago as a gentleman, little girl I have heard enough of your arrogant demands. This not your place to decide right now what you should be doing with your life, your parents care about you that's why we keep you out of trouble. Regis go back to your room and think what about you have done and what you are going to do after this, 
for now you are not to leave the castle no matter what circumstance comes up until I grant you permission. Creek reaches without putting much force on the broken door tried to step down, but could not avoid the creaking voice that had disbanded the pin drop silence in the room. Without uttering another word she left the room, while I just stood as a bystander again in all of this as I saw her tears moisten the floor. This time I had a new realization, a thought that had never crossed my mind. And in the moment it did, no matter what, I wanted to achieve it. With no one to judge me or look after me I still wanted to do it. Even if I am left alone for a moment, I wondered what kind of relationship I would have had if my parents were still alive in the previous world. Would they have been proud of me, with what I was doing now and hesitating to help? Or would they have been okay with me seeing a friend cry? A fried. Is she my friend? We haven't really talked that much except for names. But we did fight, without anyone getting hurt and because of that I know her better than anyone else I know around. I think I failed to realize again such a simple thing, that the moment we met I wanted to be friends with her. I just cannot ask for people to come to me and make me their friend. Maybe sometimes I have to start things on my own. It seems that you again had to witness an embarrassing situation of our family squabbles. So, why don't we put off this discussion for now? The maids outside will show you the room we have prepared for you. I hope that you will find our elven tradition hospitality to your liking. I will give you my reply on the decision soon. The next time we meet. Saying that I quickly left the room. I think at least with this I am getting pretty good at reading a room now. The only people that remained in the room were now the king, the queen and the personal advisory minister. After a moment of silence the minister spoke of his doubts. Your majesty is it alright to put the future of our kingdom in that young human girl's hands? She has whatsoever no relation to the human continent and by looks of it seemed to be aloof of this world's common sense. I think we should still consider other options first as a precaution, even if it was a revelation from the great spirit. His voices did not have any distortion and he had placed all his evaluation in determining the optimal solution for the crisis. If the kingdom was still holding well and not largely affected by this pandemic then it was due to the wits of this old man who had dedicated his body and soul to the betterment of this kingdom. No other was befit of the position he was holding and his doubts were most viable. But that's where the king's love for his country rises above his subjects and his decision binds the prosperous future of the country to the present by learning from the past. Tell me do you even know what it means when a strange person knocks at your door at the most wrong time and you don't even have a clue who that person is or where they are from? I have a fair share of dealing with the world's strongest people myself and now I am more than experienced enough to just look and tell when a powerhouse crawls into my home. It is imperative at this time that we decide whether this person is a foe or an ally. Well either one is a problem. The appearance of strong and powerful is always a forewarning of a big looming danger in the future and no one can escape that fate. As a survivor of the Great War myself no one would better understand than me. In this time, we must do everything to maintain peace and order in this country by establishing connections with people who can upturn the worst tides by a flick of finger. I may not understand well, but now that I remember you were rather close to your elder sister. The minister said while pulling his beard, don't remind me of that time. All I have is bad memories of her when in the name of playing with me she would take us to the forest and use me as a bait to bring out monsters and practice her swordsmanship. Either way this world is finally safe because of the great sacrifice the true hero, your elder sister made during the great war and we will be ever grateful to her. Well if only that were true. The king stopped before he could finish his sentence and choked on his own words. Why don't we just forget we ever had this chat? Allow me to take my leave your majesty. The king nodded and the minster left for making preparations to get the room fixed which Regis destroyed a while ago. Regis's father, the king putting the hand on his table while resting his whole body weight over it, took a deep breath, taking off his crown from the head. He took a quick look at his crown and lightly threw it on a chair as it willfully landed on the soft cushion that covered the stiff wooden seat. The weight of the crown did not even disfigure the fluffiness of the cushion a bit and yet it weighed so heavy on the head of the person who wore it. That's not what I really wanted to say to her. 
The king tiredly spoke. The queen got closer to him while rubbing his back and shoulder. She smiled at him, while wiping off her own tears which had again welled up. It's all right dear, Regis is young and our child. She will one day surely understand. Is this position of a king really that difficult to put the family on one side and the kingdom's people and future on the other? I wanted to hug her and say that it wasn't true and that she was precious to us more than anything in this world. Is it really difficult to communicate such feelings today, that we both end up suffering? For me at least you are my husband first and then my king and the same is true for Regis and the fact you are his ever doting further would never change. Just so you know your family loves you and no matter how difficult the situation we find ourselves in we can easily overcome it together. I am sure you are right. The king finally found comfort in the embrace of his queen. By the way. I never thought you were going to blurt out the secret of the Escalon family so easily. Well I might just be the lucky one to end up knowing about it. I still remember the day, when elder sister contacted me over the transmission magic amulet out of the blue when she gave birth to her daughter, she was so happy, and you just happened to walk in the communication chamber that day, and she is such a wonderful person to think that she had to go through so much and live in isolation just for the peace of this world and for the war to finally come to an end. Damn you elder sister, always showing your charming and heroic personality to others and now we have another victim here now. Either way I would like to hear from her soon. The queen grinned, I am sure she is doing just fine even right now wherever she is, because she too has got her own family to look after all. Regis Escalon. Taking a deep breath my back slowly slid downwards on the pillar only to fall down after my legs gave way and pain took over my body. When the skill activated on itself and I had to forcefully suppress it, I stormed in father's work and said such horrible things. That's not what I really wanted to say. Not at all. I whispered to myself. All I wanted was a chance for them to trust me. The one with whom the entire fault lies is me. To think that I would even make my own mother cry. I ruined everything. How am I ever going to face them again? Is there even a way to fix things and turn it back to how it was before? What would that human girl think of me? What was her name again? Alicia, she herself said. Even though she might be strong or whatever revelation might have brought her here, the one who should really be helping out my parents is me. I will be the one to lessen their burden and finally they will see me as their equal, and we can be finally again together. Why am I worrying about what she thinks of me? Her perspective is none of my concern. At least for now, I will also set out to adventure the outside world and learn how to use this power at my own will and then help my family and kingdom in every possible way I can. I took notice of a figure passing me a stare eye from behind the pillar. Is she really an idiot or just that oblivious? I rose up from the place and started walking, because I had enough of her. Step dot dot step, step, but I heard another set of footsteps repeating again. Step dot dot step dot dot step. I quickened my pace. Step dot step dot step, and so did the footsteps following behind me. Step dot step dot step. This time I pretended to. Step. Step. Stop suddenly while behind me followed. Step dot step dot step. Caught you. So you really were following me. I said turning back around to the human girl. Alicia whom I recently brought to the palace. Hugh. Her late response and startled face made it look to me like. How could I have spotted her so easily? Out with it. Why are you following me? I asked her. She stared at the blank hair for a moment as if intentionally trying to come up with an excuse. You see. We just happened to go along the same way. Well that's an excuse which works for your first time, alone. Fine then, now go back to where you are supposed to be. Saying that I started walking again. Step, step, step. Step dot step dot step, 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 step. Step dot step dot step. She followed. Is there something you want with me? I said without turning back. Nothing, I am just sightseeing. Then you are in the wrong part of the castle to look because this place has nothing good to see. Ask any of the servants and they would be happy to be your guide. But I want you to be the one. She whispered. What did you say? 
again, just that the plant growing on the walls looks great. Just so you know that's not an art, it's just simple grass. This part of the palace is not regularly renovated and so plants might grow sometime if you leave it neglected. Usually I take care of the cleaning myself, but recently. Why am I the one telling her all of this? I thought to myself, oh is that so? Then how about? Alicia started turned her head around the hallway. But this part of the castle was really dull indeed as she had described. Could it be that you are lost again? No, not exactly. Alicia's face started sweating as her cheeks became red with embarrassment. Who? Huh? For a moment there I could not help but laugh, and when I looked at her she started laughing with a faint smile too. I found it so charming and wondered how she looked under the mask. Why is she hiding it? Well travelers do usually tend to keep their identity a secret. But a mask is quite an outdated means now. Is there something funny about you getting lost every time? I asked her with a serious face. If she is in a foreign place, then she should just ask someone. Wait, could it be that she came to ask from me? But after watching me like that and my power going berserk on its own, why would she still approach me? I am dangerous and that's all to it. No one would like to associate with someone like me anyways. Come with me. I will take you back to your room after some time. Amu. Um, she gladly said, with a childish voice. Now I was feeling a bit awkward for being so harsh, when all she has been was nice to me, even when I was the one to attack her first. We went straight and after taking a right, came to the only room in that hallway, and beyond the door was my huge extra spacious room. I passed her an entry and she did not seem to be surprised by how huge my room was or otherwise people would usually be amazed to see how huge the royal palace is. Could it be that she is someone who has experienced these things before? It was already getting dark outside, and I didn't know why I even brought her to my room, while I was supposed to escort her to her own. Since she is here, why don't I have a talk and try to get some information out from her? She would have surely got something special to tell me if she has been traveling, and maybe I can learn something from her experience. Except for her navigation issues. It's getting late. Do you want me to get us something to eat? I am fine by it if you join me too. All right I will do. But I am going to decide the menu and get you the best dish the chef can cook for us. I was delighted to share my meal, finally with someone other than my family. I went to the door to ask the workers of the palace, to get the food ready, but soon, things became quiet again, as I realized she is not a smooth talker herself. I would find her sometimes gazing at my ears and I felt a bit insecure, but I was saved when the food came in, and we had a table set up for the two of us in the room itself. I asked the maids to leave and they did so gladly. No. Surprise there, did you like the food? I asked after we have started with the dinner. Yes, it's great. I have never known of the ingredients used in this food before. Well, they are only exclusively available in the Elf Kingdom and you will find them nowhere else on the entire continent. I said proudly, I was having fun talking to her. So, why won't you help me later to get some of these ingredients, Princess? Alicia's words stuttered in the end. Just call me Regis as I said before. Okay Regis. She said with a bright smile on her face. As if the whole point of saying something like that was to make me say this in turn. It made me feel uncomfortable, because this was my first time when I was having fun with a person I have never known before. Alicia why don't you tell me more about yourself? Well there is nothing more I can tell except that that is my name. She said casually, then tell me why do you wear that mask? I was interested to know at least that much, does she even take it off or not? Well it was conveniently made that anyone could eat food without worrying of wearing the mask or not. I do it because this was a gift from my mother and I need to keep my identity a secret, so that I don't end up in a problem. Well, I can already see it happening, so I will stop asking about that. But do you really plan to go to the Dragon Island? I was now getting serious and wanted to know firsthand of her intentions. I haven't decided yet, but if you accompany me as you willingly offered, then surely I can think of something. Alicia smiled pointing her spoon up in the air. Tell me, don't you want to know why everyone avoids me? I said in a saddened tone, 
I could not understand how she could even say that after what she saw and heard. Is it because you cannot control your skill? Well I saw you destroying the door before. I wanted you to use that skill against me during the small exchange we had for the first meeting. Are you even in your right mind? I said standing up from the chair. How can you even say that? Suddenly the table started vibrating. And without me realizing the wind in the room had already formed a destructive current as the things inside it started shaking devastatingly. We just calmed down. I heard a deep voice from Alicia which was her own voice but it did not carry the same childish attitude from before. The red color in her eyes was glowing and the strong wind currents in the room dispersed in a second and the table stopped shaking. You saw that now, whatever I touch gets destroyed. Even you aren't safe around me, so you shouldn't be with someone like me. I wanted to know how she sought to me and even if the answer was a negative, I was prepared to face it. Regis do you in any way feel like hurting me? No, not at all. Why would I ever do that? Then, it's that simple. There is nothing for me to be afraid of, is there? You weren't even trying to harm me for the first time we met. Alicia put another bite of the stew as she chewed on it later for some time and overjoyed by the outburst of tastes she felt in her mouth. I see that now. You are a very good person. So, why don't we go together to the Dragon Island as you said and even if it is going to be a difficult journey, I am sure we both will be doing just great. But I think my face receded to a grim expression. No matter what good things I say. Yes, so you finally understand. Alicia cheerfully said and we were almost finished with the dinner. Alicia why don't you stay the night here? The room's big enough for the two of us and if you are fine with sleeping on the ends of the bed, I am all right with it. Alicia sat on one side of the bed after I brought out another pair of bed sheet and pillow for her from the drawer. Before going to sleep why don't you try the milkshake I recently learned to make? It's quite refreshing. I will. But will you really make one for me? Alicia gave yes to my offer, why don't you just wait here while I get the glass ready. I walked to the other corner of the room where under the table drawer I was sure to find a set of glasses. I brought out a cold bottle of milk and other ingredients that I had prepared beforehand to add, specifically the one I wanted to use, but I needed to do it discreetly from her as I hid the sachet properly after emptying it. Here is yours. Alicia took the glass from my hand and I made sure that she emptied the glass. After making sure she went to rest, I made an excuse to go outside. After five minutes, I returned back to the room, only to find her deep in sleep. Sorry Alicia, it seems that you are too good a person to be with me. I said that you shouldn't stay with me but honestly it's because I already know that it's me who has no right to. I need to take care of this myself and I don't want you to risk your life in my meaningless endeavor, but it's something I will do and not rest until it's done, because otherwise there would be no point of the life I have lived. Thank you for saying what you said before. I looked at the face of Alicia trying to imagine a kind of face that could hold such beautiful smile that would even make my heart open to her. I brought my hands almost close to her mask, but I could not feel like betraying her anymore. After what I have done, I was not worthy of her trust. I left the room quickly, because I wouldn't have been able to restrain myself. Those strong sleeping drug in high dose would be more than enough to put her to sleep for an entire week and no magic would work, because this drug repels magic. I would usually take it in very small doses if I failed to control my power during training. It was time for me to leave the castle. I did not want to back down from what I had decided no matter dot dot even if the people who cared about me would start hating me. I wouldn't mind, but now I don't want to live in the protective shadow of my parents anymore even if it means clashing with the tsunami itself. Even if it destroys me, Dragon Island, one year ago, it was close to midnight, a white moon floated high in the sky, but the sea that enveloped the landmass below reflected a cold light. Gwaha. A huge roar shearing through the atmosphere as if proclaiming the beginning of the end of the world itself echoed in the Pacific vastness of the water bodies surrounding it. Brown, black, purple, a change of colors one didn't usually see. The color of the sky strangely but surely kept on changing. The only thing was clear that it was not a natural phenomenon. 
No one for sure could know what this abnormal sky heralded unless lightning froze the sky and two figures squaring off against each other decimated the blue. A monster with green spikes and almost akin to an alligator's skin sprawled in the sky with its huge bony wings spread far, wearing a black armor around its long neck and abdomen, with sharp covering spikes and bolts penetrating its skin down from its spine to its long tail's very end. This was the ruler of the cursed night sky Auroboros. On the other side, where magic in vast quantity pooled in itself, a wide mouth breathed it in in the next second releasing it out with full force massive flames of fire almost burning the emptiness of the sky to oblivion, a power and fire force that could rival even the depths of the sun, a huge black body with wide outspread wings that blotted the entire sky, a culmination of power, fire, pride and madness. That being was an existence that was born from outside the rules of this world, the ruler of dragons the Black Emperor Dragon. The black dragon repeatedly warded off the huge green dragon's blows, repelled its blows and occasionally blocked its blows but no harm ever came to it or the island below which was its home, while the green dragon seemed to have been reaching its limit both on magic and the wounds it has received. The war cries of these two heavenly beasts fighting only brought disaster as massive tides flooded the small islands to disappearance, the land was hit with earthquakes and cyclones. The green dragon, Arabras, flew to a distant height in the sky while the black emperor watched it from below with a menacing glare from its golden eyes. Wah! The green dragon opened its mouth broad in rage. A huge purple cube materialized and floated in front of it. Broken into even smaller cubes they started rotating in a circular fashion, which even created its own wind aft. The area it encircled turned purple and a humongous finger of light sped towards the ground enveloping it in its cruel impression. Everything annihilated the moment the light touched, swallowing everything as it expanded and ultimately the Black Emperor too couldn't escape the light. A single hit and its wings got severed. The mightiest dragon that walked this world was brought down to the bottom of the land from the zenith of the skies and submerged in its depths. Chapter 7 the girl WHO thought she can fight the world. I never thought it would be this embarrassing that I would fall asleep right after drinking the milkshake Regis offered to me. But after drinking something that's sweet and having myself to eat so many new kinds of dishes after a tiring journey I could not help but fall deep in sleep to experience my satisfaction at its peak. It's not like I needed to prevent myself from sleeping. I needed to relax after all a rested child grows well. Anyways, I am sure it's not because of the narcotic drug that Regis added to the drink, for the reason that it would have no effect on me. Though it's not like I appreciate a sedative being mixed in my drinks on a daily basis. My title, Immortality, negates all kinds of poisons and magic toxins if introduced into my body system. That would technically mean I will be always healthy and not getting usually sick as I used to be before I reincarnated, but it's totally another matter if I am physically attacked or sustain some kind of spiritual damage, since I am not immune to pain. And now she is gone, just like that. Why do I feel like this has happened before and that also for a third time? It makes me feel frustrated about how I'm always getting left behind and all alone. How unpleasant. I used wind magic to push away the long curtains that covered the only huge windows that let in the first rays of morning light. Fortunately I was early and it's still dawn. Except for the guards most of them would be still sleeping. Well I'm not angry about how I have to go out and always search for them. But because why they are the only ones to get the chance to break out in the night under the cover of darkness, when no one's watching. It sounds so cool than the kind of pesky job I have to do of stalking them, while making sure from a distance that they are safe is much more difficult and uninteresting. This will be the last time I am doing this because from next time I will not be the one preventing it but would be breaking out with them. After all I don't want to catch an odd habit of following girls around. Everyone knows that the more forbidden the thing is, the more stimulating it is. A problem for a runaway girl is no problem for me. Then there is probably another reason for my interest in Dragon Island. The Black Emperor Dragon. The servant beast that swore its loyalty to the royal demon family. 
I just can't bring myself to resist the urge of having a dragon formula race in this world and if I have his support then the dream would not be that far off to achieve. Even if it means using the family power for a little cause that is totally justified and in the right, which no one would mind in the least. If Regis would have been in danger then, Al would have probably informed me and she is not that far off from Al's navigation to not be able to keep track of her location, once she has been marked as long as the range permits. Now all I need to do is follow her around and I will be killing two flies with one swat. And if she is really planning to go alone, then maybe it's best for me to join her later, probably when she would find herself in danger. For now it's payback time, for what she did to me. Since I will be enjoying myself in this room after she went through the trouble of leaving me alone, I am going to read all the books in this room and much better if I find a secret diary, not to forget that I can have a personal bath all to myself. Surely being a princess of a kingdom she would have lots of things to enjoy and I can keep myself entertained until then. Regis Escalon. A full night has passed and I had still not made it to the northwestern coast after running at full speed with accelerated wind magic. Though it does put a toll on my body to restrain myself from releasing excessive magic in the way I want to. But otherwise I would ruin everything in my path and that would attract monsters from all around. Not that it is helping presently. I thought to myself after shooting down another magical beast with my arrow that wouldn't have been a fatal hit, except to slow it down. The arrow pierced its abdomen, not that deep but surely it will put a damper on its speed. These types of beasts have never been spotted in the elf kingdom and seem to be coming from the direction in which the dragon island is. If they have been changing hunting grounds then there is surely something up there going on. All I need to do is find it and if possible deal with the problem myself. I have once visited the western coast before with father when I was a little kid, and had been told that if I travel straight in that particular direction where the gigantic clouds seems to gather above a tower-like mountain then that will be the Dragon Island. As for the plan I have come to think of is to maintain secrecy, infiltrate the Dragon Island and after ascertaining the situation there I would return to the kingdom with a report. Even if it means that now I won't be welcomed by anyone there and after what I did to her, I will be more than happy to leave the kingdom on my own accord. That would certainly free them from a burden and a disobedient daughter like me. For some reason I could not think lest any further and it made the inside of my neck hurt, the more I try to think of staying away from my family. Since I have been traveling alone I can maintain discretion and find an escape route easily while avoiding dangerous monsters, but surely the militia that was sent here would have attracted tons of it, that would have surely spelled their destruction since they wouldn't be agile enough to avoid them but had to fight their way through them only to dwindle in their numbers. For now I don't think I am that far off from the coast and just some few hours more before I reach there. Just a little bit more. I have to endure it until I complete the mission myself. The only person who I need is myself and I won't be hurting anyone anymore. After a few hit and run tactic, I was slowly running both out of magic and roots that would help me avoid the monsters. According to my wind search magic, also there were monsters approaching me from everywhere. It couldn't have gotten worse when the sky was dubbed with the screams of an enormous magical beast I never have even heard of. This couldn't have gotten worse. Within the next few seconds the morning sky was blotted black by the huge black feather wings of a flying magical beast. Kaiawak. Letting out its ferocious scream it let its carnivore instinct leak in the surroundings. The land monsters have already diverted themselves from their paths but it was already too late for me to understand the reasoning behind being afraid of just one. Kaiawak. The cries of the birds kept on increasing both in intensity and figures, until more than dozens had now made their appearance. Their claws were already huge and looked strong enough to crush a giant boulder. It was high time for me to take cover unless I wanted to become their food. I took shelter in the branches under the cover of trees, waiting for them to leave. But instead of leaving they started circling directly above me in rounds. Was I already spotted? I kept on repeating that question to myself as a cold chill went down my spine. Another screams from those magical beasts and more of their brethrens came pouring in like there was soon going to be a feast. I needed to hold my grounds strong. 
If I don't take down the beast that is sending the calling signal, then I would be soon found out and overwhelmed by their numbers. But fighting one alone would be difficult enough in my weak and tired state. Should I turn back now? If I still go back home and ask for everyone's forgiveness. But even if my parents forgive me, will she do the same for me too? She was ready to spend some time with me, and yet that's how I paid her back for her kindness. There is no turning back for me anymore because I had closed all the gates myself. I punched the bark of the tree as if to force the anger out of myself and decided that I had to move forward no matter what I had to face. I jumped out of the tree facing upwards as I launched an arrow and avoiding all the other monster birds surrounding. It splashed open the artery of the bird flying at the highest point and calling the others. Thud. And with a vanishing scream it landed on the floor, blood spewing out of its neck its body writhing in pain as slowly death engulfed and silenced its soul. I rolled on the ground to avoid the impact of the decent and hid under the next adjacent tree and simultaneously securing my location I launched more of the arrows. The quiver in which I kept my arrows was actually a magic device enchanted with a special dimensional storage. To store more than enough arrows I would need on this journey. So, I decided to shoot without holding myself back, even if some of my attacks missed. But surprisingly my training paid off, as each arrow successfully took down its prey one by one. I kept on changing positions so that they remained disarrayed and couldn't pinpoint and pick up on me in groups. The rest would depend on my skill to survive against these monsters and how strong I have become. Usually it took more than five arrows to either defeat or shoo them off, but the numbers were still against me, as one of them even after taking the hit finally decided to chase after. It was not afraid of death and seemed more attached to the sentiment of killing me. I jumped off from the tree and made landing in the middle open surrounded by a corpse or two. The impact on the tree was strong enough to uproot it as I saw one of the pointy branches piercing it through the middle. What a foolish thing to do. I don't know why I said that. As I stared at my hands which were shaking since I have been repeatedly launching arrows and not using magic has been a downfall on my side. But if I tried doing so then my bow would break and I would be weaponless after that point. In that second letting myself lost in thoughts, one of the corpses near my leg opened its mouth wide and grabbing my leg it threw me upwards. I lost my balance and support as I was sky high now and below me the monster bird opened its mouth wide. On a quick look I instantly recognized it as the first monster that I shot in the group and somehow it was still alive waiting for the opportune moment to take revenge on me. Within seconds I would have been swallowed in one gulp, but I was not ready to die yet. Holding my bow in horizontal I docked it in between the two wide flanks of its mouth. I thought I could jump on the bow and escape with that. But the force of the mouth shattered the wooden framework and I found myself sinking, desperately trying to grab hold of something for help, but there was nothing to reach just like the last time. My eyes closed and the magic power inside my body ran wild, my hands scratched on its neck and the next moment a gale of wind overtaking my body resembling like a ghastly miracle of hell. The entrails of the monster were crushed inside its body as its body twisted and churned around itself like a merry-go-round playing endlessly sped up. Years of worth of power that I held back let loose in a moment a girl who didn't know her place, succumbed to the unwanted stares of others felt all of it at the same time. A terribly revolting feeling made my vision go hazy as I saw my dress and body drenched in blood. My face my eyes and every inch on my hands was overflowing with blood. Even the monsters were shrieking in fears that were flying in front of me horrified by the fate their fellow monster met. All it took a single touch for me to destroy something completely. I wanted to scream. I wanted for someone to show up but the world just felt so alone and cold. That except for me there was no one. No one to judge me. No one to watch me. No one to care for me and neither I had to do it in return. I was terrified. The world I wanted, how it should have existed for me was there and it rose in my throat. Would I feel better if I threw up? I covered my mouth and fell into panic. Why was I still hiding it now? Questions directed towards me. Why was I born like this? Why do I have this power? What did I want to do with it? Were echoing in my head. Eh? Ah. No. Sorry, I am sorry. Leave me alone. 
I murmured to myself. I started running for my life before more of them could attack me and went and hid myself in the bushes. Remaining low I again looked at my hands still shaking in fear. But what was I really afraid of this time I could not comprehend that myself. If only I knew, then I could stop thinking of it and then maybe I could have stopped shaking. Well, that will surely need some cleaning. I heard a familiar voice, even if it was so new to me. It was so sweet and young that I just couldn't make myself forget about it even in this awful state of mine. Turning my head to my right, I saw a face I was just recently introduced to. She had placed one of her finger on her closed mouth. She gave a lonely smile from under the white mask. But as if I had seen a ghost, I screamed and hastily jumped back. My hands touched the tree beside me and it shattered as all the leaves wilted and shredded into the falling tears of the tree. Wah! I screamed again as I blew up my cover and let the monsters knew of my whereabouts. I thought it was my final moments, and seeing her face for the last time was going to be my final punishment like this for me. I had tried everything but found no meaning in my existence. A befitting end for the fool who thought she could fight against the whole world would brazenly die in this place she herself never knew of. But picking up on the ghostly new appearance and by her action she was every bit of real, as she rose up from her place. I asked you to be quiet, didn't I? Or am I using a wrong hand sign to do that? I again heard her voice as this time her lips broke into a smile. She glanced at the horde of monsters speeding themselves towards me as they would devour us. My eyes shut down and after realizing nothing had happened I opened them again and saw bubbles of blood bursting into a small red downpour. It was horrific, but I had just witnessed and caused one myself a while ago. But this was something on another scale. So, who did this? If not me, then otherwise. I turned towards Alicia, who showed up out of nowhere. She looked at the swirling fountain of blood and burst out flesh of the corpses of dozen of monsters like it was nothing, the glow in her red eyes, slowly went dim and she looked at me again without any emotions. My body shuddered as I fell on my back and lifting myself up, I started moving on my fore, I was unsteady and fell down again. Stay away dot stay away from me. I shrieked. The earth and the environment around me were being churned and I could feel its after effects as my skin itself was getting dissolved in it. Probably my skill was reacting out of fear and slowly it would engulf me too. Regis calm down. I again found myself gazing at those clear and precise eyes as they tried to pierce me from within. And just like that my body became stable. My shaking stopped and I was able to think clearly again. The first question that popped in my mind was how she was still here. Did she not ingest the drink? But I clearly saw her drinking it and falling under sleep. Alicia, I, I couldn't follow up with what I wanted to say. I had nothing left on me. An apology as if that would work. After all, just now I was afraid of her. I treated her just like others used to see me in the same light as that of a monster. Because I cannot control my power but she can. And why did my own power stop reacting? Was it her too? Let's keep moving to our destination. Alicia said to me as she placed forward her hand in front of me to lift me up, as if naturally it would come to me. My own palm approached to grab her but before it made contact I backed it off. Clasps. Alicia's hand leapt forward and grabbed mine without any hesitation. Hands which were drenched in blood would surely leave marks on her white gloves which covered her palm leaving her thin and gentle fingers bare. My eyes closed like a dim-witted person. I thought everything was over, that I was already dead and it was but a dream. See everything is fine. I first opened my right eye to see Alicia's face and the left eye focused on the handshake. And somehow I was standing properly on my feet too. The corpses of the monsters but had all vanished while I could still see some blood stains making me realize that it was everything except for a dream. Don't you have to say something to me first? Alicia asked to my dejected face. Why are you here? Shouldn't you be? I saw her cheeks tightening as if she was a bit annoyed. I soon realized my mistake. I am sorry for what I did. But how are you? Well you see poison and toxins don't affect me so I woke up after having a good nap. Alicia said as if she was pleased with herself. And for how long have you been following me? I asked with a neck filled with stagnant air. 
My voice felt a bit on the heavier side. Well it has been quite a while, after I went through your room to enjoy myself, I realized that there was pretty much nothing to do. So I came right here, and was so thrilled to see you fight, that I decided not to interfere unless you really needed me to. Alicia sounded so delighted. But the ground from below me was shaken, I was most probably angry, as my cheeks twitched in a steadfast fashion. So you were having fun in my room. Is that it? Yet yeah, was way too empty and I did not even find a secret diary. Though I do have to say that I enjoyed the warm bath. Alicia lost herself in explaining what she did in her absence. So you were having all the fun around while I was fighting here huh? Alicia, I want you to go back home. I ended up with a stiff voice and serious tone. I wanted for her too to understand why I was doing all of this. But something told me that she didn't even in the very least. I won't. She said with a stern face. This is not a playground for children and you don't need to gamble your life with me. So go back to the palace and explain the situation to them. They would surely believe you since you were brought here by the great spirit's revelation. I don't care about any revelation I am coming with you. She said with a flustered face. You really don't need to. You need to clean yourself first. I dusted off my clothes and taking out a small bottle, I used the water inside it to wash off the dirt from my hand and face. See I will be traveling like this, you need a weapon since you broke yours. Alicia this time sounded very optimistic with her argument, I pulled out another spare bow from the dimensional storage of my quiver. I told you I am more than prepared and I don't need you. Now you have to go back. I tried to sound a bit harsh and thought she would finally abandon me and give up. That's fine with me and nothing would change exactly, but Alicia was still smiling at me. When I looked down and realized that my hands were tightly clenching her palm, I took off my hand and without looking back I continued in my tired state, so my footsteps were loud and heavy. Step, 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 step. Footsteps followed behind me. Dot. Step. 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 Stop. Not with this again. I turned around. Step dot step dot step. Stop. Hey this time I stopped at the right time, didn't I? Alicia said with a confused look. I looked back with a frustrated look. That doesn't make it right to follow me around, you idiot. Alicia again started playing with her fingers and I finally gave up on being annoyed over it. After all, it was thanks to her that I am saved. I took a deep sigh and realized what was wrong here. Could it be that you don't know the way back to the palace this time? Alicia repeatedly shook her head up and down. If that's the case then if I take her back to the castle then I would surely be stopped. But if I am still able to maintain on this path and after that skirmish no monster seems to be coming near us. So if I am able to keep her away from danger, then everything should work out. But if things get hard then I will be dragging her back to home. Fine then, but if you find yourself in danger, then you will be running back with full speed. Don't expect from me to protect you. Alicia did not say another word to my decision but she happily started following me. And how she walked and looked around the place with awe. She looked thrilled with everything. She was having a fun time, while I was still annoyed with myself how I let my guard down. We kept on walking slowly at our own pace so that I could recover and fortunately we did not encounter any monster after that. Could it be that my good luck finally found me? It was already evening and the sun would set within an hour, but we finally made it out of the forest region and were now on the vast coast. The sea spread out till the end of horizon, giving me the feeling that it went even beyond it. I was amazed with how the place hadn't changed a bit from the last time I visited. Alicia on the other hand was passing through a stage which I would describe as both incomprehensible and beyond my limited understanding of her genius she had shown me. She stared at the sea like she was first time watching it, she looked at the sand and glossed over it. Already busy with picking up some seashells and other things I would do as a kid for a first time visit. Wait didn't she already cross the sea that separated the human and the demon continent to come here? Then why is she behaving like she is seeing a coast for the first time? Hey Alicia help me pull the boat into the water, if you don't want me to leave you alone here. Some sails were already prepared maybe for the militia that was about to reach here. 
but it was previously wiped out. I spotted one of the smallest boats but was still weak enough to push it to the water myself. At my warning Alicia, looked at me with an expressionless face as if she was about to burst in anger but for some reason she seemed to be unable to do so. She waved her hand from the direction of boat to the water and in an instant the boat rose upwards in air and sped up towards the water, falling in it with an enormous splash. She could use telekinesis too. Sure I do have seen some elves use it before but to move such a huge mass I had never heard before in my lifetime. We both boarded the boat and Alicia sat on the other side still dejected with how I had to halt her exploration activity. Don't look at me like that, fine I will let her explore more if we are able to return. No I will make sure of it that we do. The sun was about to set and we were still far from our destination. Every second counted and if we did nothing we may be ambushed by more of those flying monsters and we won't be able to protect ourselves. Even if Alicia is strong we cannot be overconfident in our situation. I don't know what kind of limit she would have on her power or is there any risk to it, but I don't want to find myself in a situation where I would stake everything on it and put our lives in danger. I kept on rowing the boat while Alicia at the other edge stared at the water without looking at me for once as if she had lost all interest on this expedition. The sun finally slept, but I still could not spot the dragon island, but the stars came out as our guide as they sprawled in the dark night sky. This time around Alicia was now busy with stargazing and it seemed to me that it was one of the things she liked. I looked up and found them to be eye-catching too, but before today I never found them so attractive. Or maybe I never tried looking so deeply at the night sky until today. Being on a trip with someone did really help to know about others a lot. Also I had recovered most of my strength so I stopped complaining to myself how I was the only one who had to do all the work. Suddenly my hands stiffened with a strange feeling as I gazed straight up from the top where the giant black clouds had taken shelter over the peak of the highest mountain all the way down to the vast island that spread across the entire sea. It had its own charm and the beauty that grew along with thorns. We are not that far away from the Dragon Island. I thought of mentioning it to Alicia since it would be her first time watching it. Since it is mine too. Surprisingly she was delighted to hear that word as she rose from her seat and stared at the island in front of us. As usual she had that childish expression of being amazed again to see such a magnificent sight. But the black clouds floating over us in circular pattern also strike her out as if she was unhappy to see them. Out of the blue Alicia turned towards me for the first time she came on the boat, as she stood at a broad distance from me, staring at the surface of water. Thoroughly examining its surface died in the dark blue of the night sky, soap bubbles formed as a result of repeatedly clashing waves surrounded us. The wind was unstable blowing and stopping sometimes from the right, then left and it was a relief when it supported us. Alicia observed one of her licked fingers with the tip of her tongue as if she was imitating someone but was confused with her own observation and lack of skills to do so. Was she trying to confirm the wind's direction? I too got suspicious as how things were proceeding, when Alicia called out to me as she steadily stepped towards me, glancing at me with a tiny smile which I would call anything if not suspicious. Get ready, I am leaving. It had a sweet ring to it, but her wild expression said otherwise. Phew! Before I could completely let out my astonishment, I was now looking straight at Alicia's face, and all missing from my right hand, she leaned closer to me as she tightly gripped me around my waist, horizontally holding me in her hands. I looked below and I was in her arms, she stood on the highest point of the boat on the eccentric long bow, which gave it a streamlined feature on either ends, as light as a feather. Her presence did not even create a single disproportion in the balance of the boat as I thought it would. What are you? D.O.I., before I could finish my words, Alicia leapt widely after kicking the boat half into the water. In a second we were already far from it with a single jump. But why was I in her arms? No more importantly why did we abandon the boat? I looked back and a huge mouth with sharp jaws, counting beyond hundred just on the upper side, swallowed the whole boat in one go. The ripples and wave had a strange voice to it as it unnaturally tried to follow us. I clenched to something tightly, but this time my hands did reach someone and nothing occurred. 
my powers for the first time were in my control, or rather it did not surface at all. I stared at her face and my cheeks turned beetroot red, realizing my situation of how embarrassing it was to be carried around like this without being informed prior. This is so amazing. I finally got to run on water with magic like a ninja. A thing a worst athlete like me couldn't have even pulled off a single step in my previous world and not to forget how I get to carry a princess in my arms. This is surely a perfect plot of an eloping princess to a dragon island, but what role then would be mine? Alicia lost in thought to herself, but came back to her sense after she realized how Regis was tightly holding on to her and scared. She knew probably an arrow wouldn't be effective in water and she did not want it to waste time fighting them without knowing their proper numbers. Consequently it was the best idea to give them a slip up as Alicia increased her speed seeing how the sea monsters were closing in on them. I was already amazed to see that we were walking on water, or rather we too were like the wind itself. Her hands were so thin and small and yet how lightly she carried me around, but most frightening was the moment when I thought we would sink, because of the frightening huge heights she was jumping to. Every step she took, I found myself more drawn to her about the possibility that there was someone I could finally get along, someone who was not afraid of my power but rather would have wanted me. But did she really felt the same way I started doing, or did her sole interest lie in coming here? I wanted to know. Her gown-like dress freely swayed beautifully and as if predicting the perfecting timing she would use the wind to speed up her superhuman action that had already left my mouth agape. Her long boots gently stepped on the water surface each time without disturbing the sleeping sea, someday. If possible. But my words only dwelled in my mind. Even if I had implored as before, even if I had made that wish hundreds of millions of times just like I did before, what was so different this time that I wanted to believe things would finally change, but someone like me knew it very well that happiness and precious things eventually falls apart. Yet she had the most joyful expression on her face, whose radiance I could feel even through the white mask which resembled like a barrier between our true selves, but even so her smile was so pure that it lacked any reasoning and was glowing entirely for the sake of smiling. Dot. I never knew Regis you were so desperate to take a bath. Alicia innocently made a remark on my pathetic state. Wah, ah ah. I spitted out the sea water that had entered through all of my openings of my face, my ears, my nose, and my mouth everything felt salty as I spewed out another jet of water from my mouth on the land. Well my mind went blank. But why is that you are still dry? I annoyingly pointed at Alicia's dry clothes as not a single drop of water had made contact with her body. About that. Just say I was a bit cautious. Huh? Let's move to the cave before it gets dark. To be honest Alicia was enjoying herself so much that she forgot to put up a small energy barrier for Regis just as she did for herself, but she was too embarrassed to accept it and found it in her best interest to laugh it off. Our sea voyage finally came to an end and we were still a bit early than planned. But surely we needed to take shelter in the night, while exploring nearby areas and with tomorrow morning we were going to search more thoroughly for clues of why did the spirits wanted us to go to the Dragon Island. I had now turned my attention back to the Dragon Island on whose soil I was standing then. The clouds above us swirled in a dark typical fashion as it spewed a black fog everywhere around the island and sea. The island looked positively demonic as the high mountain towered beyond the clouds, almost soaring high to reach the sky. There was much more for the island to be contemplated about and it was more than what I had anticipated. I gulped as I saw a much denser forest and the cave in which we thought to take shelter would be perfect near the coast. We could escape any time if any anonymous dangerous monster or dragon would hit us. That was the sentiment and plan I had thought of. But should I call it less of a bad luck and more of a good luck that just after entering the cave it was connected to a much larger cave and inside it was sleeping a dragon. My body was already shaking badly and I think the same went for Alicia. With her whole body stiff only her shoulders shook, but since her head was lowered I couldn't quite catch her expression. But in front, its body so huge and big almost half the size of the royal palace. It was covered in a faint green magical aura, big scratches all over its body, 
Its broad bare chest rose and fell down as the strong wind from its nostrils escaped the only opening in the cave, through which we entered in. Even its breath was hot and a hint of sulphur was present in the air. The darkness was kind to his feature, its black scales enveloping its body shone like obsidian, its fingers so huge to crush the kingdom's walls with a single touch. The scratching noise of its sharp claws on each finger slowly intensified as did my feelings of horror and dread. Was it really asleep or awake? I repeatedly asked that question to myself, but couldn't figure it out. More importantly Alicia started walking past around him, as if she was totally avoiding it. Her shoulders were stiff again. Backed against the cave wall, without thinking much, I scuttled sideways and followed her. Suddenly the glow returned to my face, when the dragon did not woke up and just a few meters away in front of us was an opening connecting it to the next cave. Probably we were still below the ground and this cave was like a labyrinth that perhaps might have led us to the base of the central mountain which we saw from far. Most likely there we would discover the truth. I wanted to say good work, Alicia. But maybe after we have escaped, it is thanks to her that we were able to avoid a conflict with waking it up. Let's not disturb the sleeping ones. TCCH. I thought I would have got to see a real dragon here. Alicia shrieked. Ha. Huh. For a second I thought I just imagined things but Alicia had stopped moving right in front of the next gate and was staring at the sleeping dragon. My internal scream welled up, pouring out of me. And I looked with a horrified expression at the idiot who for some reason suddenly wanted to see us dead. What is that idiot thinking to say stuff like this just look at how huge it is. Don't you have eyes to see its big closed eyelids? mouth releasing steam and probably his teeth would be sharp enough to chew the rocks and its flames bright enough to melt the rocks even with its glimmer of light, then why did she call it that way, probably that wouldn't have been loud enough to wake up the dragon, I was counting on that fact, but maybe things haven't been going pretty well lately with her around or other it has been filled with madness whenever she shows up, but from above a black muscular tail came crashing on us and blocked the exit in front of us. The body of the dragon shook and the vast shape that rose up had something strangely beautiful about its appearance, the picture of majestic dignity. It was no ordinary dragon to speak of. Its beautiful eyes with a glint of black glow narrowed and gleamed on us as it roared and the rooftop was blown away revealing a dark night sky to fit and adjust its neck and head properly. What brings a high elf and human girl to my sanctuary? The dragon opened its mouth and it spoke in our language, a dragon that could speak. I have heard only the heavenly dragons could do that. This cannot be good, Regis. Let's go. We don't need to waste our time on a fake dragon, Ruag. The dragon screamed, as if the floor from below me had drifted away I fell on my legs and my body felt paralyzed but my mind was much focused on Alicia and what kind of idiotic thoughts were popping in her head. Was she possessed somehow, she was surely sane before we entered the cave. No probably her normal was already set at low common sense but this was going beyond our means. Now how were we going to deal with this problem? What if I speak to the dragon as the princess and ask for his forgiveness, while explaining the situation to him as well? Maybe I could uncover the reason our kingdom is suffering. I quickly rose from my fallen position. My legs still not in equilibrium, I managed to somehow open my mouth dash. I am the second princess of the Escalon Empire, Regis Escalon and on behalf of the people sufferings in the Elven Kingdom, the forests spirits and the Genesis tree. I came to visit the Dragon Island. I was finally able to pull it off, but now what? The dragon stared at me for a while and then he again spoke in a deep tone reverberating around everywhere in the interior structure of the cave making us to listen to the message more than twice. I am the Black Dragon Emperor, Princess of the Even Kingdom, but what would be the introduction to the human standing next to you? The glares of the dragon shifted to her, but I was already biting my fingers, or maybe even chewing my very hand. The Black Dragon Emperor. What is he doing here? didn't he disappear after the Great War too? So what in the Great Spirit's name is he doing here now? Don't tell me the Great Spirit's just pulled a prank on us. No, no, what am I even thinking? It is probably related to the reason of the Black Dragon Emperor's returning we needed to come to the island in the first place. So, is he the cause? 
most probably not after all he is the guardian of this island and also one of the protectors of the Genesis tree, he wouldn't do something like that, so I could even enlist his help if I ask him to, not that he could have a reason to refuse to, since he acknowledged me as an high elf and princess and that's evidence enough of my identity. But what about Alicia, she seems to be oblivious about her own standing in this world and the mask already makes her suspicious. So why did the great spirit wanted to guide her here out of everyone? Reaches that lizard is probably lying. Alicia again called out to me, the color of my face was fading away. Slowly, slowly drifting to the other side. Is she really possessed or did she eat something bad? No we didn't eat anything in between. Don't tell me it was that drug she last ate. So is it my fault that I am going to be buried because of showing disrespect to a heavenly dragon? And what makes you think that? I stared at her as I whispered in her ears, trying to knock some sense in her, but maybe the black dragon heard me because his senses would probably be superficial as he too tilted his head in a quizzical expression his eyes narrowing into a menacing glare. Alicia better had a good answer. I it is possible that someone still might be impersonating the Black Dragon Emperor and Alicia already found about it, just look at it doesn't have a wing. She shouted at the top of her voice pointing at only one of the wing the dragon possessed. Wait so you are not a dragon. I yelled in surprise, as I was too foolishly caught up in Alicia's idiotic pursuit but I was late to realize that as I acted on impulse after I incurred the wrath of one single being on this island whom I shouldn't have angered. Father, mother, I think this would be my last mistake I would make as a young girl. Just let me grow into a beautiful elven maiden and I promise I won't make any mistakes anymore. Foolish generation, I returned after 200 years and this is how you affront the emperor of all dragons. You will feel my wrath in my hellish flames that bring disaster to whichever land it falls upon. Its ferocious roar almost made the whole upper ceiling cave in, but a blue glowing thin wall appeared around everywhere and withstood the impact. The next second the black dragon opened its mouth wide as hellish flames were about to burn us. Fortunately before they could reach us they turned black and dissipated into the cold of the darkness. I think I had seen those black flames before. So it was her too again. To even empower the flames of the black dragon, the dragon growled as it did not have much freedom to move with its big size, but it tried to twist its tail and brought its mouth in front of us as a leaping attack, its mouth revealing the sharp canines that were arranged like perfect set of ornaments. Alicia was in its trajectory, I shouted her name asking her to dodge but even if she listened she just smiled back at me, and with my final shout fading in the third second everything went silent as if the chaos never occurred, the falling ceiling was reinforced as a whole with magic while I could sense the change occurring, but most important of all the black dragon stood frigid unable to move midway, its jaws just right in front of the Alicia, I saw its eyes focusing on her as I came close and felt Alicia by her hand. I wouldn't have believed what had happened otherwise, the dragon was covered in white strings all around its body like a prey caught up in a spider's cocoon and paralyzed only to be later eaten by the spider. From the dragon's tail to the very last inch of its mouth was tightly clutched between the white threads, strong enough to hold the mighty beast in constrain. Just what kind of magic Alicia wields? I have never seen or even heard of such magic before. Also seeing Alicia's hands approaching the dragon, it made me remember what happened the last time I was in danger, and I couldn't bring myself seeing her hurt someone unnecessarily. It's alright, there's nothing wrong. Alicia said in her soft voice as I pulled back my hand. Her hands still reached further as it made contact with the dragon's philtrum. A golden light set ablaze the entire cave as tendrils of it traced its path across Alicia's hands to the white threads that enveloped the massive body of the dragon and with a blinding flash, the brilliant golden light drove away the last vestiges of darkness huddling in the corners of the cavern. The amount of magic energy being released at the same time was enough to convince to anyone that the source couldn't have been possibly a normal being. But what was the light for and soon I saw the claw marks on the dragon's body healing, a black fog being released from its body in vast amounts, as if it was being forcefully pumped out, the dragon's new wing grew back first as a small winglet as it grew in size and slowly the light faded, 
Not only that I could feel as if the light emanated had filled my body with some new kind of energy, and it was all her magic doing it. Questions at every moment filled my mind with more doubts but I couldn't just wrap my head around who she is. And there was another one of a kind of healing magic I had never seen before. Slowly the white threads that had kept the dragon's movements in check dissolved in the air and permanently vanished. The dragon once again lifted up its head and scanning its body, determining and judging his new found healthy condition it roared again, but this time my body was not paralyzed, so he might have been using some kind of mental attack magic before on us and Alicia was even unaffected by that. Regis let's go. We need to get closer to the mountain before it's time to sleep. Alicia had again started walking as if she completely ignored the dragon she healed so brilliantly and nothing special ever happened. While I stood dumbfounded a hurried cry, but much softer than before echoed in the cavern. Wait, don't just leave, it's my home. Territory, I cannot allow anyone to freely roam around here. To me it just looked like he was more worried about being ignored than the other part he mentioned. Alicia I think we can learn something from the Black Dragon Emperor about the state of this Dragon Island. Alicia turned back around, as she glanced another look at the dragon waiting for a positive response. Yes it is indeed true that my return to this island is related to the adversity that plagues this island and it seems that its effects might have reached the Elven Grounds as well. My name is Alicia, and I will be calling you Emperor from now on. Yes. Though it seems to be a shame that in my present weak state, I was overpowered by a human. But to show you my gratitude for healing me, I will accept the name Emperor from you. Wait he was already tamed that easily. Isn't he supposed to be the strongest and the most ferocious being on this entire world but still he listened to everything she says. No it's not the time to ponder about it. After that we exchanged information from the Dragon Emperor and it seems that he had already predicted our predicament and took shelter near the opening cave after he got injured in the battle. So, you are telling me there's another heavenly dragon called Arabras who is spreading some kind of poison on this land that is set the magic and monster unstable in this part of the world affecting the code of veins below it that binds the world and is slowly poisoning the Genesis tree. I surmised what the black dragon explained to us, and his wounds are from the fight after he came here to stop Arabras, but that black miasma is not naturally formed, now is it? Alicia asked a question to the black dragon as if trying to say something indirectly. That is indeed true what you have concluded. I am the strongest dragon in this world and yet because of the poison affecting my magical veins, I was succumbed to my injuries and fell down. Unless the magical artifact in his hands isn't destroyed, the situation will keep on deteriorating. My healing process has been accelerated thanks to you and it will take me three more months rather than 20 years, till my magic veins properly regenerate itself and I will take down our bros then. Wait we cannot wait that long, even three months is a very long time. The Genesis tree has already shut its gates on us and I am afraid if the condition worsens then. I could not wait that long because if something happened to the Genesis tree then not only the Elven Kingdom will be in trouble but also Mother's life would be in danger since she is the tree's priest maiden. I am afraid to say but in my current condition I will be no match for him and defeating it would still be a challenge then. Even the black dragon wasn't sure, since no one knows how the situation would change in the future. Then I won't be able to do anything from here on, and I was able to get for what I came here for. So maybe it is time I give up on this foolish pursuit which would have only made everyone sad. Alicia I think we should return to Escalon and report everything to father. No. I will be staying. It's better if you go back home. Alicia just couldn't let the problem stay like this and walk away as if nothing is going on. Primarily she was sent to this world to save it. And most probably this is the kind of situation that job find its purpose. She wouldn't have accepted it either way because that would be hurting Athena if she knew about it. Alicia hated the idea to leave things done half and it would surely bother her late for not acting when needed to. Not to forget it was that evil dragon that hurt the emperor who was assistant Alicia needed and if he is going to serve him then it is well in reason that she has to take care of him after all. It was something her father, the true demon lord entrusted to her. Also there was the situation of the great spirits, 
about whom she wanted to know more and probably they would respond again if she solves the problem first hand. Then I will be staying with you. I frantically said, all right, all I need to do is defeat Araburas and that would solve all the problem, right? Alicia smiled, wait, that was way too easy, I thought she would be against me staying and flaunt how her power would be like the only one that could stand against fighting the dragon if it comes to it and I would only get in her way. So does she see me as an equal and someone who could help her, I will be at least glad if she did feel a little like that, I see. If you have made up your mind to deal with the problem yourself I won't stop you. It has been 200 years since the war and the ages of gods have been but a history now. I am intrigued to see how the new generation would carry the weight of this world in the near future. As one of the most ancient beings who have seen hundreds of civilization both great and small take birth, prosper and ultimately get destroyed. A single spark is enough to set the world ablaze. But if you can snuff the root of the problem out before its advent. The black dragon stopped as if remembering something from the past, he again spoke, allow me to escort you to where the evil dragon Arabras resides and I will be a witness to how you shape this world. Wait, what kind of boring sermon is the black dragon talking about and why does Alicia looks excited as if she has taken an interest in it? Are these the kind of things that fires her up? The black dragon continued. Until then I would suggest that you must rest. Follow me. The black dragon somehow shrinks a bit in size, enough that he could now easily move around inside the cave and yet, his size was still something to behold. Alicia was again thrilled to see this transformation, while well, I was too since this was my first time seeing it. We too followed it around, and I was hoping maybe for a bed to put my head on. Since launching an attack in the dead of night would be only to our advantage since we would not possess night vision like the dragons. But now I think about it. I wonder whether Alicia possessed that skill. I have been trying to use appraisal on her but her stats are too weak to fit the power she had displayed until now, to be real and she doesn't even possess a title for her identification or skill to speak of. It was Father who spoke of how exceptional and unbelievable her status window was. But what was it that he saw and I could not? I was getting desperate to know and finally decided to ask her if we got some lonely time. And I won't back down unless I found an answer. After following the black dragon for some time, we reached to a new pocket hole in the cavern which might have almost formed naturally. This place had a different pleasant smell to it. My nose puffed up to intake vast quantity of it as I and Alicia walked in. Is that a blue hot spring? Alicia walked towards a pool filled with blue water, giving off steam in subtle quantities and probably the cause of the pleasant smell. The place was surrounded with wild vegetation and trees, which the other parts of the cavern lacked. Fauna was writhing here as well as the land was much softer and fertile. The embedded small blue stones gave off a dim luminescent glow, giving this untouched piece of land a gentle atmosphere. I hope that you enjoy the natural hospitality this dragon island has to offer, until we depart tomorrow morning with the first ray of light. Saying that the black dragon emperor walked away, maybe to continue with his recovery process, but I still looked in awe at the blue water of the hot spring and wanted to take a bath as soon as possible, after I was first covered in blood and then drenched in sea water. Only hot water could now make me feel better. Regis do you want to take a bath? Alicia called to me as she slightly waved her hand inside the pond and it must have felt good. If you are insisting then I won't deny you. Ha dot ha. I don't know why I weirdly squeaked but I was too embarrassed to accept that I was the one who was eager to take a bath first. Okay then let's get ready. Alicia then brandished her hand and a small wooden house surfaced into existence from the ground. It was most probably a kind of advanced military magic I heard humans used when they are on a journey or in war to make temporary stay, but since it was one of the most difficult magic very few can do it alone and generally more than one people required saying the chant together. Weichi didn't said any chant until now for any magic and just did it with a single look. It is possible to gain supremacy in magic by using the spell while decreasing the chanted words and increasing its power. But I had never heard any kind of chantless magic. But I wasn't surprised anymore. As I had already seen her power beforehand, she did not wield any kind of ordinary magic to begin with. 
so it must have been a secret and maybe that's why she wears a mask to stand out less, but all these were mere speculation, as I was soon going to find it out myself. I was already half exposed waiting for Alicia to come out of the door, after a long time passed but there was no response and I got worried and called out to her, she suddenly looked out of the door, her hands trembling, and her face all flustered with light red cheeks, maybe you should go alone without me, what you are giving up after you were the one who proposed it, now come here and don't make me wait, Alicia slowly like a toddler took very small steps, before she reached close to me only to find her dressed in a loosely fit, short white thin dress covering her from all sides, but it was not a towel and the kind of dress I was seeing first hand, could it be some kind of special bathing wear in human culture? It was like a child dressing up as her mother told her and until now she wasn't conscious of her appearance, is it possible? That she's far younger than I think, but, her status shows that she is just one year younger than me though we are almost of the same height, do I not look like the grown one here, thinking like that, she faintly resembled a little girl, regardless of her adult-like appearance, but with these thoughts we were getting nowhere and she was still hesitant to take a bath, now tell me what's your reason, at first Alicia hesitated, I have never taken a bath outside home, so maybe, well you should be glad that it is my first time too, but what if someone is spying on us, Emperor brought us here, didn't he? Alicia already seemed to be treating the black dragon with a pet name and it also seemed to me that he was kind of being obedient. So was I the only weird one who felt the obscurity of the situation? Could it really be that it was that old black dragon who brought us here for that very reason? I used wind magic to check my surrounding and finding no signs of a living thing I realized I was again caught up in one of her idiotic antics. Stop making excuses and just get in. I wildly pushed Alicia as she plummeted inside the hot spring and I followed behind her by making a small jump in it. I am sorry if I hurt you. Seeing Alicia so quiet I realized I might have done something wrong. No, it's not that. Someone has never pushed me inside a bath like that and it felt so amazing for some reason. Why don't you try pushing me again? Alicia looked at me with an odd glitter in her eyes. No. Stop right there, if I push you again now then there would be no point to it, I see you are right, then there would be no element of surprise and that would lessen the fun out of it. Alicia said in a serious tone as if she had just discovered the truth behind her odd genius. I just wanted to stop going to the trouble of getting out and forcing myself in again and the water already felt so tingly and gentle that I did not want it to leave. A natural formed water body was way more exceptional than the one I have in my bathroom, but if she is satisfied with that then I won't go to the trouble of explaining it to her. After relaxing for a minute or two I looked at Alicia and thought that she is not much of a talker and only either spoke little or when she was interested. She wore that bathrobe around her supposedly perfect body and I always thought that would be the case since she always stood out in that striking and fine looking outfit of her. She looked stunning as I realized how pale she looked under that elaborate dress of her as she tried to brush her black hairs with her hands. Except for the mask I could tell with a grin that as usual she was trying to get fun out of everything. Alicia what kind of magic do you use? I tried to start the conversation with a simple question whose answer I have been dying to know. Others might see my magic as weird. A bit extreme. Wait. Did she just correct herself? So at least she does realize that much, but in truth Alicia worded it just like how her father the true demon lord described her magic to her. Alicia can you tell me just who you are? I put it straight in front of her. Either I would get a response or she would completely deny answering me. I told you I am just Alicia, but if I have to add something then I am someone who fulfills others wishes. Phew. Thought so. You don't need to joke around me if you don't want to answer to. So what are you going to do now? Declare your supremacy by granting this kingdom its wish. I said haughtily, as I disliked her joke. Not at all. Let's say there are conditions one needs to fulfill before getting a wish granted from me. And you Regis fulfill all those conditions. Alicia said in a plain manner as if reciting something from a prehistoric text. So what now I get a wish granted from you? If what you are saying is true then tell me why did you come here in the first place? Was it not because my father and mother asked you to do and become a savior of everyone? 
I failed to control the loudness of my voice and control the frustration within me. Not at all, I came here because I wanted to see you to help you. Alicia's voice was trembling as if she felt uncomfortable with me getting angry. Usually I was good at just looking at people's expression and tell whether they were telling the truth or not. Why is all of this happening again? Why do I let down everyone whenever they have expectations from me or come close to me? But for her I could not tell but wanted to believe that she was speaking the truth because she meant every word of it. I did not wanted things to go down the wrong path so right now I wanted to wipe off that awful distasteless expression from my face. I am glad to hear that. I said in segmented words. Regis why don't you tell me your wish? Alicia this time tried to sound considerate because of my sudden unpredictable outburst. I shrugged at Alicia's question. My wish. Certainly I have thought of many and I always prayed for them to come true. But the one wish which I wanted to come true had always been beyond my reach. No matter what I did and how much I tried, to come close to the people I cared for, for people to stop being afraid of getting too near to me, if what I really wanted dot to. If possible. I don't think you would really understand what I want anyway. I turned her offer down. Alicia is always so cheerful and she is the only one who showed me that there's still a way for me to make my dream a possibility. I didn't want it to drag her in with me and labeled as a monster like me. I want her to be the cheerful girl she has been to me. My concerns should not be a burden to her but mine alone and I will overcome them with my own power. I am not you, so I can't understand 100% what you are going through. But I want to say this that I promise that if you want me then I would never let you hurt anyone because of your power. I rose from my place in the bath and turned away from her. I was feeling awfully uncomfortable and suffocating that she had realized my weakness. But my biggest concern was would she too distance herself from me. Now that she knows. And how should I face her myself? What would you know exactly about it? I have been always trying to keep this power under my control, trying to suppress it and locked inside me. Every day I am afraid that someday if it loses control of itself then what would I do? I silently stood there hoping our conversation would end there. People live to use the power they were born with. You too one day will be unable to resist the temptation to use that power to survive. And at present time there is no place for you to go. Regis did you ever try to use your power instead of shutting yourself off after it broke down? Alicia said in a voice so cold and reserved that it sounded someone else's. I suddenly remembered the horrific incident of my childhood and the painful life I have to endure since then. Why is all of this coming to me at once? At least that's what you think because out of everyone the one who feared the most of your own power was you. And that's why you were never able to control it because you were afraid more about how it would harm you and others and never thought of controlling and using it for yourself. And even for once you never acknowledged your own power. However, <laughs> so you are telling me Alicia that it was me who was responsible for everything I went through. That's not true. I won't accept it. I practiced every day. I tried harder than everyone and every day hoping that one day I would achieve full control over it. But I never dared to unleash it because I was afraid of how this power would affect me. So at the end the one who at least trust on me was me alone. This time around I didn't know when my ability would activate and usurp everything or rather I was relaxed because I thought Alicia was here and so everything would be fine. It's alright now, I know how it feels because some time ago I was just like you. Alicia too now stood up from her bath, as I could hear the water splash. You are just like me. You are strong and might have always been like that. You don't need to tell someone like me who doesn't even come close to you and how light and easygoing you have been. I always tried to do things better and remained serious and careful with whatever I did. And if you are that good then why don't you head back and for a change try learning to remember directions. It's not like I have not been trying. If only you haven't lost your way and didn't come here, I wouldn't have met you and then it wouldn't have hurt me this much. I started walking out of the bath without looking back how Alicia felt after all of this and when my anger exploded. Regis you haven't eaten anything yet. Aren't you hungry and it would leave you weak? Alicia cried as her voice now was for the first time filled with remorse and pain strong enough that I could feel it without looking at her. I am not hungry and I am going to sleep, we need to wake up early tomorrow. 
I said in a stiff voice and left. I walked inside the home Alicia built and finding a single bed there I lied down over it. I stared at the plain bare wooden ceiling, trying to forget what just happened right now as I always did, of how I destroyed that little companionship I had in between us with a single fight over something which she was totally right about, when all she wanted was to help me, as the first person other than my own family who stood up for me. At that moment when she rescued me or stopped me from going berserk, even for an instant she felt so strong that I became envious of her. I was always told that my power was the strongest and at the same time dangerous, so I decided never to use it again. All I wanted was a path for myself where I wouldn't have to depend on anyone, and if this monstrous power could become something people could value or help just one person, if only I could be acknowledged for who I am as my whole self, then I won't lose anyone anymore. Chapter 8 You're not alone, dear. Almost a day has passed and nothing of them has been heard as of yet. The Queen quavered at her own words. I am as much worried as you are. I hope that we find them at one place or wherever they are at least they are together. The King said softly, though his words did not seem to encourage the Queen at all, seeing that he was himself impatiently looking outside the window as if expecting a messenger bird out of nowhere would come flying with the good news that his daughter was safe. Do you think that what we feared the most and despite our refusal she went to? The Dragon Island? The Queen said in a famished voice. Holding her hands close to her face she sank down in the couch. She had lost all strength after her daughter had suddenly vanished from the castle and nowhere to be found in the kingdom. For a moment he struggled to tear his face off from the window view. He just couldn't show his wife how utterly crestfallen was he himself in such a situation where his own power and authority failed him. He tried to muster up a smile, a sincere one, but his incompetency at hiding things from his wife got the best of him. Still, as a king and a further he needed to look things from the beyond and plan for the future accordingly. Such heavy was the weight of the crown which garnished his head with jewels far more precious and finer than any other that could have been excavated from the belly of the earth. If that's the case and the human girl Alicia would have followed her, wouldn't you call it one of the will of the great spirits? The king said as if he just now had an epiphany. The queen remained silent and pondered for a while. She already knew of her husband's title and its ability which allowed him to delve deeper into the possibilities of the future and calculate the most probable and optimal path that would present itself and make plans accordingly. It would really be a huge relief if what you have concluded is the truth, as it always comes out to be. Joining her hands together she offered up a prayer, I pray thee the four great spirits to provide guidance to all those who seek the protection of you and guide them by your words as they follow you on their way back to home. The creases on the queen's forehead bifolded as if she was suffering from an acute headache. I know about the bond between a tree maiden and the genesis tree that you feel, how the tree feels, and I know that it hurts when the future of the genesis tree is threatened and if not taken care of soon. Then, the king stopped before he could speak further, as he realized that what he was speaking was just what his skill and title handed to him. Holding his wife's forehead he made her lie down on the couch placing a soft cushion under her forehead. Trying to turn a blind and making an all too easy mistake of not seeing what was in front of his sight. The figure of his distressed wife when their child has gone missing. Those were but just mere words probabilities and percentages that he quantified and assessed but in actual he was directly unable to affect these outcomes. What weighed on the other side of the balance was the life of his own wife and daughter and how flippantly he tired to balance such two precious things like a blindfolded fool, unable to see the reality and the fact that what was dear to him the most. No matter what he thought of putting on the other side there was nothing that could outweigh or rather there was nothing more important out there that he even needed to compare it for, even if it was irresponsible of him to be so worried about his own family and more than the possible danger his country was in, he would bear the brunt and any insufferable pain if he could protect his own family and it meant they were safe. Don't worry too much about me. My family has been handed down this title from generation to generation and I won't fail you. I am strong enough. And I won't mind having to take a bit of burden from you. The queen succumbed to her weakened state went silent as she fell in deep sleep. The king had been noticing it for a while, 
for the disorder in Queen's sleeping pattern and the increasing lengths of her sleep. The bond between a tree maiden and a genesis tree connects up the consciousness of the tree's roots and her soul, which gives her heightened abilities to go without food, water, and rest, and the ability to self-heal wounds that would kill ordinary people. But this would also mean that any harm to the tree would also cause her spiritual damage. They also then possess the ability to detect any kind of danger in any area as long as the roots of the tree are deep-seated there. Probably she must have overexerted herself in finding Regis. And if she did not find her, then she is already out of the kingdom. The only way to for the queen's health to be restored was to solve the problem and get rid of whatever was plaguing the Genesis tree. Rest and when you wake up I am sure Regis will be back by then and everything will be fine. He softly murmured while gently caressing the back of the head of his beloved. All they could do was just wait and wait until they hear again from their careless, understanding and rebellious, tomboyish daughter, the one who heals their heart and mends their soul by her words, actions and smile. And all they ever did in return was adored that curve on her beautiful face of their darling daughter. Regis Escalon. I felt something soft and warm enveloping the left half of my body. I had never felt such nostalgic warmth, I don't remember since when, but it was much more than the sensation of sleeping on a bed, cushioned by a soft mattress and covered by a warm down blanket which I don't remember of having one in my possession, my mind was still in disarray trying to recollect thoughts of what went down last night. Feeling somewhat still groggy, I blindly tried to fumble around my surroundings as I carefully comprehended the structure of things in my vicinity which made me remind of the small argument I had with Alicia and I even made a big deal out of it by saying such awful things to her. Feeling a bit depressed from the memories of last night, I could not hold myself back but blame her. But I still knew the truth that it was my own fault and I had been like this before she even came here. The one who actually brought a change in my life was pretty much her otherwise, I would have never gotten the opportunity to go out of the palace, and even still I now know that there is a way to control my power, and then one day finally I would be able to achieve what I wanted this entire time, that I could finally be able to once again reconnect with my family, that everyone around me would finally acknowledge who I am and not the kind of monster that would break down and go on a rampage any time. But wetness still welled up in my eyes as they slowly trickled down for a reason I did not wish to turn out. I tried to move my right hand, however, a few seconds later realized that they stubbornly refused to move. It was wrapped in a completely different kind of softness than the bed and actually couldn't move. She was here all this time, I shuddered in fear. As the bed sheet slipped a few centimeters downwards only to reveal another face, or rather a fake face ornamented with a white mask. How quietly she had been sleeping there, no one would have realized her presence not even when I am this near and she was in such close proximity to me. Or rather my hand was working as some kind of soft plushie she could cuddle around with. Panicking, I frantically pushed my body into a sitting position, and at the same time I went to take strong measures of pulling my hand out in one go. Stop. No, it wouldn't even budge. How is she this physically powerful? Her hands are even less muscular and shorter than mine. So dot why doesn't it move, damn it? I just couldn't let myself be in such a strange situation of ending up in a bed after a heated fight. Could it be that it was all the bath's fault dot dot that I let myself be careless after feeling tired? Even when as a princess I need to keep my guard up in foreign places like these. But I couldn't possibly imagine someone as childish as her to do something to me in the dead of the night. She couldn't have. Did she dot know she didn't? Oh ugh. Alicia mouth slightly opened only to let in some air as she yawned. Dot probably. I gulped, trying not to stress too much on unneedy and frivolous things. But why my powers haven't been reacting at all even if I am stressed out and when using a bit of magic to somehow free myself, before she wakes up. She is fast asleep and doesn't seem to me that she is using any kind of skill to negate my own. At least that's what I have been thinking or concluding all this time. If that's not the case, then why is she so different from me? Faint breeze leaking from her pink lips as my eyes drew towards the mask. I was hit by a sudden temptation to uncover all the secrets at once and there was no other better chance than this, with her skills which I hate to accept. 
She could easily dodge any of my quick attacks like she did in our first meeting. The moment she has arrived here she has nothing been but a mystery to everyone and the most of all for me or better said I just couldn't think of anything else but her. If only I learn more about her then maybe I can find the reason and also come closer to her, and quench my curiosity. She is the only one who has been on my mind and slowly this is driving me crazy. But I am totally doing this so I can learn to control my power. It's just a simple thought of letting myself know. Nothing more, nothing less, isn't that right? Rubbing my hair vigorously with my other hand, I finally decided to do it and take the risk of whatever might follow. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne. I felt a strange shadow lurking on my face, but as soon as I opened my eyes it disappeared on me. I looked around and found Regis gazing out of the window and with her attire, she almost seemed to be ready to depart. She had a crossed expression on her face and I tried to wrap my head whether the reason could have been something I did previously. A faint breeze blew past my cheek. The view of my surroundings was blocked by the wooden walls of a small house I conjured using earth magic and my skill, equivalent exchange. Warm yellow light spilled into the room and I was again reminded that we were already on the Dragon Island. Regis must have been pretty anxious for the upcoming encounter with the supposedly evil dragon wreaking havoc over her kingdom even from this far. Success over this mission was crucial but I was pretty sure I could handle it on my own with my magic power. I had to end things quick and continue on my journey after all and if possible. Emperor is here. Get ready. Regis said with a stiff voice as she went outside from the house without turning to me. Seems to me that she herself wanted to end it pretty quick now, at least we are on the same page with the fact that we agreed on his pet name so quickly, but I wanted for us to go for a hearty breakfast, and if possible make it for her myself after all she did treat me to a fine dinner the previous night, but maybe I am making haste. While the whole kingdom's future is in peril and now I have to make do with the provisions Regis brought with her for this conquest. This preservative food is not that bad but it is surely lacking in texture and freshness contrary to what comes with a healthy morning meal I used to make every day before going to school. Getting up fast and not making wait the two of them outside. I used cleaning magic and with my web magic I materialized the outfit I usually wore and fit right into it. On opening the door and finding the two standing out there waiting for me. Somehow it altogether felt special and positive. About time you showed up. We have a long way up that mountain. Regis held both of her arms folded as she felt the chill from the morning sea breeze. Well, this climate was new for me too but temperature changes did not affect me to that extent. So thoughtfully I casted some temperature resistance magic on her which would act gradually and she wouldn't even take notice. The horizon in the direction from which we came was demarcated by a clear blue, but further ahead of us the whole dragon island was enveloped in a mystic black fog and overshadowed by a herd of large blackish clouds. A culmination of black miasma, which never seemed to produce rain and even if it did one could only expect that it would poison this island and mark it devoid of its gorgeous natural fauna. The emperor was in his midsize probably to conserve magical energy when it is being continuously drained by a sink point, which I could trace back to being located directly above the peak of the mountain. With our large distance from here, it probably isn't affecting me and Regis as much as Emperor because he probably already had been marked by it, as the Emperor suspected it could perhaps be an artifact or relic weapon, to even render him powerless. Our opponent is a dragon and our escort to a dragon, a heavenly one at that. It was one thing to read about them back at home and another to meet them for real. I will only be able to accompany you to the point where the fog starts, since I have not yet fully recovered and the black poisonous miasma may this time completely destroy my magic constitution. It pains me to say but all I can be is a witness to your fight and how you would bring this to an end. The dragon gave his testimony in the hollowed voice of a beast he was. It's alright, we came here for that very job. Regis said haphazardly. I didn't know whether to take her impatience as a sign of getting overconfident, desperate or being oblivious to her own fears. Presently the island was in shambles with the previous fight Empro had with our Aburas, while all other dragons had migrated to nearby islands to take shelter and only to return when things had gotten better. 
I might have just missed to see a den of dragon frolicking around under a clear blue sky. That damn dragon needs to be exterminated at all cost if it tries to come in the way of that. For most part of the trip we were climbing up on a narrow path of a collection of steep mountains, rudimentary to the central towering mountain, probably the best spot to take a look around the entire island in a single peak. I remember always wondering how it would feel sitting at the back of an elephant or a camel as I would see people in pictures doing, but before I ever tried my chance got snatched from me right after I died. Unfortunately those two animals don't exactly exist in this world though I might find a variant. At present a giant flying beast smooth by clay bear in front of me. I wanted to at least take a ride on the back of Emperor, but seeing Regis on edge and how she was staying ahead of both of us, I dropped the idea. I didn't want her to call me a child for such a simplistic demand. After an hour of walk we had already attained half the height of the central mountain even with Emperor leading us on the smallest route, but it was already getting difficult for Regis to breathe as she coughed up several times. The movements of our guy became sluggish too, though both of them refused to complain, because for each of them there was much more at stake than their dwindling health. The price of not acting on time was their home, their own life and the life of their people. Even when I want to know Regis better so that we can be friends, I still can't really understand how she feels about this whole situation. Because when I tried to look at it objectively I was the only one unaffected by it and it made me feel insecure. For a moment the mere thought that the results of what happened here would leave me completely unaffected, left me invisible. Because once again I was immune to what others felt regardless in my previous life it was me who tried to ignore everything around me or how the world revolved around. And when this time I want to be a part of this world, I find myself helpless and all alone. By sensing the concentration where the black miasma was being circumvented around I could already pinpoint its location and the most probably at the center of it would be the boss monster, right? simple deduction with my previous life gaming instincts. Regis still refuses to use magic and won't be able to make through this dense fog at her pace. Realizing I needed these two no longer neither a companion nor a guide. So the most efficient way to get this through was Regis. It would be better if I continue alone from here. Regis and Emperor both stopped moving like someone had pressed a pause button for them. What are you suggesting by continuing alone? Regis scowled at me. I teleported myself in front of the two, only causing them to drop their jaws in surprise. I casted my usual magic barrier and they were enveloped in a thick blue spherical covering formed of small geometrical crystals to make sure there was not a single distortion, opening or weak point. Regis jumped forward as she only got further blocked by the shield. Alicia what is the meaning of this? I knew there was no other way. You won't prove any help for me in this fight if you can't even break this shield. Anyways, continuing forward in this miasma for you, would be fatal for your life. I tried to explain her the reason hoping that she would understand me and stop resisting. Don't be absurd, I don't need your protection against the dragon. Regis said while trying to harshly knock at the blue barrier that separated her from my perception of seeing the situation. But with each strike and her failing power she realized that it was almost impossible. At least for the current she. I am not trying to protect you from the dragon but from. I spoke but stopped in the middle, realizing that I would never be able to explain it to her. If the opponent proves to be much stronger than my expectation then Regis could have unexpectedly gotten hurt. It would be foolish to put her life in danger along with me. I had my own reasons to be in this fight and Regis need not be a part of it. Didn't you tell me that you came here for me? So, why are you stopping me now to come with you? Regis again shouted from the inside, still not giving up on knocking the wall down with her physical strength alone. I realized how the thought of us two being equal and friends was so boorish and untrue. I still did not understood what was the meaning of being with someone if they were not equal because otherwise it would only be a dependent relationship slowly becoming stale and drifting apart. Yes, but I never remember promising that I would let you fight alongside with me. I directly looked at her with a bitter smile and giving a victory pose I wondered whether the V-sign is a thing in this world, why don't you just wait for a moment till I settle matters with the Arabras myself.
saying that I flew off at high speed, making sure that I did not look at her because I knew what I did just now was unforgivable. Last time because of my careless intervention an entire village was destroyed and even when no one got hurt, I can't every time expect myself be lucky. All it takes is a moment to lose everything, to be abandoned and stripped off of everything that defines me, and no one would know that better than myself. As I gained altitude while flying upwards, the more densely toxic and cold the surrounding became. Only a pale dark aura lit the sky. Released from the concept of the crack of the dawn, this place had neither morning nor night, sun nor moon. Winds did not blow, the black clouds did not seem to actually float, but simply static in their place only growing in volume. It was only a matter of few days before it would completely engulf the island, pollute the code ravine rich in magic below this ground and in turn destroy the Genesis tree and the elf kingdom. If I had to stop all of that from happening then it would be only by making an interference. I instantly knew that I never would regret, with what I did just now, and in the next second I was standing just in front of a giant dragon with a dirty green hide, its backbone segmented and protruding outward forming sharp ridges to protect its back and seemingly thin and stingy skeletal wings unlike emperors that were flesh and soft to touch, folded by his sides rising high and low every time the dragon took a breath. The temperature drastically changed from below freezing cold to burning and flickering air. I swung around and saw it form before my eyes. The mere image of this dragon was filled with rage and wickedness, lying in wait to burn everything it saw as redundant. Even with its eyelids curtained down, its calm breath made him look like it saw every nook and cranny surrounding him without taking a look. I remembered something reading about not to waking up a sleeping dragon, and also me not following that norm around has always ended up in a fight, but if I am able to somehow convince it, there shouldn't be any issue. All there is a need to be a little more reasonable and there will be no fighting. Before I could have a much deeper look around, the long neck of the dragon rose in height, its front more lifted up to reveal its inherent saw-like teeth and how it lacked in molars. Probably an after-effect of not doing brush regularly and too negligent to visit a proper dentist, or, has it to do something with being a carnivore? Damn human! Weaklings! To think one would make it this far. Finally I could be a bit optimistic. It can talk, unlike those immoral and delinquent monsters of the labyrinth who would kill at sight. Though unfronted has got a foul perception and an unwelcoming tone, I am sure people like these have a hidden soft side to them. All I need to do now is just bring that kind and humble part of it to the surface. And how do I do that? After a small pause in my incoming train of thoughts, I felt that the most important piece of information was still missing and how I sorely lacked experience in doing it. Even if I might be just a weakling in your eye can you please stop with whatever you are doing because it's causing inconvenience to everyone. This was the best possible way I could think of being a simple direct request rather than talking round and round beating around the brush and making it lose its patience or feel uncomfortable. The dragon opens its jaws and here it is we can finally have a peaceful talk over the matter and solve it. But a red light accumulated and with a tint of fiery yellow the flames burst out, the dragon's breath was a surging blast of extreme heat, extreme force and extreme pressure, but since I had been flying all around, it was easy to dodge however having tried to suck a breath I ended up coughing violently. Before I realized my vision blurred, I could hear the voice of creaking bones, rumbling rocks as if something huge has been shifted from one place to another almost instantly. It was not only just a simple fire breath but a smug attack too, that at first tried to play with my magic sense, most probably hampering the flow of magic particles around us. Upon closer observation, the green ominous scales covering his entire body actually radiated a dark purplish light. Perhaps the metal thing tucked on its chest was the cause and thing that was quickly absorbing magic from everywhere, unfurling its wings, bat-like, and then lifting off long fangs and jagged teeth gleaming at me, it started following me in a rat chase, its mouth engulfed in a blazing red glow, it slid its wings along the edge of the summit, pleased with the destruction it brought, the thing around his chest disintegrated into tiny square chips like things which formed an assembly like ring above us, I was still unsure of what it did, 
but nothing exactly good would come from it, that was for sure. I was this time prepared with my own attacks since negotiations for the time being seems off to me. Just as he was about to launch another firestorm at me, I used my usual trick to use black flare and burn it along with its own fire, but as soon as it took shape it instantly fuzzed up into steam and lifted off to the halo of continuously revolving black line. So that was the thing that took down Emperor, henceforth it became my primary target. For defeating Ouroboros I needed to use a large-scale magic and before I could collect all the magical power required it would most likely be absorbed by the ring before it could deal damage to it. As such I needed to use magic spells that had packed compact magic and was quick. I prepared several fusion balls and made regular hits on the huge black ring, at the same time playing a chase game with Ouroboros. Boom, boom, boom. As the dust from the attack cleared up the ring was in shambles making me feel relaxed a bit. Now only one target was left, Araburas. But before I could turn around to find it dot dot a herd of small black chips re-emerged out of nowhere and for a moment left me paralyzed by absorbing all of my magic I had been exuding with which I was maintaining my balance midair. While randomly launching fusion balls midair I tried to shoo them off. The mere touch of them felt stingy and acidic as they were releasing black miasma. That was the moment when I realized that what was in front of me was not a complete set of the artifact in play but only the part of it. It should have come to me that if the halo was absorbing magic, but there never seemed to be a direct link between it and the dragon. If the energy was being absorbed then why I could never find a point where it was being actually stored and then transferred to Ouroboros. I needed to locate the other half of the artifact too and destroy both the parts, otherwise it would keep on self-regenerating. By every second his power was growing while I was at a loss for not being able to release strong magic. For that I needed to take off this mask, but what would happen if Regis somehow gets caught up in the middle of the fight? While I am busy with destroying the other part, the person whom I wanted to keep her away at most for now was me. I also did not want to plunder the Dragon Island and leave the other dragons homeless. If Regis has come to hate magic because it has ruined her life, then what if she comes to hate me for it too after she sees what I can actually capable of doing with it? Down the confusion, emerging from the pools of flying chip rodents left in the wake of a crushing maelstrom emerged a long, waving thing. The heavily armored tail whipped around, finding me without any trouble as it sent me flying down, unable to instantly well up my magic as those chip rodents instantaneously sucked up my magic. I accelerated downwards at a frightening pace, still hurt from the slash attack as it had rendered me immobile I could not even move. Probably I would fall to ground and end up massively getting hurt, but since I wouldn't die I was prepared to take the hit. Regis Escalon. The car mail became filled with a heavy heat, burning my skin. Feeling anxious I again tried punching and kicking the barrier but it wouldn't even budge. Repeatedly hearing the sound of rock scratching, the crackling sound of fire as well as the fiery roars of a massive beast was slowly but surely getting on my nerves. From below and beyond the haziness of the black fog all I could manage out were sudden appearances of massive orange fire. Most probably the expected battle had already begun. Was she okay? Why would I care she was the one who left me here all by myself? She did really never care for me. Don't come running and crying to me when you get hurt or fall somewhere far off and get lost again. I was getting worried, but I surely wouldn't be of any help even if I was there. Who is she to decide that? Even if she was strong I wanted for us to work together. A thing where we both could be a part of something or at least a thing where I could be together with someone. At least that's what I was hoping for. But by now she too had painfully made it clear to me that because of the irregularity in my powers I was just a defective of a being to her too. All she did was pass a cold look at me and left. Did she really not feel a thing and for the time we spent together? Why did she really have to go and make a promise if at the end there was no hope for me? I murmured in silence to myself. After a short break of stillness it was finally dissolved by the Black Dragon Emperor. The absence of a no does not mean always a yes, though inhabitants of this world have always been ambiguous with what they say and do. I never quite tried to work on my understanding of it either. Was I too loud with what I said? 
I turned round and sat on my feet because the air around me was still polluted with that black vapor stuff flying around making my breathing unstable if I tried to move harder. It was my first time seeing it, but Alicia seemed to be well acquainted with it. Don't you feel angry with yourself that you were unable to stop him from destroying your home? I asked curiously to the dragon that calmly stood in front of me, not showing any expression whatsoever on its dignified face. I would be lying if I say no, but I know my limits and have already played my hand and lost. At present it's unbecoming of the Emperor of Dragon to leave the situation to a bunch of outsiders. Hey, who are you calling an outsider? Didn't you yourself allow us to deal with the problem? I took offense with him calling a princess an outsider. Well I doubt that status of mine mattered even a bit in front of him. Pardon me, but it was altogether for a different reason I allowed the two of you to interfere because I wanted to see it for myself. See something? I wondered what he was suddenly starting to talk about. Let's call it a test for my own satisfaction. I gasped unable to understand the words of an old dunderhead animal from some centuries old legends. We are beings that live for eternity only to maintain the balance of this world, unless something at large does not affect it. We lay dormant and don't act upon it. So there is more of his odd philosophy and all I have to listen it to in a cramped blocked place, while out there a fight is going on which the entirety of our future depends. But still I had to respond something otherwise I would come out as rude and it's not like I was used to conversation with strangers and new people so I had to put in a little effort and think harder. But at the same time it was not like I had something better to do. Don't you feel trapped? At least that's what all I could make out of his statements. Even with these wings with which I could fly anywhere, cover the sky and alone steer through the blue. I cannot stay where I want to or do as I please. It's just how it is. Because we cannot go against the wind which directs the flow of this world. And what would happen if you did try to go against it? I somehow got interested on the top even if I didn't actually completely understand it. Emperor suddenly looked up as if he noticed something happening up there making me a bit more concerned. Did something happen with Alicia? How is she now? Is she coming back? All kinds of questions were forming and collapsing in my mind at the same time. I once knew another heavenly dragon who decided to do what he believed in and to go against the flow of this world. Suddenly it appeared to me that he was already reminiscing about his past. With his blank expression I could not tell just how far he had gone into maybe we are talking about hundreds and thousands of years or even old. So then what became of him? If he is a heavenly dragon just like you then shouldn't he be still around and help you if he is an old friend or something of yours? I inquired about the new character he mentioned to me. Coming back to the present. He suddenly passed a surprised expression and with a practiced cough of clearing his throat he returned to his solemn demeanor. He continued, We heavenly dragons, a mere existence to maintaining the perfect course of the nature and whatsoever have no attachments to each other. As for that heavenly dragon who was in pursuit of his own dreams ended up with his soul shattered and torn apart at the very end of his life, a strange silence again befell on us. While I was sweating bullets on thinking whether I had made the Emperor remember something bad and out of despair he would start indiscriminately spewing fire around everywhere, that would be a disaster. Putting my head on my knees I tried to rest for a while with nothing much to do. So even a heavenly dragon couldn't do much with what was decided for him. So people should only do what is told to them after all. Seconds after I tried to gloss over the tears welled up in my eyes as I frantically wiped them. Even if it was so hot on the outside, the inside me felt the cold from within. If only I was stronger I could have broken through this barrier of her and reached to her. I always refused others help or the support of others trying on my own to reach there. Because I directly tried to see the untrodden cold path I had set for myself to cross to get the future I so desired. But now she is with me I understand why I could never control this power. Why I was able to make it out this far. I am terrified of losing her. If I don't reach her now. I might never be able to. Even if I keep on working hard no one understands how scary it is to reach something I want that I can never be. And if that's the case the only one thing I don't want myself doing now is sit here quietly and wait for something special to happen to me. I will not stop here, not in this way. As if my feet first loosened up on its own and then stiffened and I was standing straight right in front of a barrier. 
She is right, I can't change anything with how I am now, but even if this power does not listen to me, or I end up getting hurt myself while using it, I am more scared of not reaching for someone again whom I started caring for. It's just too soon to give up and if I have to be some kind of a freak to help her then so be it. We shared something I never had before, not even with my own family, and if I trust this feeling and follow what I had learned it would be sure to respond and everything will be fine. My arms were suddenly filled with a different blue radiance I had never seen before. Its color was akin to the sky. As I began to walk towards the near end of the barrier, I was suddenly beset by the memories of my past self, the accident, how people shunned me or how I had to always confront my shortcomings in day-to-day -day life, it was an illusion, just an illusion, or rather bad memories coming to me. But this time it did not matter what it was about or what I saw. You're in my way. I rejected that supreme fear with extreme ease scrunching my face at the great pain that ran through my arms, but I was still calm at the same time. What I really felt was irrelevant because what I was doing now was not for me but entirely for someone else. I won't give up. I had never used magic before actively when I gained this skill, nor did I try to take a feel of it. So what I was doing now was a first-hand experience and it came so naturally to me as if I was always capable. While establishing a magic supply connection between my hands and the new power I felt within myself instantly, my world was turned upside down or rather the view of it entirely changed. My existence was instantly fused with this newfound power of mine. I was engulfed of what appeared to be a sea of blue flames, or rather it was the color of wind itself which I was able to feel around me. I was overcome by a comfortable feeling like when I feel sleepy after having an appetizing meal at midnight, and the sensation continued infinitely. This time I did not close my eyes, they were wide open as my hands involuntarily and without delay reached to touch something, a single touch and the barrier all around me was instantly broken into pieces and the crackling of a glass-like sound echoed in the midst of small collage of mountains. I couldn't believe what I had done but I was somehow free again. Free to do this time what I wanted to and no one to stop me. I ran forward to the steep wall of the mountain and I knew if I climbed up I would eventually reach there, where she was fighting. She did not call me, neither had she asked for my help. Why I wanted to go up there was to see for myself that whether out there was someone whom I could be of any help. Otherwise possibly this power held no meaning if it had no use for anyone. I touched the coarse rock surface with my hand and my eyes flinched and shut close. On reopening I found that it was still intact. On the other hand I could feel entirely something else. A new sensation of the wind that wanted to guide me. Neither it spoke or called to me. But I somehow knew what the wind really wanted me to know. A pale blue light engulfed the world once more as if the light itself was wrapped around my fingertips. If I let my attention slip now. I would possibly again destroy everything I touched, so I had to keep affirming my own resolve every second. Even I wouldn't be able to control back the magic once it gets fully activated. I couldn't let it activate, not yet, at least. I knew my magic pool was deep and I had to not worry about exhausting it so soon. But I had to let it off little by little, taking out my bow from my quiver and placing my fingers on the string. I might have acted stupid to pull the string without loading a bow, but just as it was ready to be launched a faint lit shard of light engulfed the string and a magical arrow appeared along with a rope attached to the other end. Taking a deep breath and the making some quick estimations I launched it upward making sure that it reached as high it could possibly, the magic rope attached to its other end. I tried to pull it and affirm that the arrow was now properly stuck in between the rocks where it might have made impact. Without wasting another moment I started climbing up. Though it was a first for me to climb a mountain but for ourselves it might be not that hard since we were always accustomed to climbing tree pretty quickly, and I was confident about my skill in that regards. No doubts there. Though I always disliked my parents comparing me to a monkey because of my proficiency with it from a young age. I hope Alicia does not learn about that because she would obviously be making fun of me. Within seconds I was sure I had climbed pretty high, but in my restlessness I realized I was forgetting something pretty important. 
Just then I looked below and a black figure emerged from among the gaps of the black fog as it broke its continuous flow. Wait you can fly. Why haven't you told me this before? I asked out of exasperation, clutching tightly the rope before I let it go off in surprise. Realizing what a foolish question I had asked the emperor of all dragons I felt a bit ashamed. It always exhausts me to think how you all earth crawlers are always in a hurry to do things when you are caught up in the moment. The dragon harumphed. He seemed to be displeased only a bit. At least that's what I hope. I don't want him storming my kingdom over a little pride of his being hurt by a young elven girl. But if I wait for him at his pace, even with a high elf's long lifespan I would be old by then. At least that's what I wanted to say. I am sorry for not taking notice. It's completely my fault. I cannot have the dragon storming my kingdom. Not at all. Better to accept my mistake courteously. We need to make haste. Allow me to escort you and be your guide once again. At least he is gracious like a gentleman with his job. For a dragon. Without wasting another word over useless chattering I hoped on its back. And realized why I didn't have it done sooner. Maybe when Alicia gets back we can take a dragon ride around the island together. I am pretty sure with how things have been, and I don't know why but, Emperor would listen to her every command if at least not my request. Meeting point, Alicia still unable to get her balance back prepared herself for the painful crash. Most probably it would have shattered her bones and broken her flesh. It would be after a very long time she would have to suffer from such a grueling pain. But she was fine with it, if it was not those people who were going to meet the same fate as she did. She could heal up in no time and then continue fighting for as long as she wanted. She was strong after all, the daughter of the true hero and the true demon lord. How she could have possibly failed until she herself had given up, since she had few seconds before she gets slammed on the ground from all the weight to the top. She started strategizing ways of getting the attention of Ayaraburas who would most probably go after Emperor and Regis then. All the same, while deceiving him and destroying the first half of the artifact and then the rest, was not going to be an easy feat, but she could not focus. She did not want to continue fighting while getting hurt, remembering back she became strong so that she could do what she wanted and to keep herself safe and those around her. If that fails then she would never be able to forgive herself. She wanted Regis to be her equal and like a comrade, which reminded her of wonderful tales of companions who came together to take down a common enemy. She used to read in novels back in previous life all the exciting adventures she heard in the hero's own words of how fun it was travel around with comrades across the globe. In honest she didn't really wish to fight but only asked for a happy life, but if someone was in the way of that then she wouldn't have hesitated to eliminate it. She would have just kept on fighting even if she would have been left all alone along the path. Maybe that's how it was always meant to be from the start. The air around her was speeding up and all the voices slowly vanishing like she was already losing consciousness. Maybe they would have eased some of her pain. Maybe it would have only felt like being forcefully woken up from a bad dream. Clasps. Except that it was not a dream. Suddenly the feeling of falling down turned into hanging from a single suspended point like a bob dangling with a string. Alicia opened her tightly clenched eyes minutely to let in some light along with ash floating all around. Though it did not affect her vision, she was able to see clearly without a doubt that the hand she was holding to was that of Regis. Somehow she was here. Somehow she had broken through Alicia's strong barrier and climbed all the way up here. Somehow she was already riding a dragon before Alicia even got her own first chance. Somehow Regis was tightly holding her hands and it saved her life. Without a doubt it was her. With a slight pull, Regis too was astounded by how lightweighted Alicia truly was. The Black Dragon Emperor had also slowed down his ascent and maintained a constant pace of slowly and carefully rising up, making sure not to disturb the two holding onto each other on his back. Alicia with her head down quietly held onto the back of Regis making sure not to fall down again. For moments there everything remained still, except for Regis who was turned red and reflexively her body shivered because with how tight she felt Alicia's grip on her waist. I knew you would have lost your way again without me and how cluelessly unaware you are, there is no helping it. Fine, no need to tell me, I will come with you this time myself. Regis spoke loudly, but she found that she was the only one hearing, 
Alicia was still quiet, not a single reaction poured out of her. Maybe I don't need to be alone after all. Regis suddenly found Alicia muttering in a tone filled with an unusual emotion. Even trying to pick up on it with her long sharp ears, all she could do was lean backward with plain curiosity. Eh? Ah. Uh, no, uh, it's nothing. I just wanted to say sorry for leaving you back there all by yourself. Alicia hurriedly averted her eyes as she fell into a panic. Regis stared at Alicia for a while and realizing that she had to speak something so she to randomly came up with just something. Good for you that you realized that sooner. Now tell me how I can help you. Regis now was back into the seriousness of the mission. Alicia putting her hand over her mouth as her lips slackened into a smile made Regis think what was there to hide if she was wearing a mask. In wariness she turned around. But Alicia had already started levitating as before. Regis remembered that she could somehow use flight magic without a flaw in her movements. Regis I want you to destroy the other half of the artifact for me and Emperor will carry you there. What really surprised Regis was not the task she had been handed to or the sudden information of a magical artifact being passed down to her. As Regis mind wandered. A chill ran down her spine even in the explosive volcanic region she had been in. Like sensing a presence not of this world, she swung around, her eyes searching for Alicia's. In front of Regis was a girl with a face so gorgeous that even a single glimpse of her made it feel like being captured in it for endlessly. Her breath stopped for a moment. W.H. Who, might you be? She might have even said out that question loud. The beauty of the girl in front of her was simply inhuman. The two smiled. The girl's lovely face belied a hint of madness. She had shining silver hair which perfectly covered her clear almost perfect unblemished body, and her eyes were like red sapphires which were glowing much brighter than the flames itself. I noticed that her limbs were thin, and the expression on her face still keeping a bit of their childish charm, and yet, she exuded a bewitching maturity. She now needed no introduction to one another. It could have been none other than a new friend she had made for the first time in her life and believed in the most after all. But without realizing Regis had already grasped Alicia's hand yet again or so she thought but rather she hadn't left it from the start. Though surprised at having her hand held, Alicia managed to vaguely nod when Regis tried to let go of. On the contrary Alicia squeezed it tighter in a voice so cold and reserved that it sounded like someone else's, she said. You can do it Regis and you are free to hold my hand as long as you want. Alicia spoke while looking at Regis and she in turn recognized the same perfectly transparent gaze she'd had when they had first met. The next moment Alicia vanished again leaving her behind, but this time Regis had somehow cheered up, making her feel relived. And at the same time, she held an unexplainable, sad conviction, as she pulled back her empty palm. Folding it into a fist she had but found a new belief that the pain in her heart now did not belong to her alone. Regis wasn't narrow-minded enough to be jealous to think how powerful Alicia truly was with what she had shown her from the start or what her full power manifestation could be like. What pained her was just one thing about how casually Alicia had said to her before that she would be of no help. But now the two of them understood each other a bit more and what exactly the other wanted. That was a good thing. Taking a deep breath to prevent exasperation from showing on her face, she gave a signal to her eye that she was ready and to take her to her new destination. If this was something that could help her fight, Regis was more than willing to do it. Flying at a massive speed, Regis tightly held onto Emperor's backside making sure not be left behind and flew backwards. Crossing several rifts between mountains and a gorge through which a large jet of stream seemed to provide water to the entire land, by then she had almost reached the other end of the island. Inside a giant mountain's opening hot jet steam seemed to be lifting off and everything seemed so natural except for the fact that the color was the ominous black, and the wariness it spread seemed to have been poisoning the land. Regis without a doubt understood that it was exactly the thing which was polluting her pristine kingdom and causing trouble for her family. Going beyond this could be dangerous for both of us. The Black Dragon Emperor shared his concern. Regis did not seem to doubt it either. Even when she was using a thin film of magic to wrap around her body, making sure not to exude too much magic as it would start destroying herself. The miasma still left a burning sensation on her skin, 
Regis narrowed her eyes and stared at the open covering of the cluster of rocks and in midst of all that darkness laid a chunk of huge cube mantle in the center of the aberrant formation, revolving round and round periodically like a heavy machine part it left a deafening sensation in her ears, with every turn and the movement giant black whirlpools were released into the atmosphere, the air became tainted. There, water running below it turned acidic and no other pairs of eyes still remained to notice the destruction it had caused. Allowing a smile to creep over her features, Regis was glad that she was the one who was finally given the chance to destroy that thing. Raising the bow, her right hand pulled the string, which gave off a faint magical glow, with a much brighter flash and still deepening. Between the bow and string a magical arrow appeared that kept on drawing in magic in large quantities from her. Regis who believed all she needed was a single shot even from this far, did not mind putting all of her leftover energy for this very purpose. Even if as she had ran out of magic, she would even bet on her life force to do the job for her. Her blue eyes shone coldly, the world shuddered and warped, as if air, sound even light twisted drawn and absorbed into the arrow before it could touch the core of the filth she so much wanted to destroy. She did not need to rely on her eyes alone, now she could finally open her heart to someone in this world, to sense the presence of things through the movement of air on her skin, to become one with her skill and power. She wished to draw out maximum power. A few seconds later with her consciousness still fading and merging with the arrow, the center of the shining bow finally turned to a bluish-black color, the bow and the arrow altogether felt heavy, but Regis was still not ready to let it leave. It contained all her emotions that had welled up since then this power miraculously came to her and it was because of that power she was standing there at this point. She inhaled deeply and finally let go off the string, the arrow glittered and twirled as it went past the empty sky, the inky blackness filling the space. The arrow had banished all of it with just the light and warmth it gave off. As the arrow made a perfect impact on the center of the cube-shaped magical artifact. Its darkness and the arrow's light pulsated violently as they fought for dominance over each other. The next instant a huge hole appeared in the cube's body as a rearward vortex split the darkness. The world was painted white and black. An explosion. But for the aftermath the only one who was able to witness it was the black dragon emperor as Regis had already fainted on his back with magic exhaustion from before. It reminded him of the Blue Dragon Emperor and its words still echoed clearly to him at the back of his eardrums. A memory that he had called off several years ago surface fresh. I am not afraid. I am in pursuit of a much bigger dream that would one day change the course of this war, as a miracle would dawn itself on the morning sky and reflect clearly on the night sea. The Black Dragon Emperor always wondered whether it was content with its choices that it had made even after the tragic end it met. But seeing how a young elf girl conquered her own fears an answer was revealed to him. That at the end it did not matter with how much he worried because the heart and the wings of that were acquired in the end were strong. Supple and beautiful and most of all unbreakable. Chapter 9 The Girl W.H.O. Wielded their power to fight against the world. This time I did not waste a moment to take on the pain of flying all the way up, but directly teleported myself in front of my nemesis who so cruelly tried to slap me to the ground. Seeing how Regis was too drawn towards the greatness of magic like me and how fun it is to use and knowing that she could finally keep herself safe even with and without around me, I just couldn't hold myself back any longer. You are resilient for a human. To think that the Emperor of all dragons would succumb so low as to take the help of the earth crawlers. The broad bridge of Iroboros's nose crinkled and his upper jaw twisted with anger on seeing my unexpected return. Why is he getting annoyed, when in the first place it is me who is being most irritated by its deafening voice and the mountains giving it an echo effect? Probably putting him in the top list of sources that would be causing noise pollution for no good reason and only to expect villainy from its side. You speak of Black Emperor and yet you fought with him for the territory on this island. I said in doubt, it was necessary for me to know why he left Emperor alive, even when he had the chance to kill him. Black Emperor is a heavenly dragon like me but he is still tied to the roots of this world and is bound to protect its world core. Unlike me who re-signed to a life of seclusion and peace in the spirit realm. 
but those repulsive little humans summoned me into this world and bond me with a contract to use the magic artifact to destroy this sanctuary of dragons. As bound by the terms of this one-sided agreement I am, I cannot return to my realm without fulfilling it. Blame your own kind and my pride that won't back down unless I have achieved what I have come here for. The dragon's words seem to resonate even in this kind of terrain. You shouldn't put the blame on everyone if you are wronged by few. Even then it's quite selfish of you to act that way for yourself, but I won't be holding you guilty for it. So rest assured you won't be dying over something foolish like you are going to pay for what you did. Or something along those lines. Well for starters this dragon was a bit more talkative. Maybe some are born that way. I too felt like indulging myself in a talk at any chance, since he felt so generous so as to tell me the reason for his coming here, taking his narrative into account, why someone would plot something like this in the first place and why target the Dragon Island and Elf Kingdom specifically, though there is definitely a connection to the Crowhead I fought recently and how the miasma that is being radiated from the artifact has the same trail and uniqueness. But why would someone go this far with an elaborate and long plan without getting something out of it? Even if humans of the present want to release a fight with the demon continent it's just not sit right to go with such a roundabout way to do it. Unless someone else is moving behind the scenes with a totally different goal of their own while creating pandemic and confusion among the masses. Hugh, Taking a deep breath I realized I had strayed too far from the present predicament to whom I am even talking with my imagination running wild. It's not like a grand conspiracy tale is in play for all of that stuff to happen for real. It's probably the case where a child practicing summoning magic might have gone wrong. Happens all the time in fictional worlds. There is no better expert than me. And since the dragon is too big to be taken care of they sent him away with an impossible mission at hand to get rid of him. It's sad that Araborus does not realize it himself and I would hate to be the one to break its heart. I do not expect you to understand the ways of the dragons, but even so I can't let myself be defeated by someone from that detestable puny human race. Passing your pity on a mighty being like me would only spell your doom. If only you would have not pressed your legs on this sanctuary and tainted it. Aurobras burst out into a cry of vivid fury and abruptly forces me to turn away from my deep thinking. Oh, it's nothing complex or nefarious like that. I don't think I have ever taken pity on something. What I am concerned is how deliberately you refuse to stop even with realizing your mistake. And if you cannot go back to your home by yourself then I will just have to send you there back forcibly. I tried to somewhat dictate my immediate objective to the dragon, he gets it or not or whether it was probably his approval I was waiting for, over his laid out future life plans. If you do not condone my desire then you should try to conquer me. But only when you can survive this. The dragon's voice was filled with rage after my rebuttal. Well I should have known what the response would have been from our Obrez's side, but even a yes or no would have done the same job. Isn't it foolish to warn their opponent before a surprise attack like that? Well that is definitely going under the mighty foolishness tag from my side. Just then the above large circular halo shinned, a thick red burning beam traversing downwards, almost covering everything, sprinkling the color red all over the place. It felt like the whole island had been somehow placed over a burning gas stove. The next instant as the blinding light dispersed. The only thing left there was to see a girl shrouded in an impossibly bright burst of light and magical aura, all but covered inside a tiny crystal-like blue barrier, but a much greater spherical bulge almost covering half of the island had stopped the descent of the demonic red light. Rah! A fierce scream erupted from the dragon's throat, as if on instinct the black chips soon came rushing in from the halo to absorb all the magical power being radiated from me only to be finally transferred to my enemy, but it was something I just couldn't let it slide, that was to use my own magic against me, the magical aura around me that I was channeling flashed even brighter, a pulse that spread outwards, the moment the swirling stream of small black chips came in contact with it, was burnt down to finally nothing, it would be wise for you not to underestimate the power of a displeased little girl, I said politely with a clam expression, 
the blueberry is hanging above the island for the most part dispersed into yet another beautiful sprinkle of blue as if bringing down the entire heat developed over time. The girl stood unharmed and so was the island protected at the same time. This time around, though the number of chips did not diminish to that extent but it was visible to both of us that they had stopped regenerating on their own. It could have been possibly the only perfect sign that told me that Regis had a masterfully done her job. A gust of wind interfered with my field of view. As I raised my chin up only to feel the vibration of the tremendous weight of the dragon flying towards me, followed by a cacophonous clattering of another swarm of those despicable small metallic chips. But instead of turning it into the rematch of our previous game of tag, I too rushed in forward which only took the dragon by surprise as it launched a maelstrom of another fire attack at me. Realizing how devious our abrus could be with its planning and how cautiously it lured me in, I had to refrain from using black flare. Probably from our previous exchange, it had already surmised that my magic could feed on its fire, so it carefully exploded the inferno before I could use my spell to take over his. Wouldn't it be better to decide soon? I called out to the dragon only an inch away in front of it, as I raised my fist cloaked in my dense magical aura, its face distraught with surprise and anger as it saw me confronting it face to face and surviving its explosive fire magic unscathed, a single thrust from my fist sent the massive beast crashing into one of the nearby mountain, of course without magic I couldn't have even been able to move it an inch but magically enhancing my attack and a bit of gravity magic for an instant touch could make wonders like bringing a dragon to the ground. As the rubble and dust clouds from the falling debris dispersed a clear picture of a struck down dragon with grievous wounds came into view, deep seated into the center of a large terrestrial crater as if a giant asteroid that banished the dinosaurs had collapsed right there. The dragon too had realized that the healing capability of the magical artifact was reaching its limit as the reservoir itself had been destroyed. You see it's better if you hurry up because I need to have an important chat with another dragon. I told Arabras about my other appointment, hoping for his brains to soon realize that this fight was futile the moment he refused to listen to my request. I would never submit to the likes of a human. No matter what kind of power you wield backing down from my oath is no option. How stuck up and stubborn people can be in this world I thought to myself, or rather I might be too flexible in my thoughts. For a moment I was left wondering whether it's a good or a bad thing, the body of Auribras shrieked, even on flapping its wings extensively. His body failed to respond or muster up any movement no matter how hard it tried. It's no use, I cannot move. The dragon's thoughts froze with those words, the moment it realized what had really happened to its body. That must have been clear to him, but it just lay down in silence there. Indeed the battle was lost, the evil dragon could not deny it any more or run away from the human girl who so casually took it down in a single fray of punch. Well, it was useless and I already know because I planned my punch that way. Sending strong shock waves from within I had caused several major concussion and blockage problems in its blood vessels, destroying several internal organs of his in a single blow. Well I should thank mother for teaching me such exceptional martial arts and with my unique skill I was able to analyze and learn it after training with her combat blessing. Even if on the outside its wounds had healed up, the internal wounds being much deeper and drastic could not keep up with the damage and the healing process. All there was left for me was to wait for the declaration of his surrender and I could return back with Regis to the Elf Kingdom. But then what? A strange pause had me worried, because I would soon be leaving the Elf Kingdom too and with how things ended up I still could not ask Regis what I had in mind for a long time. Regis who made use of magic just to help me, it would be selfish of me to feed on her generosity any longer not to forget when she has such a loving family on her side. If I had someone like those in my previous life to take care of me, I would have done everything in my power to return back. Suddenly the dragon let out a shriek as if it was its last moan and the moment he abandoned the feeling pain from its body. I never thought a day like this would come when I would be rendered so powerless to even draw my fire breath. But even if this will be the last you see of me, I will be snatching everything from you. This island you so want to protect, your life that you value above all else, 
the life of people you cherish. I will be stealing away all of it. Mark my words and rejoice that you ever had to confront the ruler of the cursed night sky Ouroboros. It said with the most awful grin while passing his declaration of its pure concentrated malice. The dragon's body rattled, but this wouldn't have been possible with how his muscle tissues had been drop by drop separated from the torn up blood vessels and veins running throughout its body. The dragon's mouth opens in large as a swarm of new metallic chips vomited out of its body. The metal artifact connected to its chest started glowing with a red, creating a voracious sound akin to a combustion engine firing. Zap dot zap dot zap. The leftover smaller chips flew up backward like a heavy downpour just in reverse falling into the sky. The halo started revolving again the only exception being that the dragon was being pulled up too, but that too stopped as his chest was ripped apart, and feeling nothing else and despite the pain with the same gleeful expression slapped across its face, it chuckled as if trying to say something. On reaching the center it mid froze in the metal chunk that levitated away from its body turned into raw energy. First its viscous green hide turned into a dry, pale fabric contrary to its dark and deep shade. The cracks that overlapped the lining of its ribs and magical nerves puffed up undergoing an abnormal transformation. Staying true to its words it had gone and finally done it. As Al analyzed the nature of transformation going on in front of us, I instantly knew of his intent of offering up its own life resource as a dynamic source of magical energy to keep the artifact running for a powerful final blast to decimate everything of what was visible from here. The present, future of me were now attached to this world and I needed to keep it safe all for my sake and I was willing to go to any length to make that happen, even if it meant removing things like these from my way. My usual large-scale magic this time would not work because I am still unsure whether they would be able to keep in pace with the fast-looping magic. The only thing which I could think of was to destroy the artifact and that too in a blink of an eye, lifting my hand as it pointed to the sky. I took a final look at my surrounding noticing that the stage itself was set for me right from the start. Hundreds of lying dormant volcanoes, boiling with molten liquid from the inside and swirling with pent-up heat, inhabited the Dragon Island as its native feature, maybe today was the final day to wake them up all at once. While I had already set the currents in motion for the cold and warm air to clash as they danced in the sky to welcome the thunderstorm clouds approaching from every nook and corner of the vast ocean around us in response to the low pressure region radically fashioned into existence. The water from the internal flowing water bodies had already started evaporating, welling up moisture in the air, and so the ridiculous amount of ash being released into the atmosphere at the same time as the insides of the volcanoes was being forcefully heated by my wind and fire magic. The basic idea was to simply heat up the whole place until they ionize and start to glow from all the heat energy, in turn generating friction between all the colliding fragmenting particles of volcanic ash giving rise to static electricity and so what called volcanic lightning. I glanced upward and while the dragon's body had already dissolved and assimilated, the halo glowed with a red aura, as it raced and engorged with so much energy. Suddenly an intense light flashed and recollecting its center. The incredible torrent of magical energy was ready to be dissipated and put holes in all of the land wherever it struck. Black filament, bringing my hand down like launching a hurricane before the disaster struck, the ashen clouds savoring the sounds of the words I pronounced. It caused the earth and the atmosphere to quake. The transient blaze of black purple lightning shredding through the intense hanging darkness, made its way to the magical artifact that was about to destroy this place but it only made it look more like a gleam of torch as it got snuffed out from the very plane of existence. Status window. Arabas, name, Arabas, age, dash, race, heavenly dragon, level, 6000, HP, 250,000, MP, 500,000, SP, 300,000, skills, aura flames, wind magic LV7, fire magic LV8, earth magic LV5, blast control, body armor LV8, title, the ruler of the cursed night sky, immortality. Black Filament. The strongest lightning spell. Based on the concept of volcanic lightning, it uses the fuming volcanic ash and the evaporated vapor ions friction to create static electricity on a wide scale. 
Advantages Dash The lightning is controllable as the areas heated are essentially the path the lightning takes. The lightning can make the target explode, roast, or evaporate because they are heated up extremely fast and the water or materials inside expand and shatter. The faster the water content evaporates, the material carbonizes and eventually combines into a gas. It can't be blocked using conductors to redirect lightning into the ground because the caster controls the path via heat waves. Alicia initially created this magic because she thought she could use it as a fancy party popper or as an entrance theme for heroes to rescue the day. Dragon Island The Black Dragon Emperor gazed at the sky wryly, as a little hole of blue sky peeked through the center, allowing a ray of golden sun to hit the land after a time span of almost an entire year, and finally with a strong wind followed by the thunderous claps of thousand lightning. The dark sky was split apart perfectly revealing a brilliant blue azure as deep and far spread as the surface of the sea. No longer being able to sense the presence of Iorobras, he was left with an unadulterated feeling of relief as well as a slight tinge of sourness. Even though he did not knew Iorobras well enough to expand his thoughts over his objective and motivation to go through such a thing, but not being able to resolve this problem on his own had left him speechless. Perhaps he thought he should spend more time in this world and go back to the spirit realm, not to forget the strange sense of belonging he has been getting from that human girl Alicia, which had left him in awe. The halo from above the sky had vanished and the last image he saw was of a bright falling shining star. No, a living being, the same human who instantly defeated him and overpowered him. The figure's short size in front of his huge mass still seemed to overshadow his strength even from this far. Wearing a white dress, wind whipped hairs with illuminated silver as it faded in the white. The dragon sensing a spatial distortion in front of him prepared himself for the grand arrival of the person he had been waiting for so long or so he felt. The person who was now standing before him had admirably defeated Aribaraz and saved the entire dragon island, the Genesis tree and the elf kingdom from further harm. Silently observing her graceful movement, she looked at her friend who was peacefully sitting and resting her back on a large vertical stone covered by a dense soft covering of green. For a few moments of silent stare passes by the dragon wondered what careful thoughts could possibly be restraining her to move. She is breathing. Right? Alicia muttered with a worried expression over her face. Seeing Regis so quiet had made her extra worried and doubtful. Yes, yes. The dragon said erratically in a hurry, I made sure that she was safe during this entire time. He replied to Alicia who was already sitting beside the unconscious Regis to check on her heartbeat. Thank you very much. Alicia replied as she took a heavy breath of relief after casting a large scale magic and so did the black dragon after the unpredictable question air. As the overseer of the peace of this sanctuary of dragons let me extend my heartfelt thanks. If you so desire to ask a thing that lies within my power and I am able to grant it, I will do so without a second thought. The dragon bowed its head, an act where such a poor display of pride would have tainted the proud name of the noble race of heavenly dragons, but this was a debt that just couldn't have been easily paid by mere words and so showing courtesy was one of the way to show the seriousness of his resolve and promise. I think we have played hide and seek long enough. There is no need of such formalities, you must have realized it by now. The girl Alicia spoke, without a single shred of fear in her eyes, wherein even the strongest warrior would faint at the mere sight of this mightiest dragon. Yes. Indeed, the moment you spoke of my name, your words have affected me differently that I could not help it but consider what I could merely speculate but I wouldn't have believed myself unless I have taken a look with my own eyes and reinstated the pledge. The dragon said with a tone of submission unlike the strength and supremacy his voice commanded when they had met for the first time. Very well, then I Alicia Escalon Ashbourn, your lord order you to swear allegiance to my name and the royal demon family. The dragon saw the form of the girl transforming as small and pointed black wings protruded from her back and two little curled black horns exposed themselves on her head. Removing the glove from her hand, she revealed the crest of the royal demon family as it had started glowing faintly and the light spread over the dragon most probably completing the formation of the pact. Received title. 
Dragon Priestess. She was the spitting image of the prior to the previous Demon Lord, the one with whom he first formed the contract for the first time after being defeated by her hands and shown sympathy of an equal warrior at the same time. The Black Dragon Emperor thought to himself. At the same time in the background he could hear the roars and see the figure of hundreds and thousands of dragons returning to their homes, their wings almost knitting a predefined shadow crisscross pattern on the calm surface of the sea. For him the devotion of heart, mind, and soul was not something he could just lay it off to anyone or merely hand even to a contract holder. It did not turn out be a king, warrior knight, sage hero or a world conqueror or other such crummy sorts of job, but perhaps a young girl who had just now set an example with her power to possess the ability to command this world had earned it rightfully and he would wholeheartedly submit to such a power which had awakened a new feeling in him. And so the eternal old dragon finally ducked his head down to swore a new oath to his new young master, Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne. I swear, I the Black Dragon Emperor. The ruler of all dragons will by life or death serve you as long as you need me and the contract holds. That I and all the collective dragons will follow your lead to whichever path of future you loop us to. At least that's what he said or something along those lines. I exactly repeated the words as father had described me to but I had no way of knowing that it would have such an overwhelming effect over the black dragon emperor to make him look like he was about to cry. I just wanted to have a casual talk. But that must be asking too much from an antiquated rusty dragon, it's not like I was that interested in seeing his fossilized statue in a museum, though that would have been a great revolutionary finding in my previous world as all the fantasy world lovers would start claiming their credibility from the mean people who would throw in the towel of reality on us in our day to day hobbies, well. The thought of me causing a civil war over such a matter does sound ridiculous, then again that would mean a holiday and I could stay indoors doing what I have always loved to do. We should just leave the fighters to fight with their fighting spirit. At the same time there are also off chances that as a consequence of a civil war they would have shut down the internet and the books and gaming stores would be closed, but there will always be the plus point of no school life. But if I never went to school then I wouldn't have died and then I wouldn't be here, where I am carrying Regis back to the Elf Kingdom while flying. She is unconscious and so I don't want her falling in the sea and later complain to me for being so careless while carrying her around. I should probably focus on going back, while practicing on remembering roads and improve over my navigation skills. As the dragons were returning for now I thought it was the best time to go back while the black dragon would be able to fight against his nostalgic urges. Also it did not seem the right time to talk about my own indulgences when his hands would be full with the proper restoration of the dragon island. I can return there any time with my teleportation magic, and for now I was quite pleased by myself with earning the dragon priestess title. As for the condition of the elf kingdom, since the artifact was shut down, the miasma mixing in the Codra vein had stopped but what about the already done damage? Going from place to place and purifying everything seems to be a hassle and I would hate to do such kind of menial work which has no effectiveness. Just then I felt the briskness of someone strongly moving in between the hold of my arms. You are finally awake. I said smiling at the person hanging between my hands like a loosely tied around belt. The struggle between my hands increased as Regis in her dizziness looked up and then stared down, just put me down. She cried in surprise, while I had to improvise on the speed to make her feel relaxed. Don't move or else I have to drop you down. If she is confident enough that I should leave, then maybe I should. No. No. Don't leave me. I don't want to die. Regis shrieked at the mere mention of being released. She tightly clutched her hands around my waist while bringing her body close to me out of fear of falling. Maybe there is a first time for everyone, don't feel embarrassed. I said to her as I saw her hiding her face below my torso hoping that I won't be able to see it going red after such an impetuous display. No, I'm not. And may I ask why we are traveling to left? The elf kingdom is in right. To the right. Regis reminded me of my inability quite brutally. Oh, yeah, I already knew that, I was just taking a detour. I giggled, really, 
anyways just go straight in the right. I hope that you won't fall short on energy before we even make halfway through. Regis sounded a bit sardonic there. So, I thought to reply in kind, we will be back, before you even know it. Next time we are traveling like this, let's make sure that we already decide on the speed at which you will be traveling through air. Regis said huffing and puffing. Next time? I asked in wonder. Regis suddenly stopped breathing violently and lifting up her head from her knee-bent position. She had a solemn expression as she stared at me for a while focusing her concentration on my mask. It's nothing. Let's meet with my father and mother, to know the present situation. Regis started walking towards the palace's gateway. With my amazing flying speed and expertise we had already reached back to Regis's home, though it could have been even faster if not for my messing up with directions again, or rather going for a strategic exploration detour, that's it, it really was one. I too wanted to know what had changed in this one day and so I followed Regis back to the palace, we reached the gate and the guards seeing us. One of them ran back into the palace to inform others. Well everyone had a surprised look on their faces. They were probably worried after the second princess ran out of the kingdom, with nowhere to be found. But Regis did not wait for their approval or the questions being bombarded on her but walked straight to the alleyway which as far as I remember led to the king's office. While I was following behind her, and some other guards had joined in the procession but they were still keeping their distance from Regis and their gossips was making me feel uncomfortable. But everything stopped when from behind the front end of the corner wall, the king followed around with soldiers. For a moment I thought she was going to be scolded for running away, as the king's demeanor was totally blown of all colors, but my fears were unfounded. Without even my noticing Regis's mother had appeared out of nowhere. Was she too specialized in spatial magic, but seeing her ace towards Regis turned my thoughts. Oh, Regis, you are all right. I am so glad that you came back. Collapsing on her knees, she came to level head with Regis and pushed her head deep in her collarbone down to her chest, while her arms moved around her waist. With her head down I couldn't even tell whether she was sobbing but even with my exceptional superhuman reflexes all I could manage out was short sniffles. Well, I think a queen needed to keep her wits around everyone all the time and not show her emotions so frequently, but if it was family then I think it was fine and the king too had joined the fray, while Regis still stood silently while other two tucked to her were showering their love on her. Why, how did you know? Regis sounded most surprised, as if she was the one who least expected this to happen. With a hollow look on her face she waited for an answer. Why are you so surprised? You're home now. That's what really matters. The king replied most casually to her runaway daughter. Parents would always know more about their child than they do themselves. The queen's words seemed to warm Regis's ears. She tried to move her lips, but couldn't even manage to say a complete sentence. But that attempt too had broken the dam that had kept her own feeling at bay. Her sniffles became sputters, and then she broke into sobs as she tightly clutched her mother and father with all her strength and was the only person crying in attendance. In turn both of them patted her back but every attempt of comforting her made her cries even louder. While most of the guards had gone back only very few and the close might have stayed around to watch this with the most utterly staggered look on their faces. If Regis was surprised. How her parents found out that she had gained control over her power then it was obvious to me that it was possible with their skills. While the king had the skill, probability foresight, which had the power to calculate probabilities for various situations while also the title wisdom added to his name which mostly allowed him to assess these probabilities and plan them for future accordingly and in advance for anything. This might have possibly been one of the futures he evaluated the probability for. But I can't be sure of the numbers. Not to forget the queen who also had the title of Tree Shrine Maiden, though I myself am not clear with such a unique title, and the analysis I is not helping much even in this matter, but it seems that as long as she is around the Genesis tree it warns her of any danger and also protects her from it, since Regis was now willfully able to wield her power and she never had any intention to hurt somehow with it, the queen was already in the know and the events in the loop. On the contrary my lips were tight shut as I found myself holding back my own sob. Why do I feel like crying and join them too? I see. 
Out here again I was all alone, even though I have been at good terms with these people and they too have shown me such kindness without knowing anything about me. They still were distant and mere acquaintances of mine. Most particularly Regis. After that display I too found her going and drifting away from me. Why would she choose someone like me over her own family and now that she had finally found true happiness? I might be strong but with how bad I am in understanding others and unable to read the room or get a clue. Even if in my previous world there was no one there to welcome me at home, it mostly felt like the fact we used to study at school that we needed a roof as one of the factors to guarantee our survival after air, water and food. It was a mere construction with its foundation raised over concrete cement, but here in my new life, I found those who wanted to take care of me and welcome me in their little paradise, actually a dungeon floor, surrounded by all kind of strong monsters, maybe I actually quite liked that setting myself, something up to my taste, but what would really happen if I went back now? I couldn't help but imagine myself returning back home to where I belong now and can call it my own home and to the people who considered me a part of their life, would they too hold me and welcome me back like that? It would have really made me happy, they probably would, like they always did. On the first day I opened my eyes there I felt embraced in mother's hands and that went true for the rest of the time I spent there. I never felt sad in those years, I never would have. But I can't go back now, because I promised I would first achieve what I wanted to do for Alel this time and if I turned back now then I wouldn't be able to leave. They would too had been ecstatic that I came back home. Lily would have been mad because she would be stuck with schoolwork, but at the same time, we would have been sad that I turned back from what I set out to do. And that's why. That's why, I was disgusted with myself, to think that instead of feeling happy for Regis I was jealous of her right now. Suki, Suki, a sound large enough to fill the entire space, faint in volume but stretching from end to end echoed in the entire alleyway where everyone was present. I was quick on alert abandoning all feelings and thoughts. How? From where and who exactly? I took notice and saw that only I was affected by the repeated sound calling out my previous life name. It was basically the same telepathic voice that asked me to stop when I first met Regis, the Genesis tree. Alicia quickly asked Hal to track down the source link of the telepathic connection before her secret gets revealed to others, though it seemed entirely implausible that the voice meant any harm to her. But with how she was a stranger to the outside world as much as the outside world to her, how someone could knew her previous life name. And even if they did, why not show up like normal? Tracking successful. Proceeding to the source. Well it worked this time somehow, I guess. Alicia thought to herself as she disregarded everything in front of her and started walking with heavy steps towards the whereabouts of this mysterious particular being, which was the start of all of this to begin with. Everyone in the alleyway was shocked by her sudden change in demeanor, while Regis tried calling out her name but Alicia seemed to even block that out. The only reason being Alicia had high hopes where she thought she could finally get a strong clue for Athena and maybe finally her search could come to an end, that finally she could reunite with her friend and her saviour. For a minute Alicia continued walking silently, while others tried to follow her, no matter how hard they moved they couldn't quite seem to keep up with her movements. She finally reached a dead end wall, but Alicia's blessed eye could not be merely fooled by a magically constructed fake wall. Just when she was about to enter through the wall, the guards and other important people of castle following her around, whom she so casually had ignored became susceptive and hostile. The guards quickly called out to each other as they inquisitively questioned Alicia. Stop, that's a restricted area of the palace. We might have to take strong action if further advisory is not followed. The guards warned her as some of them had drawn out spears and swords and just when they were going to be pointed at her before even the king or the queen could interfere or mediate the preordained actions of the soldiers. But Alicia had taken on herself to respond as a wave of strong magical energy sent chills to everyone as they froze. For a second there everyone could feel the rage of the world, something beyond their comprehension. The soldiers succumbed to their weakened state stood like statues as their hands loosened on the grip. Even the falling clang of the swords and the spears took the shelter of silence to not further anger that one power. 
The human girl was still rooted to that spot as if confirming something and the very next second she stepped in and instead of being hit to the wall, the affixed spatial magic transferred her directly over to the massive underground hole that was spread like a massive tunnel below the entire palace and beyond. As far as the eyes could carry the light, the dome was covered under a faint shimmering green light with giant clusters of what appeared to be magitite or giving off a pale blue light that found itself insufficient to live the area entirety. From behind three figures followed Alicia it was Regis, the king and the tree shrine maiden, the queen herself. While Regis was shocked to see what had been reduced of the Genesis tree, even though she had been only few times here, the king squinted his eyes in an effort to know of Alicia's intention. While the queen, it was her sanctuary and seeing it almost in ruins and such dilapidated condition made her heart ache. She knew she had a long road ahead in its restoration, but she had to work hard when her daughter so courageously returned after solving her worries. The opening of the dome was covered with shriveled wines and thorns covered in a kind of paralysis poison. No one was allowed entry and it was clear by the appearance of the entrance that someone on the inside did not wish to welcome anyone. The Genesis tree also remained one of the elves Escalon royal families and other biggest secrets that had been taken care of since the start of this world by their race. Even with Regis, who was the second princess was considered to be too young to make her well acquainted with such facts. But as soon as Alicia showed up, the vines crossed over and were pulled back instantly giving her way. Beyond the arch gate, in center of the colossal dome stood a giant tree, its branches so long and vast that it covered almost the entirety of the dome that one could not even make out its sense, but with a single glance could tell that it was running low on greenery. The moisture was dried up and a melancholy hung in the air like a parasite feeding over the life force of the Genesis tree. Alicia was now standing on a short edge platform about 30 meters above the ground while there was empty area between her and the tree which consisted of a circular lake. It was shallow and was also lacking luster, closed pods floating on its surface encasing life forms inside it in dormant state. As again Regis attempted to talk out things with Alicia but the words did not come out as her breath had stopped for a second while another strange phenomenon took them by surprise. Alicia gave a quick nod as she looked at her back. The three figures swallowed back a gasp, as dumbfounded as the first time Regis had been when she saw Alicia's human form. A green pathway with crisscross branches covered in soft fresh grass appeared just in front of Alicia's feet traveling all the way to the tree's bulged out center of the trunk. A freshly made path was created in an instant and would only allow her to walk on. Alicia wanted an answer and she was even ready to force it out of it if she had to. That's why she did not hesitate while walking that road. She pulled off that mask, her hands covered in magic instantly much powerful and rich than the whole seemingly alive surrounding itself could not produce. With every step she took, she got closer to the tree while at the same time the three in her presence remained mere eyewitnesses of her dealing. For them she was too gorgeous with her long hair down as they scrambled down touching her waist. A beauty that stole the moment of appreciation of everything else in their vicinity. It was fairly longer than when she had wore the mask and not to forget how they turned into a soothing color of white which reflected even the minute tray of light vigorously. And, most important of all, in the midst of a world of green, the girl of inhuman beauty placed her palm on the trunk and attempted to channel magic in the huge overgrown tree. Her mere size might have been equivalent to a small dot in front of the tree. It reminded Alicia of the tree she used to read books under its shade back in the divine realm even if it was just for a week, and so could not stop herself from freeing this tree free from the clutches of whatever the state, the miasmic poison had rendered it to. From then on, Everything seemed to have happened in slow motion. Reaching the critical point, the vast amounts of magic being channeled directly into the tree, the colors of the magic particle so dense that they started accumulating in the air like tiny drops of spherical drops. In the end even a small dot would leave an exceptional impression on a long white page. It was as if the whole place had been revitalized as the colors of the leaves reappeared into a blend of dark and light green. The shriveled up branches and vines growing all around the dome suddenly started wriggling as if they were forcefully pumped with water. The surface of the lake cleared into a pure reflection of the green covering the above wall, 
while the floating buds bloomed into more than simple flowers, as the encased spirits inside it, in form of shining globules started wandering around the place energetically, while the surface of the water was now lodging a new kind of flower that had grown in no time at all. The red petals of it so beautiful that they could have enticed anyone to touch them even just for one time to check whether such a deep color was even possible. The tree's frills swayed beautifully and, as if predicting the perfect timing, the miraculous wind that blew pushed away all the old and tattered parts of the tree that were shared down in the process. Even though this tree would have been as old as this world but now it was just like the tree had regained its lively youth yet again. That one moment, that one second, that one experience, the scene was engraved into Regis's memory and whoever might have seen it as Alicia stood in the center of it all. The wind with no place to come and go blew yet again and this time the quiet surface of the water started rippling while the branches on the tree swing gently as the trunk of the branch unfolded to reveal a cavity at the center and a green light walked in the next instant. The glow kept on increasing until it blinded everyone's eyes. Regis and the others once again tried to call out Alicia who silently stood in front of the tree like a doll she appeared them to be, but before they could open their mouth. Another voice beat them to it, received title, Celestial Queen of Spirits, Alicia Escalon Ashbourne. Saki, it has been such a long time and we meet again. A soft voice cut through the air, me, who hasn't even budged an inch after channeling so much of my magic into the tree, was quite famished myself. My eyes were now directed towards the golden gaze of a woman. I squinted my eyes in an effort to yet again affirm the situation where a woman comes out of the central cavity of the trunk, but the only thing different about her from an ordinary person was her see-through appearance. She was just a mere manifestation or a reflection of the real thing. The woman's eyes planted firmly on me as she put up a wonderful smile on her face. I soon realized that she was a summoning who so cruelly fed on my magic though I was not that bothered by it. Even now I'm not low on it, but burning a vast amount like that at once leaves a stingy feeling on my body. But I was not displeased because what I had summoned was a beautiful stunning spirit, her hands placed and tucked to one another, her wet bangs floating in the air, her red lips making an all too rare grin bolted onto her, out of the world appearance. And who might you be? I placed a sound barrier on us and seeing that the person in front of us did not mind we continued. I could not let the others know of my past life secret, but the identity of the person in front of me was still in question, even if they knew of me. It's obvious that you would not recognize me in this form. I am the great spirit of the forest, and we met back in the divine realm when you visited the spirit lake. Well some of my memories did came back floating in of how I went to a lake with Athena just before the day we reincarnated. From the inside I was bursting in joy I realized I met an acquaintance in this outside world much sooner than expected. It was even a relief for me that they too were happy meeting me and I was not seen as an unwanted person. But now my thoughts were more inclined to the facts. So, maybe by any chance does she know of Athena or where she could be this time around? I must ask to know. So, is it by any chance you who brought me here? I asked just for confirmation since I also needed to confirm that the problem with the Dragon Island was completely solved too. At first the Great Spirit made a distressed face on hearing that question, which too reminded her of how she noticed a strong and familiar presence just within her reach roaming around the same place in loops which even made her puzzled. Taking it upon herself she had decided to create small unnoticeable bumps on the ground to carefully and willfully change the direction of the falling stick every time and brought Alicia here, but she was too afraid to explain such an embarrassing situation to her and called for a retreat answer. Using a secret technique she decided it was best to put up a smile and turn the topic, or, so the great spirit planned to do, either great spirit and the one who resides in this genesis tree wants to from the bottom of my spirit core thank you for saving me and healing me in the process. As a gratitude, me and the other great spirits the wind, water, fire and earth along with the order of the divine tree have recognized Tsuki as the celestial queen of all spirits henceforth. The great spirit in front of me proclaimed. Thinking that back now I realized how it could have been a mere chance to use a stick and wandering here willfully might have been stupid of me. 
But the most important question yet remains. Great spirit of forest by any chance do you know where Athena might be? I asked hurriedly while thin constrained lines might have appeared on my forehead if I am left even a bit longer in uncertainty. I am afraid but all I can tell is I had verified her presence in the southern region of the human continent but since I have been confined to this place for a year because of the miasmic poison I cannot tell for the present. The spirit said with a dismayed look on her face. Maybe she thought that she was not of that much help because she could not give for immediate information, but knowing that she was just doing fine in the human continent and now I even have a vague idea for her location. I can find her. All I need to do is continue traveling and surely one day just like I met Lou, and Regis I too will be able to see her. I am so glad that you could help me with that much. Now I know what I will do from here on out. I said with an affirmation in my voice. My spirits surely lifted up. That makes me really happy that I could be of use to my new queen. If you ever need my assistance just call for me and I and all the spirits will be at your command. The great spirit bowed to me, and I realized again that I had now again gained an important title added to my status, and the situation was akin to the small spiders and xenos of the labyrinth. Not that I mind, knowing that I have more hands to help but the gravity of the word queen was really something new for me. But I was more affixed to further planning of where I have to head here from now on and the uncertainty of how I will continue without any help. By now I had lifted up the barrier because it seemed that the great spirit that had something to say for the Regis's family too. Dot. The great spirit of the forest turned to the three elves standing at the back, who still dumbfounded looked at the celestial being in front of them. They have always worshipped and served under her name but themselves never got the chance to see the one in person. For generations it had been the same and they still vowed to continue it. But for them it was a miracle and a one in a lifetime opportunity. While the king had a hard time believing his eyes, Regis was still in the unknown to the identity of the person. I thank the Ascalon family of the Ascalon Empire to maintain the Ian's old promise and to the Shrine Tree Maiden for tending to me in my dire needs. In return the nature will always bless this land with prosperity and happiness. The great spirit then again with a short bow walked into a small green light and aimed for the top and vanished, while the queen sank to the ground almost breaking in sobs as she muttered, It's the great spirit, I never thought. Her words broke down in her neck before she could continue as an overwhelming feeling took over her body. Even the queen for once feared that the Genesis dream might never let her in and would declare her devotion unworthy. But then again today it happened as she saw its very reflection in her eyes telling her that her prayers were not unheard and her efforts were finally recognized. Regis Escalon Pushing my leg deep in water and ascertaining its warm temperature I entered the bath, a small room in which water entered through an interconnected aqueduct which hosted a warm hot springs water from an underground layer hot water geyser. Taking a deep breath I tried to remember the events from the morning and how it had been crazy, weird or what not, but it did feel amazing. We met the Black Dragon Emperor, we completed the mission. We returned home together and even together met the Great Spirit. Everything that memorable happened recently to me was somehow connected to her. After what happened down there, further soon called for a meeting and just when we're all about to go to his office for what went down there and the report of the events on the Dragon Island. He suddenly called it off. He had an excited expression over his face. While his voice had an uncontrollable sensation leaking out from his demeanor, I wondered what could have been even more important than what and how she pulled that off on her own. But he wasn't even in the mood of listening to anything else or the ministers. So we decided to rest and then go for the food later and maybe have a thorough discussion on the matter there. Not to forget how carefree she had been as the person. Alicia herself walked in from the front door in the same usual attire she wore the last time she dipped into the bath on the other end of the large stone bathtub and taking on the sidelines she walked towards me slowly while also being carried around by the water. Maybe I should try again knowing her from the start. Then I can also find the reason why I feel so down every time I see her since coming from the Dragon Island. Even though it's because of her that I am mostly able to control my power if I focus pretty hard. Before that it was merely impossible, but even with this lifted weight my heart aches, and at the same time I feel the warmth too. Alicia are you alright with not wearing your mask? 
I asked in surprise seeing her without a mark. It's all right since Regis had already seen me without one. I don't mind if it's you. Alicia said freely, is that so? I calmed myself thinking that it was a logical reply since I already saw her or know about her. But just how much? Alicia just who are you and how did you defeat the dragon and summon a great spirit? I asked with a serious look on my face and since Alicia had already came to my side, her hands still focusing on the small string that tied up the loose cloth around the waist as every time it slipped out of one of her hands. No, maybe knowing how weird she is it won't work, so I should try asking it in her own style. Alicia why do you wear a mask is it to hide your true identity because you are a princess from an ancient kingdom and you want to travel across the world to reclaim its past glory. By this I had caught her and somehow strange stories did always catch her attention, but I couldn't be surprised if it was true seeing how fine looking she is with that unusual hair color and not to overlook the strange kind of magic she always uses without chanting. Alicia suddenly held out her hands and bringing her palm over her face and only a red eye visible to me. I got goosebumps with the sudden atmosphere that came over and I went silent, thinking that she was about to reveal something important about herself. The air around her began to tremble or rather it was just the steam blowing. A single bead of sweat rolled down my forehead as I gulped in anticipation for what was about to come. Don't be in awe for I am a magical genius. Alicia declared. A magical. What dot genius? I muttered tilting my head hard enough to touch my shoulder. Yes I consider it one of my most redeeming qualities. Alicia said shoving her face close to mine. Then tell me how did you end up in the elf territory? I asked pushing her back. You see I got lost. Then I followed a stick and then you followed me and the rest of the story you know. Alicia described the whole thing casually but it never made sense to me except for the part that at the end the two groups were following a stick around. I went silent, and the next second found myself slapping on both of my cheeks with my own hands for testing my foolishness. Either she was too smart or just that dumb to act that way and still keep everything about her in the dark. I need to know. And, the easiest method I had learnt in book was to talk about people's interest and they would open up to others on their own. Alicia why do you want to go to the human continent so urgently? I again looked at her with this time eye to eye, her lips pursed, as if something was holding her back. Alicia who had been till now oddly languid and almost sleepy like a child suddenly grew an ever perfect normal face, which I was not expecting till now. Finally I got her interested. I need to find someone. For the moment the two of us went quiet and staring at the surface of water decided not to back down. So, what's their name? I am not sure of. Alicia replied. So, do you know where that person might be? I have a vague idea, but I am again not sure. Alicia replied in the same distressed manner. So, do you know how exactly that person look? Maybe a picture or a recognizable item? I said with a quick breath as my lips got caught between my teeth. No, I don't. Alicia gave the same indefinite response, and you are still going to go look for that person. Yes, no matter what, or how long it takes or when you find them. Yes, Alicia said with a confident look. I rose from my place, not knowing why I did that. Regis are you done with your bath? She called out to me. Alicia don't you have anything else to say to me? I turned round and without hiding my tears or eyes moistened to redness, clenched my teeth tight. How can you even look for a person when you yourself are not sure who they are? Does someone like that even exist? Can't you just leave it and stay here with me or we can? I regretted the words as soon as I said them. No I can't let her speak any further. I don't want to hear her answer. I am scared to no one. What if she refuses me? I have been thinking of since the start. But if I let it go at this point I don't know what I will do with myself. I will try again next time. I need to run and hide myself, Regis. Alicia tightly clutched to my arms and a cold look was there on her face, the kind of expression which I didn't want it to see. And what do you expect me to say? I wish you every happiness on your journey. Even when I thought by now you would understand. That you would finally see me as a friend with whom you could share things. Twisting and jerking of my hands I freed myself from her grip, 
Also knowing that it would have been impossible if she did not want it to let go, I steadily walked with long steps and slamming the door I closed it shut from the outside. Regis's overwhelming feeling too slipped out of her as she slowly slid her back on the door. Realizing she had said something ultimately harsh to Alicia to give up on someone who might have meant a world to her. She also had ultimately run out of ideas of what to do next and how she would face her. Was she about to turn and leave here again? Last time it was she who left her. But now even if Regis tried to follow Alicia she knew she couldn't be able to keep up with her. It was not lack of strength that held her back but the thought that she might have only looked like a burden to her all along. Regis was still just a child who did not want to say to her first new friend so soon a goodbye after all. Dot. Alicia on the other hand too walked out of the water and putting her hands on the door and feeling it shut made her remember of her small four-walled wall back in her previous life. But this time she was unsure of on which side she stood because even though just now someone called her a friend, she had succeeded in pissing her off quite brilliantly. She could have easily teleported herself out, found Regis and maybe even make out things with her. But she could still feel her presence outside and feeling her out. She too sat on this side of the door, her head grounded between her legs, her hands overlapping as she waited for it to open on its own when her friend would undo it herself for her along with her heart. Alicia too was still just a child who did not want to put a new friend in danger or overburden her when she herself wasn't sure of her own place in this world. At least not yet. Things might have remained static for the two had it not been for the feigned blue glow on the bracelet in Alicia's hand, which she did not take it off even in her bath a gift from her parents and it always made her realize that there were people out there who cared for her despite of when she could have been in any corner of the world. Epilogue So, you suddenly felt like keeping in touch with me after so many years. The king of the elven kingdom said to a parallel image of a woman who appeared to be a bit older than her but only with a minor difference of maybe two or three years. Yes, after all I couldn't just forget to wish my little brother his happy birthday. The woman said cheerfully showering an unprecedented amount of love, but in no way it could have made in through the strong concrete wall of the small dome over which the communication magic was being projected. At least not for the little brother. My birthday was months back. Is that all you have to say after you tried to contact me? I am disappointed and it grieves me to think that the greatest legendary hero doesn't even remember the birthday of her little brother cousin. Think just how saddened your fans would be to hear this of what a failure of a sister you are. The little brother masterfully played the part of a sobbing little brother in distress. But at the same time he was also the one who when received the signal from the gem around his vast set of necklace. He quickly abandoned all work and came running in response to the call. The true hero, Carolinas Callon Ashbourne appeared to be counting something on her hand on the screen. She first pointed five fingers then turned it to three and then reduced it further to two and faced those towards her little brother standing on the other side of the screen. So, you aren't even sure of it yourself. Just subtract your age from the difference in hours and there you have it. The little brother coaxed. I see. So you were trying to find my own age while belittling me. Maybe I should tell Ava that you were trying to find out about other women age without any consideration. The circuits inside the brain of the little brother, if there was one would probably be in a breakdown condition. What are you talking about big sister? Even if my birthday was months back, the only thing that matter is that you called and wished me happy birthday. The little brother reverted to his humble behavior as if he was forcibly trying to put up an appearance and please her elder sister. He just couldn't let his wife, one of the biggest fans of the hero know that he tried to pull a stunt or taunt her, otherwise his life would have to go through something worse than a fate of a pest-filled garden. All the vegetables destroyed. It's hell, he just couldn't bring himself to go through with it. Right. The hero grimaced. Yes big sister. So, what did you wanted to talk about this time with me? And so the grace of a king felt to a mere push over who would hunch over while rubbing hands together, constantly pandering to the every whim of his elder sister with every fiber of his being. I wanted to talk about my daughters as usually you know. 
an all too rare grin appeared on Caroline's face. Ah, yeah, I remember last time you went on for about two days about Lily and now I feel like I have known her from the starting of my life. It feels so strange but after that I have always felt like I knew her always so well. Fufu dot fufu. Didn't you listen properly I said daughters. Caroline said adding an extra effort over the word to let out that plural sense be heard even to the outside of the walls. Phew. Taking a deep breath the king hunched back, realizing he was in for a ride of something normal and slow he felt relieved after a long time as his head felt light and his shoulder lifted up a bit like an instant refresh magic had been casted on him. I am all ears. I would love to know that we have a new family member. Caroline for a moment peeked through the reflection broadcasting the video on both sides in real time, coming so close that as if she would have bumped out of the screen herself any time if she tried to. What are you talking about? You don't look so fine yourself. Why don't we start by you telling me what you and your family have been doing all this time? I can't wait to hear, specifically what has happened in the kingdom in the last two years. Caroline again exerted herself over the last statement except that it did not have that same joyous and light-hearted ring to it. Don't worry things are all in the clear and settled now. But they were actually pretty bleak just a day ago, had it not been for her. The King of the Elves happily reported the commencement of restoration of his kingdom and how the calamity had been subdued by her daughter and a young enigmatic human girl. Is that so? They most certainly seems like a person I would like to know. Caroline stared blankly in the air as she wondered who would fit the description to have the strength and astronomical amount of magical energy to summon a great spirit all on a whim. Oh, right I haven't told her name to you just yet. It seems that she is pretty astute on keeping her real identity safe where it seems that even my appraisal skill is not qualified enough to look through the defensive mechanism of her status. Then it must have been pretty tough to believe in her powers. Caroline knew what could be the dangers of someone suspicious and anonymous to let in the secrets of a royal family. Well I wouldn't say that. Somehow because of the revelation from the great spirit we had put our faith in her but she had the same reliable air around her. Your moving habits, way of speaking almost was a perfect reflection in her. What are you talking about? Have you always been this observant of me? Caroline felt suddenly chills that whether she was that easy to study. Just when near Regis Calon, the king of the Escalon elf kingdom was about to announce the name of the human girl to his elder sister. A force came busting in the closed doors, disregarding any and all securities in the way. It was the human girl herself in question, followed behind by Regis and her mother Alva. Mother. Alicia stared at Caroline in disbelief of finding her here, while the blue crystal in her bracelet was still glowing. Most probably the magic within was resonating with the same wavelength of broadcast magic being used inside the dome. Alicia. Caroline called out with a little hint of surprise and a laudable smirk. After all with a description of the girl and the absolute amount of magic power she would be the only one fitting the description in her knowledge. Then again she was surprised with the fact that she wasn't surprised seeing Alicia in the exactly opposite direction of the human continent where she should have journeyed to by now. It was simple because she just knew her that well. While the others still could not follow up with the small exchange. They were still taking in deep breath after coming running all the way in. Caroline took a look around and spotting her niece and the downhearted expression on her daughter's face which she would have so nicely hidden under her normal facade that no one would have even taken notice. But her, she already had a general idea of what might have been burdening her since she had already heard of the adventure they went through together. Caroline who herself would have been through several of her own breathtaking adventures precisely understood that stuck up feeling of leaving someone they made a sort of bond with behind. Alicia was no exception to any of those rule, on the contrary it could have a much worse effect where she would have been experiencing them for the first time and being isolated in her previous life, she did not know how to face them properly or get a closure. Ear egg, I would like to have an individual private chat with the two girls. Caroline came up with a decision of her own while everyone else still needed to fill the holes of the basket of information in their hands. After Caroline had a final talk with Regis, Regis walks out of the dome-shaped small building situated in the corner of the royal palace's garden. It reminded Alicia of the one she had back at her home in the labyrinth, 
but what concerned her most was the look on Regis's long face as it withheld her serious glare and a sad expression behind her hesitant facade. Her increased heartbeat, rapid breathing and restless movements brought everyone on edge as they wondered what could have been the contents of the discussion. Her thin eyebrows pulled up together revealing a staunch eye as she was carefully looking directly into Alicia's face. Her finger pointed at her. Alicia, I want you to fight me in a duel, betraying no hints of emotion. Alicia quietly replied, yes, even this time Regis and everyone around found that smile on her face charming and brighter than the sun, but somehow it was scrilly beautiful. Macron backslash underscore underscore slash Macron support me in my writing Macron backslash underscore underscore slash Macron. Till now I have published from volume 1 to volume 5 for free and I hope to continue to do so even now. It has really been an exciting work for me to narrate you the story of our main character who fights her way to the bottom of abyss with her magic and skills and then eventually storms in the outside world. Keeping the text error free takes a lot of revisions and consumes time, but no work is ever perfect. With your support and reviews I know that I have improved a lot in my writing. You can support my writing by reviewing my book on the platform you are reading or especially rate my book on Amazon Kindle. And even now I'm asking for a bit more that if you voluntarily support my writing then you can do it now by donating me. Buy me a coffee at https colon slash slash coffee dot com slash Noel Alicia. You can support me from https colon slash slash rzp dot io slash l slash lgc 54 q 3 Even a little amount helps. I hope that you enjoy my work from now on and in knowing the interesting characters which will be constantly introduced to you in the story. I hope that the next volume too proves to be to your liking. Afterward, hello there. This is Noel Alicia. It's been only a short while since the fourth volume, and here you have the fifth one already. Isn't that amazing? I still consider myself new at this and trying my best that you enjoy the journey which our characters have set on. This time I tried casting an entirely new and important character, while I also narrated a fight between two other reincarnates beside our MC. I'm not sure if this book betrayed your expectations or fulfilled them but I'll be glad so long as you derived some amount of enjoyment from it. In my mind, this work of mine is meant to be a simple, fun read with a slant towards comedy and a romantic approach towards magical fights. The atmosphere of this book's pretty different from other volumes, and as I'm sure many of you have noticed, getting to know other characters and how they feel and react to our main character is something that might have not been a part of the initial volumes with our new character regis under spotlight and this novel ending at a point with a duel being accepted after a long fight with a dragon i hope that you are already prepared for the bout i'm not sure if you guys liked that more or less but as long as you enjoyed it I'm happy. I have also started preparing grounds for other important characters as their actions to drive the storyline further and makes the plot even more interesting. An appearance of a new person in your life, their decisions and behavior draws you in to learn more about them. And as that happens you could not help yourself but compare and how you can be helpful to each other in times of your needs. Volume 6, Synopsis. Alicia has accepted the challenge from Regis. But is it that simple to get through Alicia and get a complete picture of how she sees this world? What Caroline actually asked Regis to do or is it that she was denied something that needed this fight to happen in the first place? And what would really change with the outcome of this fight? Will it actually change her mind on what she has already decided from the start? As I'm sure those of you can already tell that I am a huge fan of Aizkai genre. Potent enough that after writing the fifth volume I am aiming for the sixth now. Feels almost unbelievable thinking back when we started on this journey. The next volume featuring a heart-to-heart -heart conversation between characters and our main character to have her first fight against a friend. I wonder who you would be rooting for and whether Regis has something in mind to win against Alicia or maybe not. I hope you're all looking forward to it. Once again, I'd like to thank my readers for letting me enjoy myself all the way through. May we meet again in the next volume of When I Got Reincarnated as a Spider with My Goddess. Noel Alicia, contact me. Noelalicia14 at gmail.com. See you in the next volume.